কিন্তু স্টার্ট হয়েই আছে So I would like to start by welcoming all of you present here today to this conference on the many worlds of Ram Mohan Roy. Um, I'm, I'm assuming that uh, Zoom participants can hear me louder than the people in the room. Okay, so this welcome address, can you hear me now? Is that better? better? Yeah? Okay, so this welcome address was meant to be given by Professor Dipesh Chakraborty, as in fact, it was his success in securing a grant that made it possible for the Chicago Center Delhi to entirely finance and thereby make possible this event today. Mike is not on? Sorry, we are uh, doing this uh, sort of hybrid conference for the first time, so there will be a few technical glitches. जोरे बोलते वेलकम एड्रेस Uh, standing over here where i am standing uh, uh, unfortunately that has not been possible but he is still present virtually i don't know why i keep looking in the screen at the screen in that direction when i have the laptop in front of me okay so just to say a few words on the initiative behind uh, this conference um as i said the grant was is from the chicago center so it is being made possible by the chicago center delhi and we want to thank them for that when we begin um the other entity to thank of course is uh, the society for ramohan roy reprisal at 250 that's the other uh, entity acknowledged in your cards this society i want to tell you a little bit about because you know a lot about uh, the history of the cplsc and of course you know the Sh chicago center and chicago university but this particular um, organization if i can call it that was uh, formed only uh, last year not even 12 months ago i think uh, it was formed through the enterprise of mr amit dash of the brahmo samaj who i would like to acknowledge here for all the work that he has put into it thank you for everything that that, that you have done uh, so i was contacted by mr dash roughly a year ago through the good offices of a common friend urmila de banerji whose father our founding director bolun de would no doubt have been pleased at this outcome a group of us then including but not all um, but including mudrangshu mukherji tonika sarkar shomik bandopadhyay vishwachit roy of the sadharan brahmo samaj dipesh da urmila and others then began to meet on zoom in the middle of the second wave of the covid pandemic to discuss what we could contribute towards the remembrance of ramohan roy in this year a series of web seminars was then organized through our pooled resources about once a month roughly um the speakers included rudrankshu mukherji lens astupil paul kotrai brian hatcher dermot killingly unushtu basu shudip tushen and faisal devji and the discussants rahul govin milindu banerji michael fisher omio shen rajesh shikosh mo banerji and ima ramos every meeting was organized online by mr dash and every speaker and discussant invited by him 
So it wouldn't be too much to say that the outcomes of uh, the society, of which this conference is the penultimate event, have been orchestrated by him from the wings as coordinator and facilitator of it all. Now, coming to the conference itself, the committee decided quite early to institute a conference subcommittee. This necessarily had to be small in order to be effective and therefore comprised Deepesh Chakraborty, Tonika Sharkar, and myself. All three of us then worked together to put in place the program that commences today. I would like to hand over to Deepesh by ending with a few brief words of acknowledgement for Tonika Dil. Tonika Dil, we are very grateful to you for your advice, encouragement, participation, without which we would not have progressed very far. So thank you. And I'll now hand over to Deepesh uh, to say a few words of welcome. Deepesh can you hear me? Is this volume all right? Yes, better than I could be heard. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I don't know because uh, people earlier saying they couldn't hear me. Okay, anyway, um, first of all, welcome uh, to this uh, conference. Uh, and I'm welcoming, welcoming you on behalf of the University of Chicago Center in Delhi. Um, I have to thank my colleagues, uh, Suman, Denny, and Arvind, and others at the Center in Delhi for all the assistance and help they've given us to organize the conference. Without their help, it wouldn't have been possible to do what we're doing. I'm also very grateful to Omit and um, Tonika and of course, Roshinka for, uh, and Prachi for again, the, the, the cooperation we've received from them. And as uh, Roshinka mentioned, um, Roshinka, Tonika and I, and Omit kind of formed an informal committee to think about the conference. And I'm very grateful that uh, people who in, in, we invited uh, to come and speak uh, mostly agreed and accepted our invitation. So um, very much looking forward to the proceeding. I'm personally extremely sorry that I couldn't be, that I can't be there in person. Unfortunately, COVID um, got to me um, a few days ago and I'm now recovering from it. Um, so I really couldn't travel, and I, I was writing to Nazmul, uh, my friend there, saying that seeing you all on screen makes me feel like um, kind of somehow come across through the screen and be there with you uh, personally, physically. Um, so, um, so welcome, and uh, like all of you, I look forward to the proceedings. Unfortunately, I will not be able to attend all the sessions because of the time difference, but I'll attend as many as I can. And um, thank you again to everybody who's helped us to get here. And um, Rosinka, would you invite Tonika to say one or two words and Amit on behalf of the committee and, and Tonika on behalf of the subcommittee? <laughs> Okay, thank you, Dipesh, and thank you, Roshinka. And thank uh, Amit Babu above all for thinking of this event and thinking of this group. And we had a wonderful one year on, which were extremely illuminating. And we are all looking forward to the next two days. And uh, you know, when we first planned this, we, I wasn't at all sure that it would take off. Everything would take off. We have to thank the center and the Chicago center, uh, the Kolkata center and the Chicago center for that. And thank you, Dipesh, for getting the two together. And Roshinka.
Everybody who needs to speak needs to come and speak. Yeah, oh. No, no, we need to make the comment of that so they can all come and sit there. Right. So then we will move it with us? No. Okay. Do you want to introduce the panel first? Does it change? Yeah, I think you get the panel. Okay. Okay. No formal introduction. Okay. So, okay. So we'll commence then with the first panel. Um, so when we were thinking of titles uh, for the conference for this first panel discussion, um, I suggested the somewhat convoluted revaluating the 1975 revaluation of Ramon Rai <laughs> today. Um, anyway, we've now gone with the much simpler Ramon Rai in the 1970s and now, which you can see printed on your cards. Um, the conference of the three discussants at this panel uh, will leave no doubt in anybody's mind about where the excitement stems from for most of us present here today. Many things were rethought in the tumultuous decades of the late 60s and 1970s, not least by left intellectuals and students. Here in Bengal, in the wake of the Nakshal Andolan, academic thought restructured itself, responding organically to the fiercely contested political sphere that did not remain outside the classroom space anymore. A primary locus of the new thinking of this time was the figure of Ram Mohan Roy his legacy, his place in history, and his contribution to the making of modern India were all re-evaluated, leading then from there to the coterminous dismantling of the construct called the Bengal Renaissance, a term which began subsequently to be enclosed within inverted commas in academic writing. Many arguments on this re-evaluation were physically located in this building in which we sit, the original home of the CSSC. Parthiva joined the center in his foundation year 1973 and was working at the time on agrarian structure in Bengal. Gautam Bhadra and Deepesh Chakrabutti joined here some months later. Gautam Da was working on social groups and social relations in the town of Murshidabad, 1765 to 1793. And Deepesh Da, of course, on some aspects of the labor history of Bengal in the 19th century, which he described recently on its republication. We brought out these uh, four occasional papers with uh, OUP. You'll see them displayed outside. He described it in, in, in his uh, sort of uh, reintroduction at the time as, quote, I'm quoting him, something of one's eristic youth. The word eristic references debate and argument. The air in Calcutta is rife with it at all times. And we hope today that by joining the three youths in discussion today on Ram Mohan Roy, we will reignite some of that characteristic passion for this dissension. So I had thought of starting by putting, in order to structure this, because it can go uh, in many directions, the, the conversation today, of putting three questions to the panel. Uh, and then I'd of course said that I'd emailed these questions to them and I said, of course, you're free to respond, not respond to it if they don't, if you don't wish to, to which, to which I got a, got a two line email from Gotunda that I would like to read out in which he said, dear Roshinka, questions or no questions, I will make my arguments within the framework of my article, Tal Aaj Pochut Mashango. I will keep to the duration of my presentation within the given time, Gautam Bhatt. I thought this was sort of, you know, uh, emblematic of uh, uh, Gautamna and um, couldn't resist uh, sharing the email with you. Um, so they will, they, uh, they will uh, speak for 15 minutes each and then the floor will be open to questions to all of you. So let's start. Patula, Gautam, the Akara, Ikane, Ishe Bushte, Mike, camera set up for a bit. Ash. Bushi will depend on it. Amanda, you know, Let's go. Let's go.
ব্যাকগ্রাউন্ড to uh, this re-evaluation, re as Rika reminded us, a lot of it happened precisely in this building. This, this room, of course, did not exist then. This was an open courtyard. Uh, it was a two-story building then. And uh, Professor <coughs> Borunde, Osok Chen, uh, Pradunna Bhattacharji, they were all here. Uh, and so we were, in a sense, well, not quite partners to the time. We were too young. Uh, but we were certainly witnesses to the crime because uh, I remember distinctly uh, this, this conference uh, out of which this 1976, I think, volume, the Joshi volume came out, uh, was held, I think, late 72 or early 70, uh, at the Nehru Museum in, in, in Delhi. And uh, so these papers then were circulating in cyclostyle form. This was before the days of Xerox, the Xerox machine had not arrived in India at the time. So the cyclostyle papers were all circulating and we were avidly reading and discussing them. A lot of these papers were in fact presented at staff seminars here by the author themselves. Uh, in fact, I distinctly remember uh, Professor Sumit Sharkar presenting his, his paper, the, uh, the complexities of young Bengal upstairs in one of the seminar rooms. He used to sit on the floor because there was no furniture. Uh, so anyway, so that's the back background here. Uh, <clears throat> now, to uh, describe our own position in relation to all this that was taking place among our uh, teachers and, and, and uh, mentors, as it were, uh, let me tell you a brief story about one of our young friends uh, who was a budding historian, now a very eminent historian. Uh, who had then appeared, who was, this must have been 72 or 73, he appeared for an interview uh, for a lecturer's position in one of the universities in the city. And among his, uh, uh, in the interview panel, the expert was a very eminent historian, uh, Professor R.C. Majumda, mm -hmm. Professor Ramesh Chandra Majumda. Now, some of you may remember that in that year, 1972, <laughs> Uh, Professor Majumda created something of a bureau uh, when he delivered a lecture at the Asiatic Society, in which he claimed that Ramon Rai was actually born in 1774 and not 1772. And so his bicentenary was being celebrated in the wrong year. Now, uh, at this interview, this Professor Majumda asked our young friend if he was aware of this controversy. To which he said, yes, he had read about it in the papers. So Professor Majumda persisted and said, so what's your view in the matter? And he did not flinch. He just said, well, to me, sir, it doesn't really matter. Whether he was born in 72 or 74, he would have turned out to be a British agent. <laughs> he said, Now, now we did not always uh, put it in quite those terms, but I think in general, our, our, we shared that sentiment. Uh, and looking back after so many years, uh, I think we were fundamentally correct. Uh, as I said, lots of nuances. Uh, and that's where I think that the assessment of the 1970s actually comes in, because in that reassessment, there were two main arguments. First of all, Ramon Rai's faith in the ability of British rule, British rule, by now, not the companies, British rule, uh, to bring about progressive modernity and a regeneration of Indian society. This faith was fundamentally questioned by 
these historians of the 1970s, because what they pointed out was that it was precisely in those years of Ramon's life, the early decades of the 19th century, uh, that British rule, the, the typical forms of British colonial rule, which by this time the consensus was that that had created a, uh, an endemic uh, lack of growth, backwardness, uh, all of those uh, conditions precisely uh, became evident in that period. So beginning with the import of British industrial products, which leads to the deindustrialization of Bengal in particular, Eastern India generally, the enormous pressure on, on the land, uh, the, and therefore leading then to a, 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 a real um, backward subsistence agriculture, rack renting, all of those things, even in the area of business, for instance, the era of you know, business partnerships between Indians and, and British private traders, that leads to enormous speculative uh, uh, dealings, leading to the failure of the banks and so on and so forth. All of this happens precisely in those decades, 1920s, 30s, 40s. Uh, and so in that, when that was happening in the economy, uh, what was the ground to, for people like Ram Mohan or Narvanath Thakur to believe that in fact, uh, British liberals would engage in a kind of partnership with Indian, uh, enlightened Indian elites uh, to bring about this regeneration of society. This, is, this was the fundamental question. Uh, to which, in fact, Shumit Sarkar also added the other point about the more biographical point about Ramon Rai, uh, where he pointed out the uh, very rigorous rationalism of his early uh, years, and then his what uh, Shumit Sarkar described as a series of compromises with past tradition uh, in his later years. So. These were the two main criticisms. Now, looking back, it seems to me that first of all, uh, these historians were absolutely correct in identifying the problem uh, in Ramon Raya's faith in the progressive potentials of British rule. But the condemnation that they uh, engaged in was unwarranted and inappropriate, it seems to me, because Ramon Rai actually lived in a period before the era of nationalism. And these historians were really arguing from that position where nationalism has al had already firmly established, as, and of course, after independence, this was, this was the general, the accepted truth, that in fact, the proper agency, the, the actual force that would bring about, or that could bring about a true uh, regeneration of Indian society and, and the state could only be a task to be accomplished by Indians. And this whole faith in the partnership uh, with, with British liberals uh, was in fact completely displaced. Uh, but, their argument comes from that nationalist position. Whereas it seems to me that the era of the 1820s or 30s uh, was not one where this kind of nationalism had, had emerged in India at all. Uh, so this was a different era uh, where there was this uh, faith in, in the progressive potentials of. Of, of the enlightened sections or the liberal sections of British society, the same people that Ramon uh, cheered on when they were passing the uh, reform bills in, in Parliament in England, uh, where they were all the uh, anti -abolition, abolition of slavery, uh, all of that uh, was, was taking place. Uh, it was also the case with Ramon uh, that his liberalism also came from an era which was before democracy, which was before mass democracy. This was a liberalism which 
uh, of course, they, they voted representative rule. They believed in the enlightened sections of society to take the lead. Uh, there was no uh, argument that there would be uh, universal franchise, for instance. This was not in, 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 in their uh, perspective. Where again, I think uh, Ramon or Dalpanak were, were misled, wasn't believing that there, there could actually be an equal partnership uh, between British liberals and, and, and Indians because uh, the re relation between rulers and subjects could, in a sense, fundamentally could not be equal. And this, of course, we, uh, we know uh, with a whole series of things that happened with the various progressive uh, moves that were made, for instance, with Macaulay's reforms and, and so on. Uh, now, uh, so I think fundamentally, therefore, whereas the, you know, identifying the, the problem was they were correct, uh, it seems to me that the political position that they then took was, in a sense, inappropriate. But I think there are two things I would then go on to say. Uh, first of all, this question of the retreat from rationalism. Uh, this argument, of course, is based on essentially this one very thin tract in Farsi, which Ramon Rai produced. That's about the only thing we have from the early period of Ramon's uh, writing. Uh, and this is a question when looking at, uh, when I uh, try to look into the literature on Ramon, uh, it, it really puzzled me as to how it was the case that for someone who was such a prominent figure in this city, uh, who had a, uh, a very devoted circle of highly educated people who in their own right were, many of them were very well placed in, 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 in their professional careers. And yet we have so little of Ramon Rai's Farsi writing available. How was it the case? Without doubt, that was his principal literary language. Uh, and there are various references he makes himself. Uh, but he was clearly someone who was engaged in, 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 in really um, significant volume of uh, controversies and discussions and so on in, based in the city. Uh, and yet we have almost nothing. Uh, my suspicion is that for his followers, there was a sense of, might in, in fact say, somewhat embarrassment about this part of Ramon's early engagement, especially with his deep engagement with Islam, uh, that there may have been, so that uh, almost absolutely nothing, as far as I know, nothing survives from his personal library. Uh, I don't know if, if anything at all it could ever be found, which is very surprising because, because we had probably uh, all of it in the city. The other thing, and I'll stop with this remark, uh, is that we know so little of his professional career as a businessman. Now, Ram Mohan Rai, I mean, if you put it this way, his daytime job, his real day job, wasn't being a businessman, uh, especially when he was living in this city. Uh, we know he, he, he engaged in, in uh, uh, lending money, uh, in property deals. He had partnerships with various uh, European private traders. Uh, and although it's, it is alleged that, his, uh, for instance, uh, we, we don't know any of, uh, any of the private traders, of course, but it is possible to, to construct careers from, we know this from uh, the career of uh, Dharabhara Chakra, for instance. Even though <laughs> that, uh, his private papers were destroyed by his grandson, uh, and we, we have no uh, rec, you know, trace of his private papers. But it was possible for Blair Kling, for instance, to construct a fairly uh, detailed uh, biography of Darpanath as, as uh, Darpanath's business uh, career. Uh, 
uh, once again, my suspicion is there is, uh, you know, there is so much commitment uh, by later historians to Ram Mohan as essentially a, a spiritual and intellectual leader that, you know, this side of his career has simply not been uh, looked at. Uh, it seems to me, Alex, if there are any younger historians present here. This seems to me an area, because as far as I know, since the 1970s, almost no new sources have been discovered uh, that throws light on, on Ramon's career. This may well be one, one possibility, it seems to me. But I'll stop here. My time is up. Thank you. Well, let me first begin by the line from the most authentic book on Indian history, written by Parto Chatterjee. Hmm? <laughs> Page 28. One might then react to the revisionist argument in the manner of the student radical in a Calcutta university in the early 70s, who, when asked in a history stage whether Ramon Rai was born in 1772 or 1774 replied, I don't know, but I do know that he grew up to be a competitor. <laughs> now, this is the most authentic textbook throughout internationally. And I hope this anecdote is valid. And the man is fair as I remember is me, the student. And the examiner is Tripurari Chakravarti. The university is Jadapur. So this is the stand of the 70s. Let me frankly say, I have forgotten every article of B.C. Joshi. I remember nothing. I have only a vague limit that they are discussing Shumit Shankar and others and Ashokshin is discussing the limit of the Renaissance. I have forgotten everything. Now, my main theory is Roshinka Choudhury. <laughs> um, one and a half months ago, he gave an imperious order. Write an article on Ramon Rai, 8,000 um, words within 10 days. <laughs> I am going to Bakura at the 45 feet, but he said, and my student um, uh, 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 has came as a messenger, Rajoshi goes. I first rejected it, but he uh, came as a messenger from the center. You must write. <laughs> I am not now in the household. Just rejected without any books. But however, I have tried to talk with Ramon Rai. In that heat. And this is my impression on Ramon Rai, just with the talk. First, I'm struck by the debates, not the structure of the Debates. Prabhu Pakko or Siddhanta Pakko or Prabhu Tok or Nibhattha. That I know. Nah. Number nine. Also, but that do not interest me. He is a very old man. Two words again and again he repeated. Durbakko and Matsya. Don't you Durbakko. Debate should not be on Durbarko. Matsar. Matsar is an old noun. Desho. Anger. Perifilbo. That actually some debate is. Nair. Vigrostan. 
jati stall whole structure of the jalpo don't do that brahman shabade missionary patra pradan in everything don't do don't abuse no i'm not a very much uh, trolling or this um, social media even if i depend on the pin restrain of the language until and unless you go on the restrain of the language i will use two about haqeeqat bini the sat patat or satat it won't stop be restrained if anybody abuse you that you are a bjp or you are a communist you should not react then i can another thing i understand my name of, of my article is of course i must say kal aaj porshu prasang ramamula i'm standing on aaj and when i problematize today i take a metaphor for shrimad bhagavad gita Present, Rabindranath Tagore also said that present is also has a past and a future, and Ram Mohan Roy is certainly a tension. Peace also read to her father. I was struck by the courage of the listener. He is a vast. As far as my knowledge goes, with all the rationalities of this form, challenging the Quran is interpolations in Quran, human intervention in Quran. To call it a famous sura of the uh, Bakra, jihadi sura, the sword and force, and he said. This is all the ploy of the Mustafa Hadin. And first discussion of the interpolation in Quran. How the Quran has been interpolated and its argument is fantastic. I have no time. This to take half an hour to discuss. His hermeneutics books, his whole knowledge. He is arguing against actually Shah Waliullah, the greatest theologian of Asia, Hujjatul Baliha. But that is the time. Secondly, he has attacked that term a Nabuat, Hajat Muhammad is not the last man. Dangerous. I don't know. Any Islamic text has dealt with this question. Dilip Bishash even played out this question. And most better, no fatwa has been issued against Ramon Rai, and Ramon Rai has been very much sent by Mughal Empire to get. See the element of toleration, intoleration, and courage of it. Third, well, uh, maybe, maybe, maybe when I write, I am not much fond of the liberal state. Neither I am appreciated the roots of liberalism, and I know Bailey has. That in a hidden interpretation, hidden enlightenment, with a question mark. Hmm. He is doubtful whether in India there is a hidden enlightenment. I am going beyond that question. Me, one of the best book on Ramon, when I am reading, Bimal Krishna. Matilal, one of the greatest philosophers of modern India. He took up 
Ram Mohan's question on, on a big broader thing. Bigger morality and lower morality. Sectional morality, sectional reason, and universal morality and universal faith. There I found printing Ram Mohan correspondence, Ram Mohan's hesitation whether law should come or not is quite accepted. And this goes on. I Najbe. Chet Korbo, we know they want to be the Ajbe. Morality role key, universal reason and community reason and role key balance. Don't think Ramon Dias resolved this question, but Ramon Dias opened up this question. Last, I'm going, I think Ranajit Goho in his Daya opened up a whole deal of questions of Azunikata, emotion, and fear. Well, first day, Daya, Sreyo, Sneho, Ramonda again and again repeated. And that goes on, no? Vidya Shagar's Karna, Bhankim Chandas, my most favorite, 19th century teacher and character at Toad Jadi, Bankim Chandra Ke, Dekhte Payam Nam, Sair Akta Klas Nam in Mech Sair. Sari Nam, Dekhte Sair. Aapnaan Mato, Likhte Pari Nao, Mod Jai, Thog Naka Nao Nao Jidda Jai, Bog Naka Nao. Kolo Nidhi Sair. Prithi, Malakantair, Mon Harai Yate, Malakantair Prithi, Sebekanando, Shibao, and that old fool, Gandhi, his talisman speech, he always asks me, whatever have you done whole day? Has your power bought a love solace in the most poor man? Are you seeing? So the emotiveness of the enlightenment began with the Ramon. Then I go back with Ramon and struck that how he used Hafi. His Jikre Hafi. Three centuries before he selected the Hafi poem. His enlightenment is a use of Hafi poem. Specific use of Hafi poem. You know? Jange of that bottom and lot bowser bane. Ekat Nabini Rahe of Sunny is a dog. Or his famous look. He again and again repeated. Mabas Darpae a dog. Ache Quaikun Darin Tarikayaman. Gairajin Gnanis Mabas Darpai Yasas. Do not press at us. Che Kwaikun Jai Ichatai Koro. Darin Tarikayaman in the religion of ours. Gairajin Gnahuni Echara Arkunu Doshni. Whole Iranian Marifat argument is using against Istan. That, that is also relevant in our times. The violence, Mahabharata Jake Bale, Anishamsata, Afik to Ramahan, to this comes to me. Finally, but Say, I'm the Shabai, no? Kaler Putul or Kalantare Putit. Raman is also Kaler Putul. Nadi Ramad Kalabalten Ibn Ulwakt. Son of the time, of course, is a son of the time. Hmm. I am take many of his items of the son of the times, arrogant, very much hierarchical. He is 
थोड़ोली मुनवारी दलित्रा और बहुत पढ़ नहीं बोल रहे मेरा को मुनवारी तो कर नहीं मुनीशा अरे सेम टाइम इस टेलीफेटिंग टू बुक्स ऑन इस बजट शुरू राइट एंटी आई एम नॉट गोइंग इनटू टेकिंग आज इस शुद्ध देर मौत का वो उचित है ड्रिंकिंग इन Calcutta, according to the cost. My most important question, if I met the Mohan, I would have asked, "You know everything? The religion, Nanak Sai, France. Why have you again and again hammering the same thing? The Mughal rule has destroyed the centers of Hindu learning." You know that Mughal rule has not destroyed the centers of Hindu learning. It patronized very much, but that is a again repeated thing. I can make up the other things. I can't make up the Ramon's this. Now, despite this, anyone is reason. His love, his toleration. You must not debate without going language. He has used to turn. No, Nishan is a man. He has a man in Nishan. Again and again, so far, that Zaban is Nishan is a man. Just like excessive. This could well. Down in a zaban in each of such language of on in the uh, spear of the language, and another is the language of spear. You must maintain balance between this. So this voice of reason, this toleration, this interpretation of Hafiz created an. Another element phase of the within the well early modernity or colonial modernity I don't know a phase for thinking for us that is my Ramon. Thank you. Thank you. So, Prachi, did this start with it come automatically? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear. Because volume okay, okay, good. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so, we, I mean, I want to follow basically uh, the logic of the questions that uh, Rosinga put to us, but um, but use that partly to um, place um, our thoughts about Ramon Roy, both historical in the seventies and today. Um, and for me, looking at the 1970s, two things come together. I mean, this was a period when I was very much a novice uh, in the world of historians, history writing. I was an apprentice to Burundi and I joined the center, shared an office with Gautam. Um, Partho was very much there, and um, and I was learning from all of these people. But but the what stands out in my memory of that period are two themes, or two um, one one political movement and the theme of thinking that that kind of come together. And in my head, it really belongs to the history of the Hindu Bajrulok. Oh, of West Bengal, and it's a post-partition history, which is that the the coming of the Naxalite movement and the rise of the left coincided with uh, Hindu Bhadralok intellectuals denouncing themselves and their own heritage as something that had contributed 
negatively to the development of Bengal. Um, Parth used the word, I think, collaborator or uh, agent. Gautam used the word comprador. I had actually learned the word comprador uh, from, the, from my Naxalite friends, even before I became a historian. The word was already, I, I, I was using it uh, to mean dalal, as Parth was saying, without quite no, knowing where the word came from. And my, my memory goes back to actually even slightly before the Naxalite movement broke, some of the stuff that Binoy Ghosh was writing uh, in criticism of our sense of the 19th century glory of the Hindu Vatsalok. And here I have to say that the people whose descendants we are, uh, the Hindu Vatsalok, I mean, our 15 minutes of fame or our, the most glorious part of our history was the 19th century. And basically we were uh, otherwise a fairly marginal group uh, in the, even in the late Mughal structure, the, when the Delhi emperor decided to appoint Ramohan Roy as his emissary, the debates within the palace quite clearly showed that they hadn't heard of him. And, uh, and some of the princes were actually opposed to his appointment. They didn't know he was an upstart. Who was he? So they had to give him the title Raja to uh, make him worthy of being the emperor's emissary. Um, and really, I mean, it's it sort of once, uh, you know, when my parents got my horoscope done, uh, apparently it was written in my horoscope that, uh, that I would enjoy Mlecho Shongshar Givunmati. But, but what, I, what I have probably enjoyed in my life was true of the Bengali Hindu middle class that it's, it's a Mletcher Shongshagra, the Shongshagra of the Europeans uh, that uh, gave us some kind of prominence. But, but more than that, it's something that uh, Roshanka is now working on. It opened up Europe to us um, to a degree where um, even uh, the, the legacy of Hafiz or Rumi that Gautam was talking about became quite diluted in somebody like Rabindranath. It wasn't absent. Um, but um, the whole tradition of Bengalis like Ramon Roy or even Devendra Chakur, uh, knowing Parsi, uh, became quite diluted. And uh, one could look at the history of modern Bengali literature to actually say, see this move away from uh, the Indo Islamic uh, ecumen. And, and actually, Rabindra's little small comments on the history of Bengali literature show that. By the end of the 1960s, the Hindu Hajralok, at least the intellectuals like on the left, like Binar Ghosh was an intellectual on the left, were clearly blaming their ancestors for what, what, what had happened in our own history. Uh, the word, the word Hajralok became a category. It was becoming a category of historical analysis. Broomfield wrote about it. We were angry with the way Broomfield talked about it, but even Shumidda's Chaudhashi movement uses, discusses the category. So category became, Hodrudu became a category of historical analysis and the Nakshite movement <coughs> clearly uh, saw the, the so-called Renaissance as actually a period of collaboration with, with, with the British and I, and the little bit of history that I read uh, even before becoming an apprentice historian were really from what uh, the Naxalite intellectuals like Shorazdat and others were writing in Deshobrut in justification of uh, the movement to behead, behead statues in criticism of people like Vidashagor for having allowed the use of Sanskrit college for billeting soldiers at the time of the mutiny. All of those, so my own sense is, that, and then what happens, of course, the center starts and people like Ashok Babu or Shumidda and even Boron Babu, they as Parthu was saying, I mean, they did not directly say that these people were, they were did not, I mean, they were not, didn't angrily say that these people were Dalals of the British, but they intellectualized the proposition because um, the other category that became a very important analytical category, which I guess we don't quite use with the same passion and intensity anymore, uh, was colonialism. And you know, JNU was a place where it was, it was about which it was said that every sem no seminar was complete un until somebody asked the question, what about the role of colonialism? 
And you remember these years, by the mid 70s, the idea of colonial mode of production, there was a huge debate about that. So in, in many respects, that colonial rule itself was uh, an obstacle to the economic development of a country. It came from many different sources that dependency theory was picked up by Bipan, Bipan Chandra, I think in a 1971 essay. Um, then um, I remember Borun Babu teaching us and using an expression that Daniel Thorner had used. Uh, and the expression was built-in retardation. And he would explain to us that the colonial economy was characterized by a built-in retardation. And eventually, Ashok Babu would give an intellectual spine to our anger by saying, look, Ramon Rai may have been a good person. Bida Shagur may have been a good person. They were rationalists. They were good. But they were, um, it was impossible for them to actually modernize the country because uh, the class they represented, that is the Bajra low class, um, were not actually tied to any, um, any productive use of, um, of, of capital. And, uh, and therefore, uh, one should not be, uh, one should not be, one should not have to abuse one's ancestors to recognize that they were faced with tremendous structural limitations. But the, the thing is, what I'm saying is today, when I think about it, the change from today, the, the difference from today is that we looked at the 19th century, not even though when you wrote its history, we did not look at the 19th century with any sense of historical distance. We were angry about these people, which is why we broke the, the, you know, the statues, the, the heads of their statues. So I would say that historical distance had collapsed in, uh, you know, at a point in Bhadraluk history where Bhadraluk intellectuals were actually developing a mood of self-indictment to explain um, what is very obvious today, the, the terrible state of uh, West Bengal economy and, 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 the, and the fact that uh, whatever dreams they had post-partition to create a Hindu dominant sense of nationality in West Bengal um, actually has collapsed. Uh, the dreams have collapsed and the project has collapsed, but, but, but the project was fueled by a certain kind of anger, which I think, and in that mood, even when historians wrote history, I think a lot of anachronism entered. Uh, and today, my feeling is that what has allowed us to think about this conference as many worlds of Raman Roy uh, is precisely a much more of a historical distance which allows us to see that this man participated in many different worlds. I mean, you know, you just have to compare Delhi uh, from Ghalib's birth to his death with Calcutta of the same years. And you will find that the British Delhi was a very different place or the British Mughal Delhi from the city of Calcutta. And as Gautam was saying, I mean, Ramon Roy, um, who wrote Tufat, whom Muslims would refer to as a Malabi, um, as this deep. And if he was arguing with Waliullah, it just shows that at the same time, if he was quoting Locke and Bacon to other people and engaging with, with, with uh, a certain kind of reformist Christianity and clearly knew about uh, Martin Luther and obviously uh, the Christians used the word reformer about him in his own lifetime. And this man was clearly capable of negotiating many different worlds. And the world was not as much together as it is today. And, and therefore, um, um, I mean, even when he, Partha was talking about businessman, I mean, uh, the, this came up when Shulip was giving the next when Ramon Roy uh, made a deal with the emperor for uh, what he would be paid for the emissary work. I mean, it was a very hard bargain he drove. I mean, if, if the Mughal empire had continued, his progenies would have benefited in perpetuity. Uh, I was amazed by the sheer shrewdness of this man. Uh, you know, he was genuinely a Brahmanishto Grihosto, underlining Grihosto, but also Brahmanishto uh, at the same time. So what I think has happened today is that we have much more of a sense of historical distance. Uh, to varying degrees. I mean, not everybody would agree with my position, but I definitely feel that I have much more of a sense of historical distance. Even Partho's distinction that he made in the black hole of empire between what he called the, an early modern phase and a colonial modern phase 
was indicative of that historical distance. Even what Gautam was just saying today, I think is indicative. When Gautam said, I've forgotten with the V.C. Joshi volume. Um, this is what I think today. I mean, he's clearly uh, distancing himself from, from that period. Now that distance is not just autobiographical. I think, I think much more of a sense of historical distance has emerged, allowing us to uh, evaluate this man um, along the many different dimensions of his personality and allowing for a, a period when the world was getting together, but was not quite together. Uh, and as I was saying, the world of Calcutta was very different from the world of Delhi in the same period, with some similarities, but many, many dissimilarities and fascinating ones. So, um, and that actually, I, I think that also probably has the potential to liberate uh, the Hindu Bajralog from this breast beating kind of self indictment that we developed in the 1970s and probably uh, look at the 19th century and our own failures and successes as historians with some sense of historical distance. One of the interesting things uh, I was also saying in the transition was that if you, you know, I was, I was thinking of Ramon and thinking that I know very little about how people reacted to the news of his death. I mean, he was the, clearly, clearly he was made a worldly figure by, by global Christianity in many ways. Um, and he becomes a person to reckon with in Indian history much later, I think, in the 19th century, of course, to the, uh, uh, and then the early, early 20th century, of course. And then, um, but to think that is precisely to pose a distance between our time and his time. And, uh, uh, and what I'm looking forward to in the conference is, is gaining more of a sense of that, that historical distance, because um, at least I was an obvious, I remember that all my, the 19th century was a very emotion laden project. And, and from within the Naxalite movement, the Renaissance was a, 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 mainly a negative emotion laden project. Um, even Borba, I remember, wrote, a, wrote an essay asking whether the word Renaissance could be used at all with regard to the 19th century. So maybe I'll, I'll stop there and, uh, and wait to see what other questions come up in the discussion. Thank you very much. So, if Golunga is rightly pointing out that, it does, that, that you don't have to, you don't have to ask the question. Um, let me why people are formulating the question. Ask, um, start start by asking a question that that. Um, has troubled me. I've, I've, I've written about this. Um, the 1970s revaluation that we talk, talked about, and uh, Gosanda mentioned the BC, uh, the BC Joshi, BC Joshi volume, of course, which is uh, you know um, at the center of all this talk of uh, revaluation. Re One of my questions to the panel, in fact, uh, had been to ask uh, whether uh, because the volume really. Um, uh, yeah, you know, uh, at the Nehru Museum uh, conference, uh, gave rise to the volume. Ajatraya, don't name introduction. Yes, exactly. Also yes. So, I'll, I'll be the volume shop. <laughs> 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 so, so, <laughs> so, yeah. so, 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 the so, 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 the so, 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 or was the politics of the time responsible for the volume? In a sense, it's a it's a question that doesn't need answering. The two were, of course, interwoven. But my 
trouble with the volume, my, my difficulty with the volume and the three essays that we spoke about in the volume to greater and lesser degree, of course, in the essays, um, was a lack of archival resources. I wanted to ask this question with regard to all of the, because we are now talking about academic essays. Borun Babu, Ashok Shen, Borunde are all relying on a very limited archive of the Bengal Kurkaru newspaper that is available to them here in Calcutta. And they are basing their entire academic revaluation on what I think are incomplete resources. So my question really is to do with methodology in a sense, in that, which is a point actually also made by uh, 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 all of you, Deepeshta particularly at the end, that uh, the, 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 the revaluation or the, the academic the, the academic content was uh, less than actually the emotional content of the response uh, of these of these historians. Uh, part of the mentioned uh, that the politics uh, uh, of the time was nationalist. That they were they were applying a certain kind of nationalist politics uh, to this earlier period that was not ethical. That is that is that is an argument you've made in Black Hole of Empire, okay, and and okay. yes, and, and 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 he just said that as well. So my question was to do with 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 the lack of archival resources, and whether apart from historical distance, whether a greater access to new materials, which are only available with much difficulty, I can see, but which might be available, um, whether more study of archival resources not available here locally, perhaps available in the British Library or in other places in the world, uh, more than they are available here, may have given some, uh, may have made a difference to the argumentation. Uh, because it is one thing to be emotional politically, and it is one thing to be emotional academically. And I, I, I just wanted to Rinka, uh, can, I, this, this, Rinka, this, can I respond to it? Yes, please, yes. Quickly. See, I mean, Something I um, forgot to mention is that it, you know it's not just uh, archives and if if better research, I mean even better research might have sustained the, the same argument if people wanted to uh, you know use the data to make the same argument. The problem is in the last fifty years we've been through major historiographical shifts. So for instance. Today, I mean, when Partho was writing Black Hole of Empire or Chris Bailey was writing the book on liberalism, it's much easier to keep in mind what was going on in the early 19th century in Latin America. What, you know, so that, so that the, the whole, the problem of, you know, the, the mestizo modernity and modernization based on the mestizo population was something that as a vision was available to Ramon Roy. But, but our becoming aware of the availability of that fact to Ramon Roy is part of the story of the rise of global history. Whereas Parthu is right to say that we were, we were actually doing nationalist history, but, uh, but we were doing nationalist history within a desire for modernization of this part of the land. And therefore trying to figure out what were the constraints on growth. And 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 and, uh, and and distributive justice. And this was the rise of the left front. Many of our colleagues were actually part of the state planning commission, even people at the center, to not say the center. And these discussions were, you know, were of one body. I mean, so in in some ways, um, that's what I mean to say that there was a kind of a. This was one way of, kind of, tackling the question or. Kind of coming to terms with uh, middle class Bengali Bhagavad's own the disappointment, the failure of this class. But the, the, the emotional bit was that we were, the Naxalites were trying to blame it on persons. The academics actually produced a more structural argument about the colonial economy, saving um, a personal attitude of respect to these people. I mean, Oshuba was the prime architect of this kind of move that look, it's the colonial economy that's limiting. But the people are very respectable. So you don't, you shouldn't be abusive about them in the way that Naxalites were, you know, call them Dalals and worse sometimes. Um, but I think the whole enterprise was part of us trying to explain to ourselves why did the future happen? I mean, you have to remember that at the same time, the 60s 
where it's time for recirculation of the poetry and the music and the songs of the 40s. I mean, the lines we were using, even in the elections of uh, 67, you know, we were recycling what Sholil wrote, what Shukanta wrote, what Shubhashmukhodhya wrote in, in the 40s, right? So there's a kind of a, so this rise of the left and the kind of intellectual form, formulations we were making are, they're all things happening together. Huh. Well, no, um, problem of archives, if you say as a document, the problem of archives, as far as my knowledge goes, is, has been very much debated and solved between 30s and 70s. Rojan Bandhavakai, in 30s, one after another, is publishing documents. And the Brahmo scholars are republishing and expanded it. And Rojan Bandhavakai is saying their tips. Whole Ramon archival debate between Brahmo and Rojan Bandhavakai is an interest. But then Bandhapadda has been never published in a sense in a book form. B, but there are certain archival problems. And she is now reading Ramon Rai due to the insistence of Madam. I am now I'm sure, right? My dog. You can't understand Ramon Rai with a modicum of theological mm, investment. That is very clear understanding of Jerry Bishop. Read his introduction. He two years spent with Srimon Tarkacharjo to understand Ramon. At the same time when I am reading to I understand until and unless you know Pujyutul Badika, be careful. The Shah, Waliullah, and the whole debate around the Madrasai Russia. You won't understand it. Quite not the understand. You won't realize the full implications of the world. And that I don't think any writer at V.C. Joseph's book has invested. So there is the lack of investment in that. Without theology, you won't understand any popular movement or any editor of religion. Religion is the oldest sacrifice. Ramajit Go has said, but you must know theology. And Ramajit Go has read theology, Pragavit Go, Dayaki, Dhammat, Tattva, Dayadham, Jivedayatabha, Paramadharma, Jivedayat, all genealogy of Daya. At the same time, Dilipisha's investment, Samanu, Puti, Upanivishi, how Shankar, has been transformed again and again by the intervention of Ramo. And if you read any text of Ramo, see the references, the range of references, <coughs> hierarchy of Puran, hierarchy of Mahabharata, various interpretations of Mahabharata, my God, my God. Until and unless you take those theological interpretations, Kotakura Tikhnaregi Ram line, or Puleke Ram, Ram Mangai, Otofo. That's my point. Archives is not mere document, but there is also an archival theological investment. That, that book completely lacks. I don't know Bulejai. <laughs> <laughs> No, I think, you know, Rosinka's question actually brings up 
a very fundamental feature of that 1976 or that year. Because previous to that, virtually everything that was written about Ramon Rai was focused on a biographical understanding. So there was a question of reading his writings, all of, all of that was putting all that together. So all those collections that were brought out by the Brahmo Shonas of you know, put together as English writings, Bangla writings, and so on. All the biographies were about this. This volume is the first time that the question is taken away from the biographical question into connecting Ramon Rai as this figure, as the father of the of Indian modernity, and connect it with what was happening at the time in the colonial economy and in politics at the time. So, in fact, when you ask the uh, archival question, these all these essays deal with what was then by then the standard biographies of, of, of Ramon. There is virtually nothing there which uh, looks at anything, anything new. What is new is this discussion on the colonial economy, where you get all the standard, you know, Arsida, Digby, and so on. But this is where the new research, which is only just happening in the 70s. It is in the 1970s that this whole uh, new approach to deindustrialization. This is Omiyobakchi's writings were only then beginning. De de Oshok Sen's own work, right? Uh, this is what was, and so this is where in terms of the new, you said the Bengal Harkara, because again, don't forget the, what the situation was in terms of the local archives. You had to go into the National Library uh, reading room, okay? Uh, and then basically copy material. There was, there was no, nothing else. Uh, this was only just beginning. Uh, so that is what you see in these essays. Almost the first time those two things were brought together. <laughs> Yes. Uh, may I just hand you this small thing, which is uh, the replacement for the money? Yeah. Ita hat hatte rekha bolbo. Aaj. Kochna ita bhavar kori ni aage. I wanted to go back to the late seventies, early eighties when we are studying history, and I know that uh, that's moved from being students of history to becoming a teacher of history, which to us happened because the person who was mentioned, who wrote the introduction to VC World, Joshi's book, Roger Thrai, Roger Thrai, my teacher. Roger Thrai, the introduction. So when Roger, since people are being autobiographical, I can say when Roger Babu inducted um, a very close friend and me to start teaching, we had barely finished our MA. And we were asked to teach, is one of the things I had to teach along with English history was social and cultural history. These were new papers, intellectual history. So VC Joshi was a book we could not afford to ignore. I mean, it was for us, Jeta Bolahana Gule Khawa Boy, that but for an, I had forgotten it completely. So it also means that uh, going back to it was like going back in time myself to the kinds of debates we had. And I also think more broadly that much of the problem of those reacting in the 70s were to these labels that very unfairly were put on Ramon and to which we still not be able, been able to extricate. Bharat Pothik, father of modern India, right? These are the things which continue to repeat itself in all the textbooks. Who was the father of modern India, right? I mean, these are questions that would always come. Now, I think part of the anger that Dipesh Babu talked about, the emotion, etc., was perhaps I feel less against Ram Mohan himself, but all those who put him on that pedestal and made him that kind of arbiter of reform, modernity, even nationalism, early nationalism. So it was against the entire Renaissance historiography, if we could say. That is the moment that is captured in that book, that it is, and it's after Shumit Sharka's own essays on the Bengal Renaissance, right? So in a way, it is that debate, the 
in a way, the undoing of the Bengal Renaissance in some ways, questioning it, its social basis, and of course, Ram Mohan's role within it. So in some ways, I feel that, uh, yes, it was bringing Ram Mohan down to a certain social economic basis, but it was really against an entire 19th and early 20th century historiography and the kind of central place that 19th century Bengal as leading the way, right? The place of, and the whole terminology of the Renaissance, there was a huge debate on that too. So I feel that in a way, it's a kind of deflected anger, which was perhaps less on Ram Mohan, partly on Ram Mohan, but on the, all the others who had produced this kind of sense of Ram Mohan as this pioneer, the person who abolished Sati, the person who founded the Brahma Shamaj, of course, and all of that, right? So I, so I wanted this response that when Dipishta talks about historical distance, what is it that prevented, you're already a centenary after Ram Mohan Rai, right? Historical distance should have been completely available in the 70s. So what is it that makes the 2000s the time to think of historical distance rather than the 70s? So do we collect questions or, yeah, that would be good in terms of time. Tony Kadi. Yeah, Shukun. Uh, yes, I agree completely with Taputi and I was thinking of, I mean, it came back, the memories of... Uh... Okay, shall I stand up? Or... I agree completely with Taputi. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, and I was thinking back to Teen Murti, uh, my first, uh, you know, encounter with Teen Murti, and of course the upstairs room here where we sat on the floor and listened. And I completely see what uh, Taputi is saying, and I think part of the, uh, you know, uh, part of the excitement of that those times was it was also a historiographical break with, uh, you know, the whole Bengal Renaissance, R.C. Mojumdar, uh, the kind of history that we had been uh, listening to or reading from our school days onwards, and which in a way would then be carried forward vis-a-vis -vis the nationalists by uh, JNU, CHS, Bipan Chandra, and that started then, and then the Mukherjee's and so on, a very powerful tradition of, uh, let's say, a uh, kind of hagiography almost. And it was a sons against fathers moment in the early 70s too, which, uh, uh, you know, uh, shows the lack of historical distance that um, Deepesh was talking about. I have a small, a couple of small questions to put to Pathoda, if I may. Uh, one is that I, uh, completely agree again about the anachronism that the 70s critics, uh, uh, you know, were implicated in to a certain extent. And I would like to stretch it further because Ram Mohan after all died in 1830 and the total uh, collapse of Bengali business, independent business ventures or collaborative business ventures happened really 40s, 50s. 50 was the final moment of that. So it was not possible for Ram Mohan to anticipate that what had already begun from the 20s would not uh, carry on. And as Shugato has pointed out, the effects of the 1770 famine were receding, almost a forgotten memory, and Bengal was regaining the agrarian. Um, you know, the cultivation was coming back. Uh, so uh, in hindsight, we can say that uh, Ram Mohan's hopes were misplaced. And of course, uh, it would have been a disaster had there been a settler colony. I mean, the only redeeming feature of British rule was that it was not a settler colony. So I, uh, uh, you know, it is anachronistic to expect Ram Mohan to see all that. And here perhaps, you know, the pre-modern or pre-colonial traditions that Ram Mohan was very critical about. Uh, Mughal rule, for instance, uh, 
absence of accountability and so on, let's say despotism, that's also quite interesting politically. Thank you. Yeah. So Shukunya and then uh, am I audible? Uh, am I audible? Yes, but if you could speak a little louder for the room, I'm sure you're audible on the system. Okay, all right, all right. So uh, thank you for the panel. My question is uh, primarily directed at Professor Chatterjee, but I'm trying to synoptically uh, bring together the panel uh, in my question as well. So it, rather than, so like Professor Taputi Guthakurta just said, if we are allowed to be slightly autobiographical, now our time is surely not the 70s and we are situated today. And I'm trying to think from uh, today's lens about what uh, the concern today should be. I ask this because uh, from the perspective of historical distance, I'm trying to think of what is the nature, uh, you know, the exact nature of liberalism. All right. So uh, I'm trying to think about what is the exact nature of liberalism that we are imagining before nationalism and before democracy. Is it a kind of, uh, if, if I take you from Professor Bhadro's uh, understanding, is it a kind of theology of tolerance that we are talking about? What is the liberalism we are trying to think about here? And if so, what are we trying to do today? Are we trying mm. to reclaim an emotional regional past? Or is it a different kind of global history? Because the terms that keep coming back surely are an emotional reclamation, or if, if not a term, that's the sensibility I've been able to derive. And yet, Professor Chatterjee was talking, if I understood correctly, about a kind of liberalism, but which is not nationalist yet, which is not democratic yet. So what is it? That's fine. Nazmo, yeah. 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 I can't hear you, Nazmo. <clears throat> Ah, I see. I see. Okay, okay. Now, now I have it. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah. Basically, it's a question partly related to the historical distance and the points they brought up, but also like, of course, in uh, uh, Professor Chatterjee's kind of uh, chapter in Black Hole, this, 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 the attempt to kind of rethink the early 19th century moment to reperiodize it. So, I mean, it's interesting to me why in the 19. 70s. I mean, the question I think also was brought up earlier, because uh, why was the distance elided? I guess there's one our story that Divesta told partly about the post 47 history of it. The other question I think is the question of colonialism. It became a shorthand in the period, um, but intellectually, of course, well, if one reads the early history of Ramon scholarship, the two things kind of like basically resisted until that point. Ram collapsing Ramon in the late 20th century moment of Indian history. One of that, of course, what he himself wrote, but when reads his writing carefully, the difference is quite legible of, about from his successors. But also um, the question of like, you know, I mean, what he was reading and the people who he was kind of um, associating with, basically his position in the larger British imperial war, right? So, I mean, if one reads even the, I mean, the, so the volume that came out in 1933 after his, uh, you know, centenary of his death anniversary, most of his, you know, even though many, many people are at this point slowly becoming inclined to enlist him in the kind of the longer history of Indian nationalism, there's still a lot of errors. Most people would, you know, even some of the uh, commentators who are making the effort to say, look, Ramon, you can't make him, basically. Uh, you have to basically make the germs of modern Indian, whatever, uh, anti-colonial movement, the Congress movement, but at best germs. And of course, the one thing was Ramon's influences, what he was reading, right? And I think the best I mentioned back home, but also like almost, the, almost all of these people he was citing would be 18th century European uh, Enlightenment thinkers, fairly removed from the more meaningful progressivist 
um, uh, thought we would see in the 19th century. So I, partly the question here is that what was the reckoning with uh, that, that history, that, that history of early Ramon scholarship? Um, I mean, was there a secret history behind why it was kind of forgotten so easily dispensable in that period? Well, I imagine the colonialism question and the other question does go a long way to explain it, but I'm still curious to hear a little bit more. And that is also like a other related question, partly about the intellectual context of the moment. So of course, one of the things that this, all of these people that this is just a moment, many scholars are trying to reckon with partly uh, in you know, this, this, the renewed view of thinking about the tension between um, you know, ideas, basically in many ways, kind of you know, a great loadable norms and they are often um, questionable kind of social or economic basis. Now, this part of this, of course, is happening already with, with C.B. McPherson's 1962 volume, The Political Theory of Positive Individualism. I mean, partly the liberalism scholar debate in, uh, in um, European scholarship at that time, um, well, not identical, but similar kind of um, uh, developments are going on. So to what extent partly that debate kind of entered into the kind of uh, that 1970s moment? Because I don't see that being cited or being referred to explicitly. So thank you. Thank you, thank you. The last question was here out of time now. So I, I only heard this question partially, but it, I don't know, it may have something to do with what I was going to ask. Is, is the uh, um, embarrassment and, and no, okay. <clears throat> I said I only heard the, uh, that particular, the last question partially, but it may be connected to what I'm about to uh, ask or comment on. And that's the kind of, uh, so the inability or the embarrassment about these uh, um, very interesting moments to do with the emergence of a figure like Ram Mohan Rai and then the moment of the revaluation in the 70s uh, to place this uh, in the context of world history, except through the lens of uh, say colonialism or imperialism to, to kind of uh, place it in what's happening in the world. And so the moment of revaluation, uh, so I'm, I'm going back to what Dipesh said about the self-indictment um, of the Bengali Bhadralok. So he, he call, doesn't call it, call it a left indictment of the Bhadralok, he calls it a self-indictment. So, um, a, a kind of debacle is taking place for the bourgeoisie at that time, everywhere in the world. It, it manifests itself as left indictment, but in it, in 20 years, the bourgeoisie will become an anachronism everywhere because of globalization. Uh, so um, the same thing happens to the Bhadra look. It's part of a larger narrative of a, a the bourgeoisie being a source of value, a self-questioning source of value, becoming everywhere uh, redundant. And the redundancy doesn't only come via the, the left, it comes eventually via the free market and globalization, which makes that bourgeoisie redundant. Uh, can we not place some of this revaluation of what's happening to that history Within this larger history, is there no nothing productive to be said about this relationship at all? And secondly, the this left and uh, the way it is, it then seamlessly becomes part of a new global order. This this particular left is also very interesting. So I'm, I'm afraid we chose that for questions now. So responses, Dipesh, if you want to go with uh, responses, last. Um, some sorry, uh, some specific questions. Uttu Partho, maybe Partho should go first and then. Yeah, okay. Go okay, okay, good. Partho, do you want to? Yeah, yes, there, there, are, there are at least. Uh, yeah, there were some questions. Okay. <laughs> yeah, no, there are. There were some. Partho. No, no, Tika, Tika, Tika. There were some. Uh, oh, question. Uh, uh, Tonika, uh, now it's it's clearly true as you as you said the financial collapse, the collapse of the banks, and so on, uh, that takes place in the late 1840s, uh, well after uh, Ramon's death. Uh, I think that was not so much the 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 critique. The critique was whether, in fact, it was ever uh, reasonable to have this faith in a kind of partnership. 
business partnership between European traders and, and Indian traders, uh, which, were, which was essentially derived from the American example. You see, and one of, one of the clear criticisms that were coming by the, uh, in the 1970s was whether something that could have happened in a settler, white settler colony, where of course, you know, the indigenous population was completely left out of it, if not totally eliminated, uh, could ever have been possible in a large agrarian country like India with a tiny uh, European uh, population uh, and, and, and millions of, of Indians. It was simply not feasible to think of. And yet that is precisely, the American example comes up again and again in, in Ramon as well as in Dalkana. Uh, Ramon in fact says, uh, his, his, uh, his testimony to the select committee that even if we were to think that this, this might have led to a revolt like in the United States, well, look at Canada. Uh, and if only the British were not despotic, uh, then India would be like Canada. So, uh, so that was precisely what was, what was being uh, attacked. Right? Uh, on the question of Mughal rule, by the way, Ramon was quite ambiguous in his uh, assessment of the Mughals. There are many places where Ramon, in fact, compares the British colonial situation, for instance, on the jury system and so on. Ramon actually says that uh, under Mughal rule, uh, uh, Hindus and Muslims actually enjoyed similar positions in government. And, and this kind of distinction, racial distinction, was never made. So, you know, the, 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 there are many, uh, he made similar. Uh, references in his, uh, when he basically argues in favor of the, of the Mughal emperor's uh, pension to be uh, increased. Uh, on the question of liberalism and what kind of liberalism, this is, this is precisely the Whig kind of liberalism of the late 18th, early 19th century. It's, it's the Whig liberalism which, uh, which argues essentially for an extension of the suffrage, but certainly not universal suffrage. Uh, uh, it's, it, it, it argues for free trade. Uh, it argues against slavery. Uh, that's, that's the kind of liberalism that, that uh, Ramon clearly endorsed. Uh, it's the liberalism that was then flowing through Europe in the 1830s revolution for instance, in France, which uh, Ramon was, was a great uh, admirer of that revolution. But that's the, that's the uh, liberalism. It was not the liberalism of the late 19th century, you know, you know, Victorian liberalism, that's not, that was, it was not imaginable in, in Ramon's time. Uh, on the question of, uh, of uh, this historical distance question, uh, and, and, and Najmul's, uh, you see, this, this, this longer trajectory of an intellectual history of modern India, beginning for Ramon, is something that only emerges as a kind of academic enterprise from the 1940s. You see, one of the earliest is Biman Bihari Mojumla, history of Indian political thought from Ram Mohan to Dayana. It almost lays down the ground, right? From Ram Mohan to Dayana, 19th century, as an intellectual history leading into that, right? And then, of course, you had the very influential uh, tract by Shushubal Sarkar, notes on the Bengal Renaissance, late 1940s. So again, those are the ones where this, this Ramon is claimed for the longer history of Indian modernity and Indian. And this is really what the 1970s historians were reacting against. Yeah. Can I come in on this, Vinkar? Yes, certainly. Yes, please. please so, just, yes. So, so, so the question I was trying to raise, and again, I raised it by I mean, clearly, you know, the, I was once reading the H. H. Wilson papers in, Engl in England, and there's a letter to written to uh, Wilson by a Hindu college student who had become a clerk in some godown in some warehouse, and he was writing this letter saying how the Hindu college was the best period of his life because it was so intellectually exciting, and. Ram Mohan's participation in the excitement of European thought has, of course, everything to do with the opening up of the new world. But, 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 but you see, but within the new world, while uh, 
the settler colonialism of the US type or uh, Canada or later, you know, Australia, New Zealand would have been an impossible project. It often seems to me that Ramuhun's, Ramuhun was also asking for a kind of a mestizo sort of modernization, that they would be mixing between Indians and Europeans. So they would bring this capital and skills, but they would also intermarry. And we should not forget that Sayyid Ahmed Khan had a similar desire. So, in, so it, it's very hard to know how much of this is coming from just at looking at the new world and how much of it's coming from an older understanding of how uh, race relations might, might develop. My point is not sorting that out. My point is I was having to asking what allows us today to see Ram Mohan in many more dimensions than the 70s arguments did. Because the 70s arguments were, and Partha is right to say that it moved away from biographical and laudatory accounts. But the 70s arguments were also saying that however interesting you might be biographically, however interesting you might be as a, as a human being, however many dimensions you might have to your personality, it didn't matter in the, in the face of uh, the industry, in the face of the colonial economy. But clearly the colonial economy didn't devastate all parts of the world in the same, in, of India even in the same way. Uh, but but somehow there was there was this idea that that the colonial economy itself was like a structure that limited the possibilities, the life possibilities of these people. Now again, I'm not asking whether it's good or bad, but but I'm 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 saying that it is that kind of framework that stopped us from seeing Ramahon as a historian might, as a person who lived in his own time. And to ask questions that Gautam was trying to put to us, which was trying to get inside the skin of Ramon Roy. And say, and ask, okay, so how, what was his theology? Why was he arguing with Waliwullah if he was? What was his understanding of Mughal rule? I mean, how does, why does he, in the same tense, describe European rule as foreign yoke and desire that kind of modernization? So I'm not, again, there's no one answer, but I'm, I'm saying that for a long time, the 19th century was once invested in, in a very positive manner from the 1940s on by the predominantly the Hindu Muslim middle-class intellectuals. So again, there was not much historical descent. It was, it was like we came later as our, as our ancestry, as our genealogy. The 1970s was about denouncing that, that kind of moving away from it, criticizing it, disowning that genealogy. And I'm, and I'm saying both were highly emotive moments. And in both of those historical distance had collapsed because we were not asking of a person born today now 2,250 years ago, what did it mean to be a Ramon, right? What, did, what was his own sense of life? What excited him? What did he, how did he see the world from his own point of view? Today we're asking those questions. And is it that sense I'm seeing historical distance is back and what has allowed the historical distance to come back, the sense of it come back and going back to Amit's question, is, is the, the partly the collapse of the earlier framework. And that has to do with globalization, with other kinds of crises we're going through. Uh, and, and sometimes you, you might even ask, even if I understood Ramon Roy in all his manifold dimensions, what does it amount to? You know, and that's how you have to hook up with other larger arguments to even make sense of that enterprise. All, all I'm saying is that something has freed us from the 1970s framework to see Ramon differently. It's that freeing up is what I'm saying is letting historical distance come in or historical distance has come in. We may not have let it come in, it has probably happened, happened to us. And it allows us to see Ramon Roy very differently from the way we would have seen Ramon Roy or Vida Shagur in the 1970s. So the question is the theology of toleration. Now, no, you know, one major book and researches on the theology of toleration is certainly recently discussed by Supriya Gandhi in his very nuanced book on Darshan. Majmaul Bahari or Samudra Sangam. The most famous book before Ramma circulating even underground. 
is discussing that how the translations is going on. It is based on the eclectic great translations of Kavindra of Parameshwar and his associates. Dara is writing upstairs. And the hierarchy of the religion going to an unified God. Every religion has its place and God has placed on the religion and every religion is going. Whether polystatic, theistic is to a samudra shangam, unified God. So every river should be protected. Every river should go unhindered because it will go to the ultimate united country. Not that every river is equal. Not that every river is fulfilled. It says, every, not that every river is ocean, but they're going to the ocean. That is one kind of toleration. There is a political toleration. You should know, you read Young is autobiography, and Shivaji is limitation. Just suppose this. Shibaji is related to Sokari, related to Aurangajip, and Jangish famous statement of state towers. Just a post. I will get Mughal Towers. But thought is Ramon, still I intriguing. Ramon is big thinker. He knows all this. For him, if you read the Arabic Dibaja, you know, the Tophad is written in two languages, Arabic and Hasan. The Bacha is in Arabic. And text is in Farsi. Arabic is the religious language. Nobody would accept you until and unless you read Arabic. No Islamic cosmopolis. Certain Paul would enter you unless and unless you read Arabic. He said, another debate, I'm not going into that. In the Arabic debacha, he made a point. First, he said, he's a Ramata man. Trust me, Ramata Shadu are Bahota Noditeto. Roaming all over things, he has discovered a natural disaster. There is unified, got it? Only the mustahid and local practice make the differences. If you think the unified, got it? And its expression. Unified got it in expression. Pure Ramon and Light. Sorry, cut cut. Even Chinta Munirati, different Guru, attack the corner. You tolerate them. You can't do and operate at a Shastra, Paji Kara. A theology on a Mustaidra of the Pan. Tara of Gudia. Tara is Kuran and Mudde Line. Kuran Kepaluka. This is another kind of very interesting move of theology of Tara. Very common idea that the other part that Tali only to do no habit for common night. Talking to common night, 
Rizika, shall we begin? Please, sir. Okay. Yeah, I told everybody that there is actually no tea break. Okay. But uh, we will bring that tea. Sorry. Right. Uh, we are already running late, and uh, therefore I own. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Well, we are already running late, and therefore I won't take much time in introducing the speaker of this session, Professor Muhammad Azam. He is a professor of Bengali language and literature in Dhaka University, uh, with a very wide range of interests that include literary criticism and theory, uh, the social and cultural history of 19th and 20th century Bengal, uh, colonization and decolonization of language, something extremely fascinating, several others, right? Uh, but some of his books will give you an idea of the kind of things that he's worked on so far. Uh, 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 yes, uh, some of his publications include Angla Bhashar Upanibeshayan O Rabindranath, Colonization of Bengali Language and Rabindranath, Bangla O Promito Bangla Shamachar, and particularly, I haven't read this book, I'm particularly interested in this, on Bengali and Standard Bengali, uh, Sanskritic Rajniti O Bangladesh, Cultural politics and Bangladesh, and there are several others. Kobi Okabe Shandani. He has a book on Humayun Ahmed, on the reading practices of Humayun Ahmed. So, give you an idea of the range of interests that Professor Azam has. Today, he has chosen to speak on uh, Ramahun Rai and uh, in Bengali Muslim memory and history an extremely interesting and somewhat neglected theme. So I don't take any further time, Professor Azim. So I, I think you put it to be, take this. Azam, I can't hear you. Azam, you're not audible on Zoom. <coughs> okay. Give us that control, sir. অনুমান করা যায় যে এটা খুব সমৃদ্ধ এলাকা নয় রামমোহন চর্চার ক্ষেত্রে বাঙালি মুসলমানের যে চর্চা তার কারণ আমার মনে হয় যে 
উনিশ শতকের কলকাতার যে ইতিহাস রেখা বা বিকাশ রেখা ইতিহাসে তার মধ্যে নিজের ইতিহাস হিসেবে বাঙালি মুসলমানের অন্তর্ভুক্ত হতে আসলে কিছু সমস্যা আছে কিছু সংকটের মুখামুখি হয় সে কারণ ভদ্রলোক শ্রেণীর যে উত্থান নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরিতে সেখানে আমরা জানি যে ব্যাপক মাত্রিক অপরায়ণ যে কোনো প্রসেসের মধ্যে যে অপরায়ণ ঘটে এখানেও তা ঘটেছিল এবং বাঙালি মুসলমান নিঃসন্দেহে সেই অপরের মধ্যেই পরিপূর্ণভাবে ছিল এটা তার জন্য একটা সংকট তৈরি করে পূর্ব বাংলা বিশেষত বাংলাদেশের যে মুসলিম সমাজ আর সেখানকার জন্য ভাবগত এবং স্থানগত আরেকটা দূরত্ব জনিত সংকট তৈরি হয় অপরিচয় জনিত সংকট তৈরি হয় ওই অপরিচয়ের মধ্যে থেকে এই যে নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরির মেন স্ট্রিম হিস্ট্রি এটাতে পার্টিসিপেট করা সব সময় তার জন্য খুব সহজ হয় না তবে সম্ভবত প্রকৃত সমস্যাটা তৈরি হয়েছে পরের ইতিহাসের মধ্যে আমরা জানি যে বাঙালি মুসলমানের যে ডেভেলপমেন্ট সেটার একটা সম্পূর্ণ ভিন্ন ট্রাজেক্টরি আছে এবং তার যে মধ্যবিত্তের বিকাশ তার যে পরবর্তী রাজনৈতিক কর্মকাণ্ড তার যে দেশ ভাগ এবং পরে স্বাধীন বাংলাদেশ ইত্যাদি যে বাস্তব অবস্থা সে অবস্থানের কারণে এই ইতিহাসের সঙ্গে একাত্ম হতে বাঙালি মুসলমানের নিশ্চয়ই বেশ জটিলতার মুখোমুখি হতে হয় কিন্তু এই বাস্তবতার সম্পূর্ণ বিপরীত একটা চিত্র আছে আমরা জানি যে বাংলাদেশে ষাটের দশকে একটা বাঙালি জাতীয়তাবাদী মুভমেন্ট হয়েছে এবং পঞ্চাশ এবং ষাটের দশকে এবং তার ফলে আমরা খুব পপুলারলি বলি যে বাংলাদেশ রাষ্ট্র আসলে তারই ফল ওই যে বাংলাদেশের জাতীয়তাবাদী মুভমেন্ট আন্দোলন তার মধ্যে একটা খুব গুরুত্বপূর্ণ প্রক্রিয়া ছিল উনিশ শতকের যে ইতিহাস বাঙালির যে ইতিহাস আধুনিকায়নের যে ইতিহাস এটাকে একাত্ম করে নেওয়া এটা একটা খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ পর্ব ছিল সেখানে রামমোহন যে খুব গুরুত্বপূর্ণ চরিত্র ছিলেন তা নয় আমরা জানি যে সেখানে রবীন্দ্রনাথ ছিলেন খুবই বড় চরিত্র একেবারে তার এভরি ডে যে কনস্ট্রাকশন অফ ন্যাশনালিস্ট থিমস অ্যান্ড রেটোরিক্স সেখানে রবীন্দ্রনাথ ছিলেন সবচেয়ে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ চরিত্র কিন্তু আমরা তো জানি যে এর সঙ্গে একটা বাঙালির ইতিহাসের প্রসঙ্গ যুক্ত আছে এবং একটা আধুনিকায়নের প্রসঙ্গ যুক্ত আছে এই দুটো খুব ওতপ্রোত ভাবে সম্পর্কিত ওই বাংলাদেশের যে বাঙালি জাতীয়তাবাদী স্ট্রাগল অ্যান্ড ন্যারেটিভস তো ওই যে একদিকে বাঙালিত্ব আধুনিক বাঙালি এবং আরেক দিকে তার যে আধুনিকতা এই যে এই এই দুটোতেই কিন্তু আবার রামমোহন খুব গুরুত্বপূর্ণ চরিত্র হয়ে ওঠেন তাহলে আমার বক্তব্যটা হলো যে অনলি থ্রু দিস প্রসিডিওর এই ন্যারেটিভস এর মধ্য দিয়ে আসলে বাঙালি মুসলমান অংশ তো রামমোহনের সঙ্গে সম্পৃক্ত হয়েছে এবং সেটা একদিকে আধুনিক আয়নের ন্যারেটিভস এর মধ্য দিয়ে আর একদিকে জাতীয়তাবাদী ন্যারেটিভস এর মধ্য দিয়ে তারপরও আমি বলবো যে যেটা মাইকেল মধুসূদন দত্তের ক্ষেত্রে পার্টলি ঘটেছে যেটা বঙ্কিমচন্দ্র চট্টোপাধ্যায়ের ক্ষেত্রে ঘটেছে আরেকটু ভালোভাবে এবং খানিকটা বিতর্ক সমেত এবং রবীন্দ্রনাথের ক্ষেত্রে ঘটেছে একেবারে বহুমাত্রিক ভাবে সেই প্রত্যক্ষতা চর্চার এবং মনোজগতের যে প্রত্যক্ষ সম্পর্ক সেটা আসলে রামমোহনের ক্ষেত্রে বাঙালি মুসলমানের সঙ্গে ঘটেনি এবং তার প্রকাশ আমরা বাঙালি মুসলমানের রামমোহন চর্চার মধ্যে দেখব আমরা দেখব যে এটা খুব বেশি পরিমাণ উল্লেখযোগ্য সামগ্রিকভাবে রামমোহন চর্চার ক্ষেত্রে যে খুব বেশি পরিমাণ উল্লেখযোগ্য সেরকম নয় এর মধ্যে একটা দারিদ্র আছে আমি দুই তিনটা বই সম্পর্কে মন্তব্য করব দুই তিনটা প্রবন্ধ সম্পর্কে মন্তব্য করব এবং লম্বা ন্যারেটিভস এর অংশ হিসেবে যেখানে রামমোহন এসেছেন এরকম দুই তিনটা লেখা সম্পর্কে মন্তব্য করব এবং সেগুলোর ধরন তার উপস্থাপনের ধরনটা এবং এঙ্গেজমেন্টের ধরনটা আমরা দেখার চেষ্টা করি রামমোহন রায়ের ধর্ম দর্শন নিয়ে দুই সালে রহমান হাবি প্রকাশ করেছেন রাজা রামমোহন রায় দর্শন ও ধর্মচিন্তা এই নামের একটি বই ছোট বই এই গ্রন্থে তিনি রামমোহন রায়কে মূলত একেশ্বরবাদী অধ্যাত্ম তত্ত্বের একজন তুখোর বিশ্লেষক হিসেবে উপস্থাপন করেছেন রামমোহনের প্রায় সবগুলো বাংলা বই সম্পর্কে এখানে কিছু ভাষ্য আছে এবং প্রতিটি ক্ষেত্রে তিনি যেটা করেছেন সেটা হলো রামমোহনের বইগুলো সম্পর্কে আলোচনা এবং তারপরে কোরআন 
কিংবা ইসলামিক অন্য যে টেক্সট লিডারি টেক্সট কিংবা সুফি টেক্সট এগুলোরও উল্লেখ করেছেন উল্লেখ করে এক ধরনের সমন্বয় কিংবা তুলনা করার চেষ্টা করেছেন ফলে এর ভঙ্গিটির মধ্যে একটা পুনরাবৃত্তিমূলকতা আছে তারপরও আমরা বলবো যে এই পাঠের মধ্যে একটা লেখকের দিক থেকে একটা ব্যক্তিত্ব প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয়েছে প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয়েছে এই অর্থে যে তিনি রচনাবলীর নিরিখে রামমোহনের মোটামুটি বাংলা রচনাবলীর নিরিখে তিনি রামমোহনকে একজন একেশ্বরবাদী ধর্মতাত্ত্বিক হিসেবে প্রতিষ্ঠা দিতে চেয়েছেন এবং শুধু টেক্সটের মধ্যে নয় তার ব্যক্তিগত জীবন চর্যা এবং আচরণ এটার মধ্যেও তিনি ওই একেশ্বরবাদকে সামনে আনতে চেয়েছেন এবং আলোচনাটা তিনি করেছেন প্রধানত তুলনামূলক ধর্মতত্ত্বের নিরিখে তিনি বেদান্ত ও ইসলাম এই ধরনের একটা তুলনা তিনি এই বইতে করেছেন এবং বেশিরভাগ ক্ষেত্রে রামমোহনের কথাবার্তার সঙ্গে ইসলামী টেক্সট গুলোর প্রায় আক্ষরিক মিল তিনি আবিষ্কার করেছেন তবে বই থেকে আমরা এটা বুঝতে পারি না যে রামমোহনের সঙ্গে ইসলামী ধর্মদত্তের যদি এত আক্ষরিক মিল থাকে তাহলে রামমোহনের লেটার চর্চা এবং লেটার লেখালেখিতে এই ইসলামী কোনো রেফারেন্স আসলে পাওয়া যায় না কেন এর কোনো ইঙ্গিত বা ব্যাখ্যা ইশারা তার এই বইয়ের মধ্যে নেই এই বইয়ের আরেকটা পৌর সীমাবদ্ধতা হলো যে তিনি দেখাতে চেয়েছেন যে রামমোহন বেসিক্যালি হিন্দু ধর্মকে একেশ্বরবাদী ধর্ম হিসেবে প্রতিষ্ঠা করার চেষ্টা করেছেন কিন্তু ওই কালের কোন বাস্তবতায় রামমোহন আসলে এই ধরনের একটা কাজে অগ্রসর হতে উৎসাহিত হয়েছিলেন তার কোনো চিহ্ন আসলে এই বইতে নেই তারপরও আমরা বলবো যে এই বইয়ের মধ্যে লেখকের একটা বিশেষ দৃষ্টিভঙ্গির প্রতিফলন আছে যদিও তার মধ্যে একটু বাড়াবাড়ি আছে চিন্তার আমরা পরে বলবো কি ধরনের বাড়াবাড়ি আমরুল ইসলাম দুটি গ্রন্থ প্রকাশ করেছেন একটির নাম আধুনিক বাঙালি রামমোহন রায় আরেকটির নাম রামমোহন রায় সমাজ ও সাহিত্য তবে দুইটা বইয়ের মধ্যে আসলে কন্টেন্টের দিক থেকে কোনো পার্থক্য নয় তিনি দুইটা বই কেন বের করলেন সেটা খুব পরিষ্কার নয় এবং এই রচনা এই যে কামরুল ইসলাম দুটো বই বের করেছেন এটা রামমোহন চর্চার এক ধরনের সচলতার প্রমাণ দেয় কিন্তু এর মধ্যে কোনো প্রকার তাৎপর্য কিংবা ব্যক্তিত্ব যোগ করে না তবে একটা জিনিস আছে রেটরিকের পরিমাণ তো বেশি এই ধরনের বই পুস্তকের মধ্যে যেটা খুব ডিফাইন নয় যেটা তার ক্যাটাগরি গুলো ডিফাইন করে বিশ্লেষণ অগ্রসর হয় না তার মধ্যে তো ফ্লাওয়ারি ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ অনেক বেশি থাকে এই বইয়ের মধ্যে একটা গুরুত্বপূর্ণ দৃষ্টিভঙ্গি হলো যে তিনি রামমোহনের বাঙালিত্ব নিয়ে খুবই সজাগ ছিলেন তিনি বলছেন যে এসেন্সিয়ালি বাঙালিত্ব বলে একটা ব্যাপার আছে এবং রামমোহনের কৃতিত্বের প্রধান কারণ হলো তিনি ওই বাঙালিত্ব নিজের মধ্যে আবিষ্কার করতে পেরেছেন অ্যান্ড দ্যাটস হাউ হি লেড বেসিক্যালি রেস্ট অফ দি ইন্ডিয়া এ ধরনের একটা কথা এর মধ্যে আছে এমনকি তিনি এটাকে টেনে শেখ মুজিব পর্যন্ত এনেছেন যে বঙ্গবন্ধু শেখ মুজিবুর রহমান এই ধরনের একটা ইয়া থেকে অনুপ্রেরণা থেকে তিনি বাঙালি জাতির জন্য একটি রাষ্ট্র তৈরি করতে পেরেছে প্রচুর দাবি রিপিটেডলি করা হয়েছে কিন্তু ব্যাপারগুলো কিভাবে ঘটেছে তার কোনো বিশ্লেষণ কিংবা তথ্য উপাত্ত ব্যবহৃত হয়নি আরেকটি থিস এর কথা বলছে এটা লিখেছেন এনামুল হক ঢাকা বিশ্ববিদ্যালয়ের দর্শন বিভাগে তিনি পিএইচডি করেছেন রামমোহন রায়ের ধর্মচিন্তা প্রেক্ষাপট সমাজ সংস্কার তো যা হয় তিনি ধর্মচিন্তা নিয়ে কথা বলবেন বলে কথা দিয়েছেন এবং সমাজ সংস্কারের প্রেক্ষাপটে কিন্তু আসলে এটা রামমোহনের সামগ্রিক জীবনাচার সম্পর্কে প্রচলিত কথাবার্তার একটা সংকলন মাত্র এবং খুবই প্রচলিত কথাবার্তা একত্র করে তিনি একটা ব্যাপারকে অবশ্য হাইলাইট করতে চেয়েছেন সেটা হলো রামমোহন বহু ধর্মের সমন্বয় করেছে এই পয়েন্টটাকে তিনি তিনি প্রধান করে তুলতে চেয়েছেন এবং একটা ইউনিভার্সাল রিলিজিয়ন রামমোহন তৈরি করেছেন এই দুটো পয়েন্ট তিনি মোটামুটি সামনে আনতে চেয়েছেন যদিও খুব সিস্টেম্যাটিক্যালি কিংবা এসেন্সিয়ালি এটা যে তিনি প্রডিউস করতে পেরেছেন তা নয় যাই হোক আমরা এখন কিছুক্ষণ হয়তো কাজের কথা বলতে পারবো কারণ রামমোহন রায় নিয়ে বাঙালি মুসলমানের তরফে অদ্যাবধি সবচেয়ে তাৎপর্যপূর্ণ ব্যক্তিত্ব সম্পন্ন আলোচনা করেছেন কাজী আব্দুল রুদ তার অনেকগুলো প্রবন্ধ আছে এবং বাংলার জাগরণ নামে তার যে খুব বিখ্যাত বই সেই বইও রামমোহন সম্পর্কে খুব লম্বা আলোচনা আছে আব্দুল রুদুদের প্রায় যে কোনো আলোচনার একটা গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বৈশিষ্ট্য হলো ওই সময় পর্যন্ত রামমোহন চর্চার যতগুলো স্কুল ছিল তিনি তার প্রত্যেকটার সঙ্গে এঙ্গেজ করেছেন এবং তারপরে তার নিজের অবস্থান সেই সাপেক্ষে 
খুব সুস্পষ্ট এবং চরিত্রবান নিজের অবস্থান তিনি বরাবর উপস্থাপন করেছেন রামমোহনের ব্যাপারে তার বিরাট আস্থা ছিল বিকশিত মানুষ হিসাবে একজন সাধক মানব হিসেবে সাধক কথাটা তিনি বারবার ব্যবহার করেছেন এবং সাধনা কথাটা ব্যবহার করেছেন এবং এই আস্থায় প্রথম থেকে শেষ পর্যন্ত কখনোই কোনো ব্যত্যয় দেখা যায় এটা মোটামুটি একই রকম ছিল তো রামমোহন রায় নামে একটা দীর্ঘ প্রবন্ধে যেটা ওই যে রামমোহনের যে শতবর্ষ অনুষ্ঠান হয়েছিল তার রেসপন্সে লেখা সেখানে তিনি রামমোহন মুসলিম সাধনা এটার একটা বিবরণ দিয়েছেন রামমোহন হিন্দু সাধনা রামমোহন খ্রিস্ট ধর্ম এরকম ভাগ করে তিনি আলোচনা করেছেন এবং তিনি মুসলিম সাধনার কথা যখন বলছেন তখন আসলে তিনি মোটামুটি এরকম বলেছেন যে অদুদের মূল ধর্মতাত্ত্বিক চিন্তা এমনকি মানবতাবাদী চিন্তা এমনকি উদারবাদী চিন্তা এগুলো মোটামুটি ইসলামী উৎস থেকেই রামমোহন পেয়েছেন অদুদ এই ধরনের সিদ্ধান্ত নিয়েছেন অন্য যারা বলেছেন তাদের থেকে তিনি আরো অগ্রসর হতে চেয়েছেন তিনি বলতে চেয়েছেন যে সুফি ঘরানার সাহিত্য যেটা নিয়ে আমাদের আগের সেশনে কথাবার্তা হয়েছে এটা অদুত বলছেন যে রামমোহনের ক্ষেত্রে এটা ছিল আনন্দের উৎস কিন্তু তার যে যুক্তি তর্কপূর্ণ অবস্থান যেটার জন্য তিনি এত বিখ্যাত ওটা তিনি বরং পেয়েছেন তিনি মোতাজিরাদের কাছ থেকে এই মোতাজিরাদের প্রসঙ্গটাকে আব্দুল অদুত খুবই সামনে আনতে চেয়েছেন হিন্দু শাস্ত্র নিয়েও আচ্ছা আরেকটা কথা তিনি দাবি করেছেন যে রামমোহনের সমকালে সারা মুসলিম দুনিয়ায় ইসলামী থিওলজি সম্পর্কে এরকম ক্রিটিক্যাল অবস্থান আছে এমন কোন ব্যক্তি আর দ্বিতীয়টি দেখা যায় এটা তার আরেকটা পজিশন একই রকম সিদ্ধান্ত তিনি হিন্দু ধর্ম সম্পর্কে নিচ্ছেন তিনি বলছেন যে বিশাল বিপুল এবং বহুস্তর যে হিন্দু শাস্ত্র এটাকে দারুণভাবে সামারাইজ করে রামমোহন এমন একটা অবস্থানে পৌঁছেছিলেন তার মতে তার পজিশন তো সেরকম লিবারেল ডিসকোর্স থেকে যে ভারতবর্ষীয় হিন্দু সমাজ আসলে সেটা গ্রহণ করার মতো অবস্থানে ছিল না এটা হলো আব্দুল অদুদের অবস্থান আব্দুল অদুদ খুবই জোর দিয়েছেন তুফাতের উপর নানান কারণে তিনি বলছেন যে তুফাতে তুফাত একটা পরিণত রচনা ওই সময় একটা খুবই জোরালো কথাবার্তা ছিল যে তুফাত অপরিণত মানুষের রচনা কিন্তু আব্দুল অদুদের রিজেক্ট করেছেন তিনি বলছেন তুফাত খুবই ম্যাচিওর এটা রচনা কারণ এই রচনার মধ্যেই কাজী আব্দুল অদুদের যে যুক্তিশীল অবস্থান যুক্তিবাদ রেশনালিস্ট যে পজিশন এটার পরিপূর্ণ ম্যানিফেস্টেশন আছে এটা হলো এক কথা আরেক দিকে ওই সময় যে একটা আলাপ চালু ছিল এবং পরেও যে তুফাতের যুগে রামমোহন রেশনালিস্ট ছিলেন এবং পরে তিনি শাস্ত্রাশ্রয়ী যুক্তিবাদী হয়েছেন এটাও আব্দুল অদুদ আসলে খারিজ করে দিয়েছেন তিনি বলছেন যে রামমোহন রায় আদ্যপান্ত আসলে রেশনালিস্ট স্কুলে ছিলেন তিনি প্রমাণ হিসেবে রামমোহনের লেটার ফেজে দুটো কাজের উদাহরণ ব্যবহার করেছেন একটা হলো আঠারোশো তেইশ সালের সেই বিখ্যাত চিঠি যেটা লর্ড ড্যাংহার্সকে লেখা হয়েছিল আর একটা হলো ব্রাহ্ম সমাজের যে ডিগ তিনি করেছিলেন ওটা তিনি যে এই দুটোর উদাহরণ দিয়ে তিনি দেখিয়েছেন যে এর মধ্যে আসলে শাস্ত্রের কোনো অবস্থান ছিল না ফলে দুফাতের সময়ের যে তার যে রেশনালিস্ট পজিশন সেটা শেষ পর্যন্ত আসলে অক্ষুণ্ণ ছিল এটা তার পজিশন আরেকটা প্রচলিত মত তিনি খারিজ করেছেন তিনি বলছেন যে তুহুপাতের যুগে রামমোহনের কোন যাকে বলে ভক্তি যোগ ছিল না এটাও ঠিক নয় তিনি বলছেন যে তুহুপাতে মনোযোগ দিয়ে পড়লে এর মধ্যে পরিষ্কার ভক্তি যোগ দেখা যাবে তবে সেটা অবতার কিংবা পয়গম্বরদের জন্য নয় এটা বেসিক্যালি সৃষ্টি বিশ্ববিধাতার জন্য তো ফলে তুহুপাতকে কেন্দ্র করে তিনি অনেকগুলো পজিশন নিয়েছেন যেটা আমরা রামমোহনের সামগ্রিক চর্চার মধ্যে এই পজিশন আসলে পরে কিংবা আগে এতটা জোরের সঙ্গে দেখি না কাজী আব্দুল অদুদের রামমোহন চর্চার আরেকটা অত্যন্ত লক্ষণীয় দিক হলো ব্যক্তি রামমোহন তার কাছে খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ এই জন্য রামমোহন সম্পর্কে যতগুলো নিন্দা সূচক কথাবার্তা ওই সময়টাতে ব্যাপকভাবে প্রচারিত হয়েছিল এটা কিন্তু শুধু নাইনটিন সেভেন্টিজে হয় নাই ওই সময়ও ব্যাপকভাবে ছিল কারণ ন্যাশনালিস্ট ডিসকোর্সে রামমোহনকে নানানভাবে আদারিং করা হয়েছে তার অ্যাংলিসাইজ পজিশনের জন্য এবং তার হিন্দু ধর্ম সংক্রান্ত অবস্থানের জন্য নানানভাবে চিহ্নিত করা হয়েছে কাজী আব্দুল অদুদ রামমোহনের সমালোচনার নিয়ে একটা প্রবন্ধ লিখেছেন এবং অন্য লেখায়ও তিনি এগুলোকে তিনি সামারাইজ করেছেন এবং প্রায় প্রত্যেকটারই 
জবাব দিয়েছেন যেমন তার রামমোহন সম্পর্কে যে বলা হয় যে রামমোহনের যে বিপুল অর্থ উপার্জন এটা পুরোপুরি যাকে সৎ উপায় বলতে পারি সেরকম ছিল না এরকম অভিযোগ করেছেন অনেকে ওই সময়টাতে এটা খুবই জোরালো হয়ে এসেছিল এবং কাজী আব্দুল আসলে এটা স্বীকার করেননি তিনি বলছেন যে এর কোনো খুব স্থলের কোনো প্রমাণ কেউ দেখাতে পারেনি এবং ওই যে একটা মুসলমান স্ত্রী এবং তার সন্তান সম্পর্কে যে অভিযোগগুলো সামনে এসেছিল কাজী আব্দুল উদুদ সেটাও বাতিল করেছেন ফলে যে ব্যক্তি রামমোহন এটা কাজী আব্দুল উদুদের কাছে খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ আমরা আব্দুল উদুদের ক্ষেত্রে দেখব যে রামমোহন তার কাছে এত বড় হয়ে দেখা দেওয়ার প্রধান কারণ হলো কাজী আব্দুল উদুদ নিজে ব্যাপারগুলোকে যেভাবে দেখতেন ধর্মকে দর্শনকে মানব কল্যাণকে সামাজিক উন্নতিকে প্রগতিকে এই ব্যাপারগুলো তিনি আসলে সলিডলি রামমোহন রায়ের মধ্যে পেয়েছেন যেমন ভট্টাচার্যের শহীদ বিচার এটা থেকে একটা দীর্ঘ উদ্ধৃতি রামমোহন দিচ্ছেন এবং দিয়ে তিনি সিদ্ধান্ত টানছেন খুব ইন্টারেস্টিং তিনি বলছেন যে এখানে ভট্টাচার্যের চোখে ধর্ম মূলত একটা বিধিবদ্ধ পদ্ধতির অনুসরণ অপরদিকে রামমোহনের কাছে প্রধান ব্যাপার হলো যে আচরণটা কিংবা ধর্মকর্ম একটা সৎ যুক্তিপূর্ণ ব্যাপার হচ্ছে কিনা সেটা এবং অনুষ্ঠাতা যিনি কাজটা করছেন তার আত্মিক সমন্বতির বন্দোবস্ত করতে পারছেন কিনা তা আমাদের জন্য এই সিদ্ধান্তটা অত্যন্ত গুরুত্বপূর্ণ এই জন্য যে আজি আব্দুল উদুদ নিজে ধর্ম সম্পর্কে যে অবস্থানটা সারা জীবন প্রচার করেছেন এবং মুসলমান সমাজের সংস্কারক হিসেবে কাজী আব্দুল উদুদের নিজের যে পজিশন এই পজিশনটা এক্সাক্টলি হুবহু এরকম তিনি আসলে এটাই সবসময় প্রচার করতে চেয়েছেন আমরা এরপরে এফ এম এফ সালাউদ্দিন আহমদের বই সম্পর্কে একটা মন্তব্য করতে পারি এটা উনিশশো পঁয়ষট্টি সালে লাগা একটা বই সোশ্যাল আইডিয়াজ অ্যান্ড সোশ্যাল চেঞ্জ ইন বেঙ্গল এইটিন এইটিন টু এইটিন থার্টি ফাইভ এবং রামমোহন এই বইয়ের একটা খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ চরিত্র সালাউদ্দিন আহমদ দেখিয়েছেন যে বিভিন্ন ধর্ম এবং বিশেষত ইউরোপীয় চিন্তায় খুব স্নাত হলেও রামমোহন আসলে হিন্দু রিলিজিয়নের যে ডোমেইন তার ভিতরে কাজ করতে চেয়েছেন এবং তিনি কখনো নতুন একটা ধর্ম তৈরি করতে চান নাই তিনি এর ভিতরে উপসম্প্রদায় হিসাবে আসলে তিনি ব্রাহ্ম সমাজকে প্রতিষ্ঠা করতে চেয়েছেন সালাউদ্দিন আহমদ তাকে উপস্থাপন করেছেন একজন প্রকৃত উদার নীতিবাদী হিসেবে এই ডিবেট তো রামমোহনকে নিয়ে আছে প্রথম থেকে এবং আজকেও হলো এবং আরো হবে আগামী দুই দিন এবং তিনিও ওই যে লর্ড এম হাস্টকে লেখা চিঠিকে প্রধান ভিত্তি হিসেবে ব্যবহার করেছেন রামমোহনের প্রায় যে কোনো ইঙ্গবাদী অ্যাংলিসাইজ যে পজিশন এটাকে তিনি উপস্থাপন করেছেন আহ আমরা বলবো অতি প্রগতিশীল একটা ব্যাপার হিসেবে এটা সালাউদ্দিন আহমেদের একটা পজিশন এবং তিনি সেকালের ভাব এবং কর্মজগৎকে প্রগতি এবং প্রতিক্রিয়ার বাইনারিতে দেখেছেন এবং রামমোহনের যে কোনো তৎপরতার যে প্রগতিশীল ভূমিকা এই ব্যাপারে সালাউদ্দিন আহমেদ কোনো সন্দেহ রাখেন মোহাম্মদ আব্দুল হাই এবং সৈয়দ আলী হাসান বাংলা সাহিত্যের ইতিবৃত্ত নাইনটিন ফিফটি সিক্স এই বইতে রামমোহনের গদ্য এবং সাহিত্য নিয়ে সংক্ষিপ্ত আলোচনা করেছেন ওয়াকিল আহমদ রামমোহন রায় একটি ব্যক্তিত্ব নামে একটি প্রবন্ধ এবং বাংলার রেনেসা নামে আরেকটি প্রবন্ধে রামমোহন সম্পর্কে আলোচনা করেছেন উনিশ শতকে খুবই গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বিশ্লেষক গোলাম মুর্শিদ তার অনেকগুলো বইতে যেমন হাজার বছরের বাঙালির ইতিহাস কালা পানির হাতছানি বিলাতে বাঙালির ইতিহাস কিংবা রেনেসেন্স বাংলা রেনেসেন্স ইত্যাদি অনেকগুলো বইতে রামমোহন সম্পর্কে মন্তব্য করেছেন আমি এগুলো খুব ডিটেল করছি না কারণ এগুলোতে খুব নতুন দৃষ্টিভঙ্গির প্রতিফলন নাই প্রচলিত ব্যাপারগুলোই তারা উপস্থাপন করেছে আমরা বরং তিনজনের উল্লেখ করব যারা রামমোহনের ব্যাপারে বেশ ক্রিটিক্যাল ছিলেন এমনকি বেশিরভাগ ক্ষেত্রে নেতিবাচক দৃষ্টিভঙ্গিতে রামমোহনকে মূল্যায়ন করেছেন এদের মধ্যে একজন হলেন অধ্যাপক আব্দুর রাজ্জাক নিজের লেখা নয় বইটা লিখেছেন আহ আহমদ সফা অধ্যাপক আব্দুর রাজ্জাকের সঙ্গের স্মৃতি এবং তার সঙ্গে কথোপকথনের স্মৃতি এটা একত্র করে আহমদ সফা লিখেছেন যদ্যপি আমার গুরু এটা ঢাকায় খুবই সেলিব্রেটেড বই এমনকি এখন আমার ধারণা নন ফিকশন হিসেবে সবচেয়ে বেশি পবিত বই গ্রুপস এই বইতে আব্দুর রাজ্জাক 
মানে সফা লিখছেন কিন্তু রাজ্জাকের জবানিতে লিখছেন আব্দুর রাজ্জাক বেসিক্যালি নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরির আধুনিক এবং রেনেসা এই দুই ধারণাকে বাতিল করে দিয়েছে তিনি বলছেন যে এসাস এইভাবে বলার মতো কিছু ঘটেনি তিনি বলছেন যে আমরা যদি নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরির কোনো ব্যাপারকে আসলে লম্বা মেয়াদে গুরুত্ব দিতে চাই তাহলে একমাত্র বাংলা ভাষার চর্চারকে গুরুত্ব দিতে পারি এবং বাংলা ভাষার চর্চার দিক থেকেই তিনি রামমোহনকে কেবল গুরুত্ব দিতে চান তিনি মনে করেন যে রামমোহন খুবই প্রতিভাবান লোক ছিলেন প্রচুর ভাষা জানতেন যে কোনো ভাষা লিখতে পারতেন কিন্তু ডানে বায়ে না থাকায় প্রফেসর রাজ্জাক ঢাকায় ভাষায় কথা বলতেন এবং ওই বইতেও সেটা ঢাকায় ভাষায় আছে ডানে বায়ে না থাকায় আই চুজ টু রাইট ইন বেঙ্গলি তিনি বলছেন যে এটা ছিল একটা বড় ব্যাপার কারণ এর মধ্য দিয়ে একটা বড় ধরনের পরিবর্তন সংগঠিত হয়েছে নানান দিক থেকে তাহলে ভারতবর্ষের আধুনিকতার জনক হিসেবে আব্দুর আহমদ সবার প্রশ্ন করছেন যে ভারতবর্ষের আধুনিকতার জনক হিসেবে এই যে তার যে ধর্মীয় সংস্কার বা একটা নতুন ধর্মের বা ধর্মের সম্পূর্ণ নতুন ব্যাখ্যার যে প্রস্তাব সেটার কি হবে রাজ্যা বলছেন এটাকে অত গুরুত্ব দেওয়ার কিছু নাই তার কারণ ভারতবর্ষে বা বাংলায় এই ধরনের ধর্ম সংস্কারমূলক কাজ আগে থেকে প্রচুর হয়ে আসছিল এবং রামমোহন রায় এটার আসলে শেষ ব্যক্তি ফলে এটাকে এত বড় ভাবে দেখার কিছু নাই এই হলো তার পজিশন আব্দুর রাজ্জাকের নামর সভা যৌথ পজিশন বদ্রুদ্দিন ওমর ঈশ্বরচন্দ্র বিদ্যাসাগরের উপর বই প্রচার করেছিলেন উনিশশো তিয়াত্তর সালে সালটি ঢাকার তুলনায় একটু অগ্রসর কারণ ওই সময় এই স্কুলটা কলকাতায়ও খুব বেশি বিকশিত হয় নাই ঢাকা তো নয় কিন্তু তিনিও নবজাগরণের ধারণাটিকে কার্যত বাতিল করে দিয়েছেন এবং নবজাগরণের প্রধান পুরুষ হিসেবে রামমোহন রায়ও তার বিবেচনায় খুব প্রাধান্য পায় নাই খুব মার্কসিস্ট যুক্তিগুলো তিনি ব্যবহার করেছেন যে এরা চিরস্থায়ী বন্দোবস্ত উদ্ভূত ভূমিস্বার্থের সঙ্গে সংশ্লিষ্ট মধ্যবিত্ত ফলে বাণিজ্যিক বুর্জুয়া কথাটিও তার মতে রামমোহনদের ক্ষেত্রে প্রযোজ্য নয় কিংবা তাদের আসলে সে অর্থে স্বাধীনতার কোনো আকাঙ্ক্ষা ছিল না আবেদন নিবেদনই তারা করেছেন এবং সবচেয়ে বড় কথা হলো তিনি বলছেন যে কোনো অর্থে লিবারেলও বলা যায় না কারণ তাদের অন্যদের দূরের কথা নিজ কমিউনিটির যারা একটু গরিব মানুষ আপনারা জানেন হয়তো যে বদ্রুদ্দিন ওমর একজন ক্লাসিক্যাল মার্কসিস ধরনের লেখক এবং অ্যাক্টিভিস্ট তো তিনি বলছেন যারা গরিব মানুষ তাদের ব্যাপারে আসলে এদের শ্রেণী হিসেবে কারোরই কোনো প্রস্তাব ছিল না সেদিক থেকে তিনি বলছেন যে খণ্ডিত মানবতাবাদের এক ধরনের চর্চা হয়েছিল ইবারিজমের তবে তার প্রতিনিধি হিসেবে আমরা ইয়াং বেঙ্গলকে নিতে পারি আমরা বিদ্যাসাগরকে নিতে পারি অক্ষয় কুমার দত্ত এবং হরিশ্চন্দ্র মুখোপাধ্যায়কে নিতে পারি এ তালিকায় তিনি রামমোহন রায়কে নিতে নারাজ এর কারণ কি তার একটা বিশিষ্ট পজিশন হলো তিনি মনে করেন যে রামমোহন রায়ের কর্মকাণ্ড ছিল সম্প্রদায় ভিত্তিক এবং তিনি মনে করেন এই সম্প্রদায় ভিত্তিক তৎপরতায় পত্র পল্লবে সুশোভিত হয়ে পরবর্তীকালে পরিণতি লাভ করেছিল সাম্প্রদায়িকতার তাৎপর্যপূর্ণ বই লিখেছেন উনিশশো বিরাশি সালে লিখেছিলেন উনিশশো তিরাশি সালে বই আকারে প্রকাশিত হয়েছে এটার নাম হলো উনিশ শতকে বাংলা গদ্যের সামাজিক ব্যাকরণ হতে পারে খুব সরাসরি রেফারেন্স নয় যে তিনি কালেকশন দিয়ে প্রভাবিত ছিলেন প্রদ্যুম্ন ভট্টাচার্যের ওখানে যেই গদ্যের উপর যে প্রবন্ধটা ছিল সেটার সঙ্গে বেশ ইন্টারনাল কানেকশন আছে তো এখানে সিরাজ ইসলাম চৌধুরী রামমোহন রায়ের কাজের এবং তৎপরতার যথেষ্ট পরিমাণ ইতিবাচকতা লক্ষ্য করেছেন কিন্তু তিনি খেয়াল করেছেন যে কলোনিয়াল বা অবস্থার মধ্যে কন্ডিশনের মধ্যে আসলে তার পক্ষে একদম স্বাধীনভাবে কাজ করা সম্ভব হয়নি যেমন তিনি বলছেন যে রামমোহন রায় যখন পলিটিক্যাল ফ্রিডাইজ গুলো লিখেছেন তখন তিনি ইংরেজিতে লিখেছেন ফলে ওই পরিস্থিতির একটা ভাষাগত ব্যাপার ছিল এবং তিনি সাধু গদ্যে লিখেছেন সংস্কৃতাইজ গদ্যে লিখেছেন এবং গদ্যকে জনবদ্ধ করার কোনো চেষ্টা করছেন না যেটা খুবই পপুলার রামমোহন চর্চার ক্ষেত্রে যে মার্টিন লুথারের সঙ্গে তুলনা করা যায় মার্টিন লুথার চেয়েছেন পপুলার জার্মানে তার বই লিখতে ফলে তার বইয়ের তিনশো সাতাত্তরটা 
সংস্করণ হয়েছিল একেবারে মার্টিন লুথারের জীবদ্দশায় কিন্তু রামমোহনের এই ধরনের কোন লক্ষ্য আমরা দেখি না ইত্যাদি ইত্যাদি আহ এই ধরনের ক্রিটিক করেছেন কিন্তু তারপরও রামমোহন বাংলা গদ্যের চর্চাকে সম্মানিত করেছেন এবং বাংলা গদ্যকে পাঠ্যপুস্তকের বাইরে বাইরে নিয়ে এসেছেন সিরাজ ইসলাম চৌধুরী তার স্বভাব সুলভ ভঙ্গিতে লিখছেন যে আম জনতার পরিসরে নেন নাই তবে আত্মীয় সবাই নিয়েছে এটা একটা বড় অগ্রগতি ছিল যাই হোক আমরা কিছু উদাহরণ দিলাম তো বাঙালি মুসলমানদের এই যে তত্ত্বতার একটা আউটলাইন আমরা এখানে উপস্থাপন করলাম তাকে দেখা যাবে যে সেটা খুব বৈচিত্র্যপূর্ণ নয় গুরুত্বপূর্ণ দিকের খুব একটা উদ্ভাসন ঘটেনি বড় ব্যতিক্রম কাজী আব্দুল অদুদ এবং এফ সালাউদ্দিন আহমদ কিছু নতুন তথ্য ব্যবহার করেছেন যদিও তিনি রামমোহন সম্পর্কে কোনো নতুন সিদ্ধান্তে পৌঁছান নাই আহমদ সাবার প্রযোজনায় আব্দুল রাজ্জাকের ক্ষেত্রে আমরা অনেকগুলো নতুন কথা দেখি কিন্তু সেগুলো সিস্টেম্যাটিক্যালি প্রডিউস নয় এবং বদ্রুদ্দিন অমর ও সিরাজ ইসলাম চৌধুরীর উপস্থাপনায় সেকালের সাপেক্ষে নতুনত্ব আছে আমি মনে করিয়ে দিই তাদের লেখা যথাক্রমে নাইনটিন সেভেন্টি থ্রি এবং তবে রামমোহনের সামগ্রিক চর্চায় এগুলো এ ধরনের দৃষ্টিভঙ্গি খুব বিরল নয় রামমোহনের এসব রামমোহন এসব চর্চায় মানে যেগুলোর কথা আমি বলেছি এবং যেগুলো বলি নাই বেশিরভাগ ক্ষেত্রে উপস্থাপিত হয়েছিল আসলে জাতীয়তাবাদী ন্যারেটিভস এর অংশ হিসাবে বঙ্গীয় রেনেসা এবং আধুনিকতার অংশ হিসাবে এবং আহ এদিক থেকে আমি আগেই বলেছি যে রবীন্দ্রনাথ কিংবা বঙ্কিমচন্দ্র কিংবা মাইকেল মধুসূদন দত্তের মতো রামমোহন খুব বেশি চর্চিত হয় নাই এবং আমার ধারণা যে কলকাতার ট্রেডিশনাল স্কুলগুলোর যে উৎপাদন সেটার নিষ্ক্রিয় ভোক্তা হিসাবে আসলে বাঙালি মুসলমানের বেশিরভাগ লেখক তাদের রামমোহন চর্চা করেছে ট্রেডিশনাল বললাম এই জন্য খুব খুব ইয়ে হওয়া দরকার আমাদের সাবধানতার সঙ্গে দেখা দরকার যে নাইনটিন সেভেন্টিজ এর পরে রামমোহন চর্চার যে নতুন নানান পর্বের মধ্য দিয়ে গেছে সেটা বাংলাদেশে বা বাঙালি মুসলমান জনগোষ্ঠীকে খুব বেশি প্রভাবিত করেছে এরকম আমি দেখিনি বর্গ হিসাবে আধুনিকায়ন এটা হলো রামমোহন রায় চর্চার বাঙালি মুসলমানের তরফে সবচেয়ে গুরুত্বপূর্ণ ব্যাপার এবং সেই জন্য এই আলোচনা সবসময় প্রগতি এবং প্রতিক্রিয়া এই ডাইকোটমিটা সবসময় বড় হয়ে থেকেছে ভিন্ন রকম মত আমরা যেমন পেয়েছি বদ্রদ্দিন ওমরের কাছ থেকে এবং তার উৎস একদম ক্লাসিক্যাল মার্কসিস্ট দৃষ্টিভঙ্গি এবং আমরা জানি যে কলকাতা চল্লিশের দশকে এই ধরনের দৃষ্টিভঙ্গির কিছু চর্চা হয়েছিল এবং তখন রবীন্দ্রনাথ নিয়ে এই বিষয়ে খুবই বিতর্ক হয়েছিল আর সেরকম একটা দৃষ্টিভঙ্গি থেকে বদ্রুদ্দিন ওমর আলোচনা করেছেন যদিও বদ্রুদ্দিন ওমর পরিষ্কার ভাবে উল্লেখ করছেন যে তিনি সরাসরি মার্কসবাদী পার্টির সঙ্গে যুক্ত এবং তার অ্যাক্টিভিজম তাকে এই ধরনের সিদ্ধান্তে উপনীত হতে বাধ্য করেছে বাঙালি মুসলমানের এই সামগ্রিক চর্চার মধ্যে একটা প্রধান বৈশিষ্ট্য হলো যে এখানে রামমোহনের মুসলমানি এবং ইসলামী উপাদানগুলোকে অতিরিক্ত প্রাধান্য দেওয়া হয়েছে প্রায় সব ধরনের লেখায় এমনকি ঘোষিতভাবে যারা সেকুলার কিংবা ধর্মের ব্যাপারে উদাসীন তাদের মধ্যেও এই প্রবণতা দেখা যায় যেমন গোলাম মুর্শিদ তিনি রামমোহনের মুসলমান পাচকের উল্লেখ করছেন কিন্তু তিনি উল্লেখ করেন নাই যে ওই কালে ইউরোপীয় এবং অভিজাতদের মধ্যে এটা খুবই কমন প্র্যাকটিস ছিল যেমন সালাউদ্দিন আহমদ মিরাতুল আকবরে রামমোহন রায় যে তুর্কি যুদ্ধে গ্রিসের স্বাধীনতা যুদ্ধে তুর্কি পক্ষকে সমর্থন করেছেন এটা নিয়ে লিখছেন এবং তিনি তুর্কি পক্ষকে সমর্থন করছেন আহ সালাউদ্দিন আহমদ বলছেন এটা তার আসলে এক ধরনের মুসলমানদের প্রতি পক্ষপাতের ফল যেমন সিরাজ ইসলাম চৌধুরী বাঙালির সংস্কৃতিতে নারী এখানে তিনি উল্লেখ করছেন যে পূর্বের মুসলিম আমলকে রামমোহন রায় সবসময় তমসার কাল মনে করতেন অন্য সবার মতো ডার্ক এস মনে করতেন মুসলমানি এবং ইসলামী উপাদানগুলোকে গুরুত্ব দিয়ে রামমোহন পাঠের এই ধারা অবশ্য চূড়ান্তভাবে প্রতিষ্ঠিত হয়ে গেছিল কাজী আব্দুল ওদের লেখালেখিতে কারণ কাজী আব্দুল ওদুদ এবং পরে রহমান হাবিবের যে বইয়ের কথা আমি বলেছিলাম সেখানে এখানে একেবারে রামমোহনের লেখা তার তাৎপর্য এবং কোরআন কিংবা হাদিস কিংবা হাফিজ কিংবা সাদি এদের লেখা এবং তার তাৎপর্য মিলিয়ে দেখানো হয়েছে যে দুইটা একেবারে আক্ষরিক অর্থে একইভাবে পড়া যেতে পারে আর কাজী আব্দুল ওদুদ মনে করেন যে রামমোহনের প্রধান যে বৈশিষ্ট্যগুলো তার যে ন্যাশনালিজম তার যে উদার মানবতা 
এবং তার যে অত্যন্ত গুরুত্বপূর্ণ বৈশিষ্ট্য বিশ্ব মানবের একত্ব এবং মৈত্রীর ভাবনা এই ব্যাপারগুলো কাজী আব্দুল হদুদ মনে করেন যে এগুলো তিনি আরবি এবং ফার্সি সোর্স থেকে তিনি প্রধানত পেয়েছেন মুশকিল হলো এই যে মুসলমান সংশ্লিষ্টতার কথা ব্যাপকভাবে উল্লেখিত হলেও রচনার মধ্যেও আমরা আসলে দেখি নাই এটা নিয়ে কেউ কনসার্ন যে তাহলে রামমোহনের যে কলকাতার কর্মময় জীবন এখানে আসলে ইসলাম এবং মুসলমান প্রসঙ্গ অ্যাবসেন্ট কেন এটা কাজী আব্দুল আফসোস করছেন যে আমরা রামমোহন রায়ের লেখাপত্র মুসলমান বা ইসলাম সম্পর্কে লেখাপত্র পাই নাই তিনি প্রচুর লেখার প্ল্যান করেছেন সেগুলো আমরা পাই নাই কিন্তু ওই যে পাই নাই তার যে সেটা যে আসলে একটা পরিস্থিতির কনসিকুয়েন্স যে তার চারপাশে যারা ছিল কিংবা তার ডিসাইবল যারা ছিল তারা যে এই ব্যাপারগুলো সংরক্ষণের বা চর্চার আর প্রয়োজন বোধ করছিল না কলকাতায় রামমোহন যখন গেছে তখন যে আসলে ওই চর্চার পরিস্থিতি কলকাতা থেকে দ্রুত অবস্থিত হচ্ছিল এই ব্যাপারগুলো আসলে কারো লেখালেখির মধ্যে নাই যেমন গোলাম মুর্শিদ বলছেন যে অজ্ঞাত কারণে ইসলাম প্রসঙ্গে তার কৌতূহল হ্রাস পেয়েছিল এবং তিনি হয়তো বলছেন যে হয়তো সম্ভবত তার চারপাশে ইসলামের কোনো জ্যান্ত অস্তিত্ব তিনি দেখতে পাচ্ছিলেন না কিন্তু আসলে এই কাজে একটা অ্যাংলিসাইজেশন কলোনাইজেশন প্রসেসের মধ্যে কলকাতায় এই ঘটনা রামমোহন রায়ের জীবদ্দশার শেষ অধ্যাংশে আসলে ব্যাপকভাবে ঘটছিল সেই আলাপ আমরা এখানে দেখি না এবং আমাদের এই যে আলাপগুলো এগুলোর মধ্যে বেশিরভাগই উপনিবেশায়ন প্রক্রিয়া সম্পর্কেও একেবারেই সচেতনতা দেখায় নাই অধিকাংশের লেখা পড়লেই বোঝা যায় না যে এটা একটা কলোনিয়াল পিরিয়ড ছিল এবং কেউ কেউ আসলে ইংরেজ শাসনের উল্লেখ করেছেন কলোনিয়াল পিরিয়ডের নয় যেটা একটা ইংরেজ শাসন ছিল মানে শাসক ইংরেজ ছিল এবং সেটাকে তারা ভালোভাবেই দেখেছেন মোটামুটি ইতিবাচক ভাবে কারণ এর মধ্যে প্রগ্রেসিভনেস এবং ওয়েস্টার্নাইজেশন মডার্নাইজেশন এই প্রসেসগুলো ঘটছে এগুলোই তাদের কাছে প্রধান ব্যাপার ছিল বলা যায় উনিশশো সত্তরের পর থেকে গত পঞ্চাশ বছরে রামমোহন চর্চা এবং কলোনিয়াল পিরিয়ড চর্চার যে নানান ধরনের ঢেউ আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি কলকাতা এবং পৃথিবীর বিভিন্ন অঞ্চলে অংশে সেটা বাঙালি মুসলমানের রামমোহন চর্চাকে প্রভাবিত করে নাই বললেই চলে কেবল ওই যে উনিশশো সালে প্রকাশিত সিরাজুল ইসলাম চৌধুরীর বইটিতে এটার খুবই আংশিক ইয়ে পাওয়া যায় একটা ছাপ পাওয়া যায় তাহলে আমরা বলবো যে বাঙালি মুসলমানের রামমোহন চর্চার পরিসর খুবই সীমিত একটা বই প্রকাশ করেছেন সম্পাদিত নব জাগরণের অগ্রদূত রামমোহন রায় এই নামে উনিশশো দুই হাজার উনিশ সালে বেরিয়েছে তো এই বইতে প্রায় তিরিশ জনের প্রবন্ধ আছে কিংবা বইয়ের অংশ আছে তার মধ্যে বাঙালি মুসলমানের রিপ্রেজেন্টেটিভ ওই একজনই কাজী আব্দুল হদুদ তো এতে বোঝা যায় যে এটার অবস্থা আসলে বেশি সুবিধার নয় এর কারণ কি আমি খুব সংক্ষেপে তিনটা কারণ উল্লেখ করছি এটা কারণ তো নির্ণয় করা খুব কঠিন কিছু আন্দাজ করা যেতে পারে আমার প্রথম আন্দাজ হলো যে বাঙালি মুসলমানের চর্চার ধরনটা যেটা হ্যাভেন টু বি আমি প্রফেসর সঙ্গে আলাপ করছিলাম যে ধরনটা অনেক বেশি সাহিত্য নির্ভর ফলে রবীন্দ্রনাথ কিংবা বঙ্কিমচন্দ্র এমনকি ঈশ্বরচন্দ্র বিদ্যাসাগর বাঙালি মুসলমানের ডিসকোর্সে যে পরিমাণ আজের রামমোহন রায় ঠিক সেরকম নন আর দ্বিতীয় ব্যাপারটা হলো যে ন্যাশনালিস্টিক যে কনস্ট্রাকশন সেই কনস্ট্রাকশনে রবীন্দ্রনাথ তো খুবই জীবিত চরিত্র ছিলেন একজন ঢাকার একজন খুব গুরুত্বপূর্ণ তাত্ত্বিক রবীন্দ্রনাথের এই পাঠকে পরিচয় করে দিয়েছেন বর্ণনা করেছেন রক্তের দাগ মুছে রবীন্দ্র পাঠ এই নামে এবং আমরা অনুমান করতে পারি যে এর মধ্য দিয়ে রবীন্দ্রনাথের যে প্রাত্যহিকায়ন এবং বাস্তবতার সঙ্গে যুক্ত হওয়ার ব্যাপারটা ঘটেছে রামমোহনের ক্ষেত্রে আসলে সেই ব্যাপারটা একেবারেই ঘটেনি আমি শেষ করছি এই বলে যে বাঙালি মুসলমানের স্মৃতিতে এবং চর্চায় রামমোহনের যে প্রতিষ্ঠা তাকে আমরা বলতে পারি মিথ ধর্মী এবং মোটে চর্চার প্রযত্নে প্রাত্যহিক হয়ে ওঠা প্রতিকৃতি নয় ধন্যবাদ আপনি সব Thank you, Professor Azam, for this wonderful presentation of, uh, mm. I suppose we'll have to speak to this rather than this mic, uh, presentation of the, of the reception of Ramon Rai in, in the Muslim uh, uh, imaginary, uh, as it were. 
I wouldn't go into any discussion now. I, I suppose that it's better that we take questions and let Professor Azam respond to that. He told me that he will take questions in English and if need be, he will respond in English. So feel free. <laughs> খুব সুন্দর খুব সমৃদ্ধ লাগলো আমার যেটা সব থেকে তাৎপর্যপূর্ণ লাগলো সেটা হচ্ছে বঙ্গীয় নবজাগরণকে কিভাবে মূলত ভাষার মধ্যে দিয়ে দেখা হচ্ছে মানে এর বিপরীতে অন্য কি সম্ভাবনা কিছু ছিল না মানে আমি ভাবছি ধরুন বাংলাদেশের ঐতিহাসিকেরা ধরুন তারি কুমার আলী ইত্যাদি অর্থনৈতিক ইতিহাসের মাধ্যমে ভদ্রলোক ইতিহাসের পুনর্মূল্যায়ন করছেন যে জুট ইতিহাস কৃষি ইতিহাসের ভিত্তি থেকে আমি ইদানিং কয়েকটা কালস্মিত আগাম্বেন ইত্যাদি রাজনৈতিক ধর্মতত্ত্ব পলিটিক্যাল থিওলজি নিরীক্ষেও বাংলাদেশে আলোচনা দেখেছি তো রামমোহনের মধ্যে তো অনেকই সেই সম্ভাবনা ছিল যে রাজনৈতিক ধর্মতত্ত্বই হোক কি অর্থনৈতিক ইতিহাস হোক কৃষি ইতিহাস হোক সেই ভাবে রামমোহনকে পুনর্মূল্যায়িত করা বিশেষত আমরা যদি ক্রিস্টফার বেলি বা অ্যান্ড্রু সার্টোরি এদের কাজ দেখি যে বিশ্ব পুজোর ইতিহাসে রামমোহনকে সেখানে দেখানো হচ্ছে তো সেই অন্য সম্ভাবনাগুলো কেন উদ্ভূত হচ্ছে না কেন বঙ্গীয় এবং আপনার কি বক্তব্য হবে যে ঊনবিংশ শতকে তথাকথিত বঙ্গীয় নবজাগরণকে এখনো মূলত ভাষার ইতিহাস ভাষা ভাষা ভিত্তিক জাতীয়তাবাদের ইতিহাসেই থেকে যাচ্ছে অন্যগুলো হচ্ছে না কেন সেটা নিয়ে যদি আপনি আর একটু বিস্তৃত কিছু আলোচনা করেন অসংখ্য ধন্যবাদ সুন্দর উপস্থাপনের জন্য আপনার কথা যেটা আমার মনে হচ্ছে আপনার সমালোচনায় এই যে আপনি বলছেন যে মুসলমানি বাঙালিয়ানার কতগুলো উপাদান আছে তার মধ্যে ওই রামমোহন সংক্রান্ত প্রেক্ষিতে বা আলোচনাতে যে ঔপনিবেশিকতার যে একটা প্রচ্ছন্ন একটা অস্তিত্ব আছে সেটা অস্বীকার করা হচ্ছে কিছু কিছুটা আপনার মনে হয় আপনার নিজের এই সমালোচনায় আপনার নিজের মূল্যায়নে এটার কি কারণ মানে আফটারঅল রবীন্দ্রনাথ তো সেই তারও তো তিনিও একজন জমিদার ছিলেন ইত্যাদি ইত্যাদি আমরা আমি রবীন্দ্রনাথের কথায় যাচ্ছি না আমি আর রামমোহনের কথাই ভাবছি যে সেটা কি এই অস্তিত্ব এই বাঙালিয়ানার বিরোধী এইভাবে ভাবতে গেলে যে ওই যে ঔপনিবেশিক যে লেগেসি আমরা বলতে পারি বা একটা একটা সুদূর প্রসারী একটা ইতিহাস ঐতিহাসিক পটভূমি যাতে এই সমস্ত ব্যক্তিত্ব উঠে আসছেন আর কি সেইভাবে ভাবতে গেলে আপনার নিজের কি মনে হয় আমার খুব কৌতূহল হচ্ছে ভাব ওকে অনেক ধন্যবাদ আপনাকে উপস্থাপনার জন্য তো আমি যে সূচক বিন্দুটা থেকে শুরু করতে চাই সেটা হচ্ছে আপনার উনিশ শতকের দ্বিতীয় ভাগ থেকে আমরা দেখতে পাচ্ছি যে খুব অল্প সংখ্যক হলেও বাঙালি মুসলমান কিছু পরিবার ব্রাহ্ম সমাজের অন্তর্ভুক্ত হচ্ছেন তারা যে ছোট ছোট ব্রাহ্ম কমিউনিটি গুলো গড়ে উঠছে গ্রামাঞ্চলে বা শহরাঞ্চলে তার অন্তর্ভুক্ত হয়ে থাকছেন এর একটা প্রভাব মানে দু চারটে বাংলা এর একটা স্মৃতি দু চারটে বাংলা উপন্যাসে রয়ে গেছে যেমন ধরুন সৈয়দ মুস্তাফা সিরাজের অলিক মানুষে পীর সাহেবের ছোট ছেলে ব্রাহ্ম হয়ে গেছিল আহ আবুল কালাম শামসুদ্দিনেরও একটা উপন্যাস আমার নাম মনে পড়ছে না কিন্তু ওতেও একটি মুসলমান থেকে ব্রাহ্ম হয়ে যাওয়া ছেলের উল্লেখ ছিল তো উনিশ শতকের শেষ পাদে যখন ইসলাম প্রচারকের মতো সমালোচনা যখন সমালোচনামূলক ধর্মীয় চর্চামূলক পত্রিকা বেরোচ্ছে তখন কিন্তু খ্রিস্টান মিশনারিদের সঙ্গে সঙ্গে ব্রাহ্ম সমাজেরও খুব মানে স্কেদিং ক্রিটিক করা হচ্ছে 
এবং সেখানে রামমোহনের সময় থেকে যে তজ্জমার মানে আপনি বিশেষ করে বাঙালি মুসলমানের আধুনিকতায় বাংলা ভাষার যে কেন্দ্রীয় স্থান সেটা উল্লেখ করলেন তো এখানে রামমোহন থেকে যে তর্জমার একটা নতুন ধারা শুরু হয়েছিল যেটা ব্রাহ্ম সমাজে ধরুন একটা পিনাকেলে পৌঁছলো গিরিশ চন্দ্র সেনের কোরআনের অনুবাদে এই কোরআনের যখন অনুবাদ হচ্ছে তখন কিন্তু মানে মৌলানা আকরাম খাঁ ইত্যাদিরা ব্রাহ্ম সমাজের যে একটা সমন্বয়বাদী স্ট্রেন ছিল যে ধরুন আহ ভাই গিরিশ চন্দ্র সেন মানে মানে থ্রু আউট কোরআনে আপনার আল্লাহকে ব্রহ্ম হিসেবে উল্লেখ করেছেন ঈশ্বর হিসেবে উল্লেখ করেছেন তো মৌলানা আকরাম খাঁ তো তার কোরআনে তর্জমাই শুরু করছেন এই ব্রাহ্ম তর্জমার প্র্যাকটিসটাকে ক্রিটিক করে হ্যাঁ এবং একাধিক আপনার এমনকি ফুটকুড়ার পীর সাহেবও ব্রাহ্ম সমাজকে ক্রিটিক করে উনিশ শতকের শেষের দিকে প্রচারণা করেছেন হ্যাঁ তো এইটা এইটা কিন্তু মানে আপনি যে আধুনিকতার কথা বললেন কাজী আব্দুল ওদুদ ইত্যাদিদের কিন্তু এবং বুদ্ধির মুক্তি আন্দোলনের অবশ্যই কারণ আবুল হুসেন ও রামমোহন রায়কে নিয়ে লিখেছেন কিন্তু আপনার এটাও একটা স্বতন্ত্র ধারা ছিল মানে সুন্নি ইসলামী থিওলজি চর্চার মধ্যে ব্রাহ্ম সমাজে ক্রিটিকটা কিন্তু খুব জরুরি হয়ে উঠেছিল উনিশ শতকের দ্বিতীয় ভাগ থেকে আপনাকে ধন্যবাদ আপনার বক্তৃতা শুনে ঋদ্ধ হলাম আমার দুটি প্রশ্ন এক আপনি কোন একজন ঐতিহাসিকের কথা বলছিলেন যিনি রেনেসাঁস নামক এই ফেনোমেনটাকে নস্বাদ করার পেছনে যুক্তি দিয়েছেন যে রামমোহন রায়ের যে যে মনন এবং কর্মকাণ্ড সেটা ছিল সম্প্রদায় ভিত্তিক যেটা পরবর্তীকালে সাম্প্রদায়িকতার জন্ম দেয় যদি আর একটু বিস্তারিত ভাবে ওটা ব্যাখ্যা করেন আর দ্বিতীয়ত এই রেনেসাঁসকে যে নস্বাদ করা হলো তার পেছনে কি এটা একটা কারণ হতে পারে যে রামমোহন যে সমাজ সংস্কার আন্দোলন আন্দোলনের উদ্বোধন করেছিলেন মানে এই সতীদাহ প্রথা নিবারণ আইনের মাধ্যমে তো সেই সমাজ সংস্কার আন্দোলনের অভিমুখটা ছিল পুরোটাই ওই মানে ওই উচ্চবর্গীয় হিন্দু মেয়েদের জীবনকে একটু সহনীয় করে তোলার উদ্দেশ্যে মানে মুসলিম উমেন বার just outside the purview of the social reform movement ebong sadharan bhabe mane ei renaissance byapar ta i was based on mane several levels of exclusion mane muslims were excluded mane renaissance ni jokhon porobortikale lekha hocche tokhono kintu oi muslim lekhok lekhikader kotha asche na jodi amra bhasha sahitter oporo jodi focus kori ha muslim writers mane মুসলিম উইমেন রাইটার্স তো একদমই নেই তো এবং অন্য ওই যে সমস্ত ব্যাপারটার মধ্যে যে কতগুলো মানে দলিতরাও মানে যারা লোয়ার কাস্ট তারাও এক্সক্লুডেড এই যে অনেকগুলো বর্জনের ওপর দাঁড়িয়ে আছে মানে এই ফেনোমেনটা মানে যখন ঘটেছে তখনও এবং তখন সেটা রিপ্রেজেন্টেড হচ্ছে তখনও কিন্তু উঠে আসছে না সেই কথাগুলো হ্যাঁ মানে যেটুকু অবদান ছিল মুসলিম ইতিহাসের অন্য কতগুলো চর্চার ব্যাপার থাকে সেদিক থেকেও হতে পারতো কিন্তু আমাদের ওখানে আবার জাতীয়তাবাদী ইতিহাসের চর্চাটা আবার জাতীয়তাবাদী ইতিহাসের নিরিখেই আসলে চর্চিত হয়েছে সবটাই মানে যেটা ঘটেছে সেটা হলো আমরা বলবো যে আমাদের যে ফিফটিজ এবং সিক্সটিজ এর ন্যাশনালিস্ট মুভমেন্ট এই মুভমেন্টের সঙ্গে মিলিয়ে আসলে পিছন দিকে দেখা হয়েছে মানে এটা দেখানো যাবে আপনি যে কাজগুলোর কথা বলছেন যে ওকে এটা একদম নিউ এর ঢাকায় ইফতেকার ইকবাল ধরা যাক এই কাজ করেছে বাবা মোর তারিখ চৌধুরী তা যারা 
কলকাতা কেন্দ্রিক যে পুরনো ন্যাশনালিস্ট কনস্ট্রাকশন কিংবা মডার্নাইজেশন এটসেট্রা বা বাঙালিত্ব এই ক্যাটাগরি এই ক্যাটাগরি গুলোকে পাশে রেখে অন্য কোন ধরনের ইতিহাসের সম্ভাবনা যাওয়া যায় কিনা সেই ধরনের কিছু চর্চা কেউ কেউ করেছে তো সেটাকে আমরা পুরোপুরি ঢাকার একাডেমিও বলতে পারি কিনা সন্দেহ আছে তারা প্রত্যেকে আসলে কাজ করেছে বাইরে ঢাকার লোকজন সেটা বলতে পারি এবং নিশ্চয়ই নিশ্চয়ই তাদের বেড়ে ওঠার মধ্যে ঢাকার যে পুরনো স্মৃতি শ্রুতি চর্চার ইতিহাস এসব তো আছে সেদিক থেকে সেটা বলা যাবে আপনি বলেছেন যে রামমোহন বাঙালিয়ানার বিরোধী এরকম তো ব্যাপারটা মানে আমার ধারণা যে এই ঘটনাটা আসলে ওই লিটারেচার সেন্ট্রিক একটা ব্যাপারের কারণে ঘটেছে কারণ আমাদের এখানে অন্য অনেকগুলো ব্যাপারের বাইরে চর্চাটা তো মানে একাডেমিক চর্চার খুব একটা জোরালো ভিত্তি না থাকার কারণেই হয়তো আমাদের এখানে ইন্টেলেকচুয়াল প্র্যাকটিসটা তো প্রধানত আউটসাইড দি একাডেমিয়া সেটা হয়েছে এবং এর সঙ্গে আমাদের যে ফিফটিজ এবং সিক্সটিজ এর ন্যাশনালিস্ট মুভমেন্ট এটা একদম অঙ্গাঙ্গি ভাবে যুক্ত আমার ধারণা এখানে কলকাতায় আপনারা ঢাকার ইন্টেলেকচুয়ালদের প্রায় কারোরই নাম জানবেন না যাদের ঢাকায় কোনো না কোনো ন্যাশনালিস্ট ন্যারেটিভস এর মধ্যে বড় কন্ট্রিবিউশন নেই মানে ওইটা ব্যাপারটা এইভাবেই কনস্ট্রাকটেড হয়েছে এর একটা কারণ হতে পারে যে নাইনটিন ফিফটি টু মানে কোর্স অফ টাইম এটা আসলে খুব সেন্ট্রাল পয়েন্ট হিসেবে আবির্ভূত হয়েছে এখন নাইনটিন ফিফটি টুর মধ্যে একটা অন্যরকম ব্যাপার ছিল ব্যাপার হলো যে ইট ওয়াজ ফাইটিং অ্যাগেন্স্ট এ ফর্ম অফ বেঙ্গলি ল্যাঙ্গুয়েজ জাস্ট মিক্সড উইথ অ্যারাবিক পার্সো অ্যারাবিক এলিমেন্টস হ্যাঁ এবং তার থেকে মুক্ত করে এটাকে পিউরিফাই করার একটা ব্যাপার ছিল তো পিউরিফাই করার একটা ব্যাপার যদি থেকে থাকে তাহলে সেটার জন্য যে প্রমিত বাংলা সেই প্রমিত বাংলাটা খুব জোরালো ভাবে চর্চার মধ্যে চলে এসছিল সেটা একই সঙ্গে লিটারেচার ইমোশন ন্যাশনালিস্ট রেটোরিক্স এটসেট্রা এবং একই সঙ্গে একটা ভাষার ফদ খোঁজা এই দুই দিক থেকেই আসলে এটা মাইকেল মধুসূদন দত্তের মানে ঈশ্বরচন্দ্র বিদ্যাসাগরের আগে যায় নাই মানে রবীন্দ্রনাথই ফুলফিল চাহিদাটা কিন্তু এটা ইয়ার আগে যায় নাই আমার ধারণা এই ক্ষেত্রে রামমোহন রায়ের সঙ্গে একটা বড় সংকট হলো যে রামমোহন রায়ের গদ্যের যে ভঙ্গি ছিল এটা তো আসলে পরবর্তীকালের পাঠ অভ্যাস যেটা সে অভ্যাসের সঙ্গে পুরোপুরি যায় ফলে যে রেগুলার রিডিং এটা স্কলারশিপ চর্চার মধ্য দিয়ে এটা সমাজের কারেন্ট চর্চার সঙ্গে একাত্ম হতে পারত কিন্তু যেহেতু স্কলারশিপ চর্চার মধ্য দিয়ে পুরো ব্যাপারটা ঘটে নাই ঘটেছে পপুলার চর্চার মধ্য দিয়ে ফলে রামমোহনের যে গদ্য পড়ার যে জটিলতা এর যে দুরূহতা এবং সেটা কাজ করছে আবার থিওরি নিয়ে ফিলোসফি নিয়ে থিওলজি নিয়ে হ্যাঁ ওই ব্যাপারগুলোর জটিলতা আসলে পুরো প্রসেসের মধ্যে বিশ তিরিশ বছর ধরে যে একটা প্রসেস চলছিল এই প্রসেসের মধ্যে রামমোহনকে একাত্ম হতে দেয় নাই একজাক্টলি দেয় নাই আমি মনে করি না যে ওই যে আপনি যে ব্যাপারগুলো উল্লেখ করলেন সেগুলো অন্তত কলকাতায় মানে ঢাকায় খুব একটা কাজ করেছে কারণ ঢাকায় কনস্ট্রাকশনটা আসলে কলকাতাকে অনুসরণ করেছে এবং ওল্ডার স্কুলকে নট পোস্ট নাইনটিন সেভেন্টিজ স্কুল ওল্ডার স্কুলকে অনুসরণ করেছে মুসলমানের ব্রাহ্ম হওয়া এবং তার যে ব্রাহ্মকে ক্রিটিক করতে বাধ্য হওয়া এটা আসলে এমন একটা ব্যাপার যেটার ব্যাপারে আমার বেশি পরিমাণ অভিজ্ঞতা নাই কিন্তু আমরা তো এটা তো জানি যে হিন্দু সমাজেও যেটা গোড়া এবং অনওয়ার্ড দেখা যায় বা আসলে এটা ঘটেছে আরো দশ বিশ বছর আগে যে ব্রাহ্ম ধর্মকে একটা খ্রিস্টানি চালা বলে বলার বা প্রকাশ করার একটা রেওয়াজ তৈরি হয়েছে এটা কিংবা এটা ধরা যাক উনিশশো বিশের দশকে নানান সময়ে এই ধরনের চর্চা অতিরিক্ত ইংরেজি আনা বলে নানান জায়গায় চর্চিত হয়েছে তো বাঙালি মুসলমানের তরফে আমার মনে হয় না বা আই এম নট মাচ মোর অ্যাওয়ার অফ ইট যে এটা কোনো প্রধান কনসার্ন ছিল বরং ওই যে খ্রিস্টিয়ানির সঙ্গে ব্রাহ্ম ধর্মের যে একাকারতা নানান প্রসঙ্গে ওইটাই আসলে কনসেপ্ট করেছে বলে মনে হয় আমি প্র্যাকটিক্যালি বাঙালি মুসলমানের চর্চার হিস্ট্রির মধ্যে এটাকে খুব বড় পয়েন্ট হিসেবে যেমন ধরা যাবে যে খ্রিস্টানদের সঙ্গে যে বিরোধ এটা একটা খুবই বড় হিস্ট্রিতে খুবই বড় পয়েন্ট এরকম খুব বড় পয়েন্ট হিসেবে দেখি নাই কিন্তু এটা তো আন্দাজ করা যায় যে আর্লি মডার্নাইজেশন পিরিয়ডে ব্রাহ্ম ধর্ম যেমন হিন্দু তরুণদের জন্য একটা দারুণ আশ্রয় ছিল ঠিক তেমনি লেট নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরিতে 
মুসলিম তরুণদের কারো কারো জন্য মডার্নাইজেশন প্রসেসের অংশ হিসেবে এটা আসলে একটা আশ্রয় হতে পারে এটা তো আছেই যেমন নাইনটিন সিক্সটি যে শহীদুল্লাহ রবীন্দ্রনাথ সম্পর্কে পরিচয় করে দিয়েছিল যে রবীন্দ্রনাথের বেসিক্যালি লেখালেখি এটা খুবই মরমিয়া এবং এটা ইসলামী সুপিজমের বাংলা অনুবাদ মার্ক ঠিক আছে এটা একটা প্রসিডিওর যার মধ্যে দিয়ে অ্যাকসেপ্টেন্স তৈরি হয় তো ব্রাহ্ম ধর্মকে একটা এরকম একটা স্টেজ হিসেবে কেউ কেউ আমার মনে হয় না যে সংখ্যায় খুবই বেশি কেউ কেউ নিয়েছে নিয়েছিল বলে আমার আন্দাজ এই বিষয়ে আমার খুব বিস্তারিত জানাশোনা নেই সম্প্রদায় এবং সাম্প্রদায়িকতা সম্পর্কে যিনি বললেন এটা বলেছেন বদ্রুদ্দিন উমর এটা কিন্তু তার খুবই স্ট্রং ক্লেম আমি সম্প্রতি বদ্রুদ্দিন উমর সম্পর্কে লিখতে গিয়ে বিশেষভাবে এই কথা উল্লেখ করেছে যে বদ্রুদ্দিন উমর বলছেন যে এখানে নাইনটিন আর্লি টোয়েন্টি সেঞ্চুরিতে সামগ্রিক চর্চার মধ্যে যে সাম্প্রদায়িকতা ছিল লেট নাইনটিন সেঞ্চুরি এবং আর্লি টোয়েন্টি সেঞ্চুরিতে হিন্দু সাম্প্রদায়িকতা ছিল সেটা ব্যাপকভাবে ইনফিল্ট্রেটেড হয়েছে সন্ত্রাসবাদী মুভমেন্টে অনুশীলন যুগান্তর দলে এবং তিনি আরো বলছেন এর পরের ধাপে এরাই বেসিক্যালি কমিউনিস্ট পার্টির প্রথম যখন ফর্ম হয় তখন এরাই যেহেতু কমিউনিস্ট পার্টির কর্তৃত্বের নেতৃত্বে ছিল ফলে কমিউনিস্ট পার্টির ফরমেশনের মধ্যেও ওই সাম্প্রদায়িকতার ব্যাপারটা রয়ে গেছে যেটা পরে বাংলাদেশের যে কমিউনিস্ট পার্টি এটাকেও ব্যাপকভাবে খারাপ ভাবে প্রভাবিত করেছে ফলে বদ্রুদ্দিন উমর এটা খুবই খুবই বড় ওয়াইডার এরিয়ার একটা দাবি এটা শুধু এই ক্ষেত্রে রামমোহনের ক্ষেত্রে পড়েছে তারা এটা এমনকি তার কমিউনিস্ট পার্টি সম্পর্কে রামমোহন রায় তার নিজের কমিউনিস্ট পার্টি আছে একটা এবং তিনি দীর্ঘদিন প্রায় পঞ্চাশ ষাট বছর ধরে একজন অ্যাক্টিভ পলিটিশিয়ান হিসেবে কাজ করেন ফলে তিনি ব্যাপারটাকে এইভাবে দেখেন আমি শুধু বলছি যে এটা শুধু রামমোহন কিংবা ওই কালের লোকদের সম্পর্কে না তিনি আরো অনেক কিছু ব্যাখ্যার জন্য এই সূত্রটা ব্যবহার করেন আর রেনেসাকে বাতিল করেছেন যারা তাদের মধ্যে আব্দুর রাজ্জাকের পজিশন আমি দেখি সবচেয়ে ইন্টারেস্টিং আমি সেটা এখানে এলাবোরেট করছি না এই সম্পর্কে আমি লম্বা লেখা লিখেছিলাম আব্দুর রাজ্জাকের পজিশনটা সবচেয়ে ইন্টারেস্টিং কিন্তু এটা একাডেমিকলি প্রবলেম আর বদ্রুদ্দিন উমর যে বাতিলের কথা বলেছেন এটা ফুললি ট্র্যাডিশনাল ক্লাসিক্যাল মার্কসিস্ট পজিশন থেকে এবং আমার ধারণা চল্লিশের দশকে কলকাতায় ওই যে এই ধরনের একটা স্কুল বিকশিত হয়েছিল এবং রবীন্দ্রনাথ নিয়ে তর্ক হয়েছিল বদ্রুদ্দিন উমরের নাইনটিন সেভেন্টি থ্রির পজিশন তার থেকে খুব বেশি আলাদা নয় এটা একেবারে ক্লাসিক্যাল মার্কসিস্ট পয়েন্ট অফ ভিউ থেকে মানে একটা ধারা যেটা চর্চিত হচ্ছিল সেটা আবার নাইনটিন সেভেন্টি ফাইভ এবং অনওয়ার্ড যে লেফট উইং ক্রিটিসিজম সেটা সেটার মতন কারণ সেখানে এজেন্সিকে ব্যক্তির এজেন্সিকে আসলে একেবারেই স্বীকার করা হয় নাই বদ্রুদ্দিন উমরের বিশ্লেষণ ফলে আমি বলবো যে এটার উৎস হিসেবে আমরা ক্লাসিক্যাল মার্কসিস্টের একটা ঘরানা একটা চর্চা বাংলা বঙ্গীয় ক্লাসিক্যাল মার্কসিস্ট একটা চর্চাকে সাব্যস্ত করতে পারি দেখ অশোক সেন যখন বিদ্যাসাগর নিয়ে বই লিখেন ছাপা হয় পঁচাত্তর নাগাদ লেখাটা হচ্ছে তাতে তো একজন মূল ইন্টালেকচুয়াল ছিলেন বদ্রুদ্দিন মানে তার মানে কাটলে ওই 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 মার্কসিজমটার সঙ্গে খানিকটা তর্ক করে এখানকার এই কলকাতার মার্কসিজমটা নিয়ে এস্টাবলিশ করতেছিলেন যে ফ্রেমওয়ার্কটা এটা জাস্ট মনে পড়ে গেল ওকে দেন দ্যাট ব্রিংস টু দি এন্ড অফ দিস সেশন এন্ড আই অ্যাসিউম দ্যাট উই ব্যাক ফর লাঞ্চ নাও উই আর সাপোজ টু বি ব্যাক এট 2:15 সো উই শুড কিপ দ্যাট ইন মাইন্ড Really? Okay. <laughs> All right, so I guess I can take my time now. <laughs> since, since you're a historian of the British Empire as well as a from Mora, I feel like you know, you're the right person to ask this question. So, I mean, the this kind of year leading up to the reform this one year was extremely you know, happening not just politically but also intellectually right because the main architects of the reform bill whether you look at russell or james mcintosh i mean the variety of arguments that were being basically proposed and the, the kind of the debate itself 
shows rep multiple representation. Mm -hmm. But the one that really picks up and becomes many ways the voice of the reform is the Macaulay argument, right? Which has been working out the Edinburgh Review through his fight with James Mill, et cetera, et cetera, long story. Um, and one argument in particular, which I think, you know, for many ways has been, I think, quite central to 19th century British liberalism, which is the idea that the English people has advanced more than the English institution. The government and the people are not, you know, on the same temporal plane. And this is precisely what necessitates <laughs> a complete kind of, you know, reform revolution of the of the kind of institution. It's been a masterstroke, of course, because once reform reached, uh, Macaulay's 1833 Government of India speech essentially reverses the argument. And if it, this argument has, you know, many more kind of uh, iterations later on, even John Stuart Mill himself would pick up, you know, in a qualified way. Uh, what I find really fascinating about Amora is this kind of letter he wrote right after the reform bill was passed, as well as the grants bill was passed, Jury bill, I think to Prashant Kumar Thakur, right? Mm -hmm. Where he says, actually, you know, like replicates the argument in a way that I have never seen him replicating. The fact that he said to not to rejoice too much with the kind of passing of Jury bill, because, you know, if basically the English people have the public opinion has expanded or you know, advanced a great deal. And this is precisely why they could demand those things. And Indians have not basically progressed that much. So they should wait and develop. Now, this is what I think the most telltale moment of this progressive liberal 19th century Ram Mohan. And I have not seen this prior to that moment, meaningfully articulated. So you know, I have long been curious partly what exactly, how exactly did Ram Mohan receive the kind of news of reform bill. Did he attend all the parliament hearings? To what, extent, what he was reading? I mean, did he attend basically- He went to the House of Lords. We also yeah. had a special seat in the yes. House of Commons. And so basically he, went, he attended most of all, all of them. Oh, yes. Great, yeah, Pretty much. interesting. Um, and, and basically, well, what more can you say? I mean, just curious to hear basically about but, Ramon I mean, Rai's kind of- like, I, I think I, I take your point that Ramon was also in some ways uh, making sure that people around him understood that he was happy, you know, about the, but you know, elsewhere he says, I'm forgetting where, where exactly, uh, I think in one of my books, I have a section on uh, you know, this, oh, the idea of sovereignty that Ram Mohan actually might have articulated. I mean, it's a much earlier work, 20 years ago, um, uh, in my book on distant sovereignty. But you know, the, he says somewhere that you know, it, it's very difficult to persuade Englishmen, English people, that you know, not every Indian thinks of the East Indian Company uh, as an old woman <laughs> you know, who sits somewhere and, you know, takes money from the peasants or some, you know, there's a, this sort of rather cynical sort of line and saying that, you know, what do you get, what do you have to do for the, for some people to at least recognize, to acknowledge that there's a possibility of, uh, now, but, but on the other hand, the English in Calcutta, certainly, Rosinka is right here. I mean, think of all the public spaces in which Indians made their presence felt. I mean, town hall debates and, I mean, they were debating this, I mean, it's, it's not as if, you know, people, <laughs> this word was not traveling back, that Calcutta had, you know, a vibrant uh, community of, of educated, you know, people who belong to school book societies and, you know, uh, ran newspapers and so on and so forth. So, um, you know, I think it, this tells us about sort of the, sort of um, uh, the veil, you know, that in some ways colonial empires have between, you know, uh, what gets represented and who gets represented and, uh, you know, what public opinion actually means. Or, I mean, and this question keeps haunting uh, and, and coming back. I mean, look at the first session of the Indian National Congress, like under Womish Bandit, benighted, uh, you know, and like whatever, you know, I mean, those kinds of things, or even a Gandhi soliciting that, you know, we must not oppose uh, the empire at the time of its crisis. I mean, you can take this much further, or even Naroji, you know, writing about un-British uh, rule or unchristian conduct, and so, but this is so much, so much earlier, uh, and 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 there's always a danger of reading back, you know, from Ram Mohan, which I think Parthas have warned us this morning that one has to sort of step back from trying to read too much into, you know, post hoc ergo propter hoc, uh, you know, logical fallacy of uh, you know, of going reading back into Ram Mohan's times. Um, Ram Mohan is time bound. Uh, but uh, Ram Mohan's times are very interesting. Uh, so we must you know, pay heed to that passage of time. And I'm just suggesting that that little window that we have from his activities in England at that time, prior to his death, is a very interesting time or uh, a snippet of time in which you can see certain things or at least try to glean certain things. Obviously, it also creates a persona. Had he not been to England, maybe we wouldn't have a portrait. I mean, think, you know, maybe. I don't know, but good. I mean, you know, this is a conversation, not necessarily a. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.
questions. Uh, we have round, we'd have time maybe for one or two brief questions, brief questions. Kapadidi? Uh, uh, I need to read up more about the portraits. Um, I'll, yeah. I'll confess I haven't done that. So, yeah, I'm sure this is a peripheral question, but it came up around the commissioning of the portrait. I forget who the artist is. It must be there in Mary Carpenter's yeah, book, yeah, right? Sir, yeah. Because it's that portrait which gets continuously repainted. That's the one Otul Bosch does. It goes into engravings and it finally makes its way into the most horrendous statues that yes. you have of Ram Mohan on the Maidan, huh? one of the, and which everybody went and garlanded on the 250th anniversary. I'm more interested in the death mask. Does Mary Carpenter's book tell you about the making of the death mask? Because that, you see, because Ram Mohan doesn't return and he's interred there, and later Darukanath has the grave built in, in Bristol, the death mask becomes well, apart from phrenology or anything, uh, the death mask becomes not just the likeness, but it's also about the trace that returns because it's taken directly from his face. It becomes the OST in some way. Yeah, it I mean. is. It's like mm -hmm. when you pass away, you uh, you keep a trace of the live, of the body in the in the image. And that returns as in is in the Ram Mohan library. So it's there like mm -hmm. a, it's I like have a, to go see it. I haven't yeah. seen and it. And then oh, the, okay, it used to be in the Ram Mohan library. Yeah, museum is a, is a copy. copy. Okay. Not the museum. I'm talking about the Ram Mohan library Oporetalai. It used to be there. I'm not, not the Ram Mohan Museum I know has a replica. I'm talking about Ram Mohan Library on the no, upper floor. There oh, was, is that a replica too? Maybe yeah, I think no. essentially it's it's the original is in a, so it, the vault of, vault of the Edinburgh Library. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is a cast no, that no, Shimla no, Sachi no, called. No, yeah. Okay. So this idea again of the original and the cast is itself interesting because the original is what touches the face, and every cast that is then made from it becomes like. That. It's almost like the Shroud of Turin. Yeah. <laughs> now, I wasn't aware that the original is in the... Uh, no, no, it's not. It's in the It's in the Edinburgh somewhere. That yeah. actually came came up when I was doing some research about okay. it. And there's a description of, brief description of how the, after his death, how the mask was taken. Yeah. So why didn't the original return? I mean, this was my question, that given the importance, I mean, of that, why did, why wasn't there a claim that the original death mask why should it be lying in a in a crypt somewhere mm -hmm. one and that of course shaito Parishad, it must be shaito Parishad is coming up what 70 years after ramohan's death almost that right in the 1890 so so is there a sense that the death mask is there or is a copy or if is another cast of the death mask traveling earlier so I'm interested yeah. also with the death mask. You know, that's the time Madame Tussauds is making her wax models using death masks. You know, she's actually the heads that are rolling out of as the early guillotine. As that? that was all happening. Yeah, yeah. Madame Tussauds goes back to the reign of French terror, Revolution. goes the, to the oh, French the Revolution reign of terror. Right. And then she moves to England, of course. From there, okay, yeah, okay. Much later. But so in a way, the death mask is a common practice. It's a common practice. It's like an effigy. No, you know, no, the I, effigy I, I, of I've a seen saint. the death mask of Beethoven and, and yeah, so on. Anyway, so, yeah, so yeah. just a small point. So I wanted to know more about no, it. No, I, other people don't yeah, I, so I just, just wondering, you want to take, let's yeah, yeah, let's take the question. Who yeah. should it go to? If Rahul wants to say something and then we'll have yeah, Claire something, something the and then we'll. Uh, so who should I pass it? I think Claire might know a few things about that. Yeah, yeah she may know more things. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So should I? Go ahead. Yeah. Let me just... yeah. No, just something, uh, you know, specific, just correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that his precise legal status, uh, you know, when he went to London, because he'd asked for permission to use that title, which was mm. not given. 
and then he goes and he actually says he's only going as a private citizen. Absolutely. So even though he's meeting with officials, board of control, corresponding everything, sitting in parliament, but is he ever recognized as the representative of the Mughal ruler formally? For, in London. For, in, insofar as the pension negotiations are yes. concerned. Yes. Yes. But what is it's a very I, I should have emphasized this, but all of the other access is is part of his political work, right? through these kinds of social interaction to the Unitarians and others. I mean, he gets to the highest, you know, corridors of power in London uh, with saving ease, without having any bona fide, you know, yeah. you know, position within the company establishment. He bypasses the company and then later has to go and sort of make, 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 and, uh, make you know, amends with them because, you know, he, he had to go to a dinner later too. But it, it <laughs> but, but it, it, it seems to me that, again, I mean, I, I think it's, a, I mean, I think it's a kind of a political genius at work, but, but that's my own admiration. Claire, do you want to just, uh, um, just let us know what you were, had you, uh, in, in your mind, but I'm going to take some notes. We might have something. Oh, <laughs> um, um, yes, the, the death mask was taken by John Estlin, who was a, a doctor. Right. Who, the Unitarian who became friends with Roy in um, Bristol. Um, it was um, at the instigation of his coom, I think the, the leading phrenologist up in, in Edinburgh. Um, quite a bit later, um, through um, Sophia Dobson Collett, the one who wrote the early right. biography of Roy, um, she was knew Mary Eslin, the daughter of John Eslin, the doctor, and right. um, talked to him about get her about getting the a mask. And I'm not sure if it was the original or a cup, probably uh, a copy of it that she had in her possession in Bristol, inherited from her father, getting that sent over to Kolkata to the people in the. Um, the um, Brahmo um, I think it was the Shudder and um, okay. The, okay. The, the and so that would have been in the 1860s or so, I believe. Um, but I've got some more information on that. I can look out for you if you're interested. Of course. Thank you so much. After that, last question. On, on yeah. this point. Not Shastri actually writes in his autobiography sir, of actually going, sorry of uh, when he went to England, he actually met Dr. Estlin, who was still alive. Who had treated him, yeah. Yes. And so Dr. Estlin actually handed over uh, of several things, uh, which uh, I, I remember this now. Back. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, and he said, yeah, yes, yes. A few things, yeah, yeah. Other things. Uh, and, and it seems, uh, Shinna Shastri writes that he handed over the mask to the Shaita Purushas, which has just been set up. Uh, and various other things were actually lost because Shridhar Shastri moved house several times, oh. uh, and he writes about this in 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 the autobiography. I, I will make sure that I, I have seen references to that also in other okay. places. Uh, I'll keep it short, very very, very short. Uh, Shudipta, thank you very much. Uh, you know the habitus that Ram Mohan Rai was coming of age. You know, there the uh, friendship uh, as an ethic, friendship mm -hmm. as a value was a very cultivated practice. Mm -hmm. It was textualized, it was institutionalized. And this ethic of, uh, this ethic of friendship, uh, Devanar Thakur says, uh, be becomes the key factor in moving Ram Mohan Rai's program of re religious reform, his social reforms, because people were joining the Brahmo Shabha not because they were believing in the Brahmo theology, but they loved him as a friend, right? So, and then Ramon Rai uh, travels to England. Hmm? So, uh, and this ethic of friendship is marked by uh, homosociability, which we see talked about in the Mizanama Nama texts, right? So, and then Ramon Rai travels from uh, Kolkata to London and uh, this, uh, him, he, uh, he makes friends both amongst men and women whom he respects a lot, who do a lot for him. So it is clearly a very different ethic and a value of friendship that comes to play, yeah. that comes to characterize his relationships in England, right? Yeah. He, he makes a lot of female friends as well. 
So uh, how do you see this, you know, this passage of this ethic, the passage of this value that characterized Ram Mohan's? Uh, well, there are at least two stories here. One is like the friendships that he cultivated. I mean, going to um, botanical garden with Devendranath, Esho brother, Luchi, 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 Luchi. and don't complain about your, your financial, that kind of friendship they had. And then of course the songs and the, you know, stories and things. But then the stories that we are, are told of Ramon, like receiving from morning till night, you know, constant you know, broughams and landos arriving at the door. And ultimately he actually, actually has to sort of, sort of tell them to, you know, give him some respite. And both Carpenter and Colette talks about how his health actually was affected by the, this kind of activity. Although, you know, we don't know whether that's true or not, but that idea that he was constantly uh, surrounded and swarmed by people uh, it, it's, I mean, what the, I mean, apart from the social conventions of celebrity fandom, fandom in England, I mean, these were English people coming to give darshan. I mean, I, that's the way I sort of think about this as well. Uh, maybe that's not a, an appropriate word in English context, but. <laughs> but you know, I'm thinking, um, yeah, Ashutosh Mahesh has been talking about the innovator. If it is at all useful to compare uh, Ramohan's kind of what what Rajoshi, I think, very rightly was talking about, you know, sort of particular ethic of of friendship, uh, you know, which has its own codes and which is also undergoing transformation at the time, and compare it with somebody like say Rango Bapuji, you know, who is Raja Pratap Singh's emissary, who goes also to England to fight the Raja's case later, about a decade later, uh, in the 1830s. And he actually stays there for a considerable uh, length of time, I think till like the late 1840s or something. But he comes back and, and becomes one of the, the, the people who uh, organizes arms as part of the 1857 uh, rebellion, you know? So his trajectory is quite different, but he, so it would be useful, I think, also to, to compare with not somebody like Dean Muhammad, who I think has a very different trajectory, but somebody like Bapuji, who is, is from the same political milieu as such, goes for similar uh, purposes, you know, to kind of play, uh, place his case or his master's case in front of the, the company and has very different experiences. But there is also a plaque that commemorates Rango Bapuji, 22 of his English friends you know, sort of uh, uh, commemorate him uh, over there and then comes back and then he vanishes. I mean, there's a lot of stories about whether he went, was shipped off to, to the Caribbean or somewhere or and so on. So it's kind of, you know, there's a sort of legend around him. That memory is quite different. But I think maybe, you know, it might be useful to... to... No, I think I'm definitely... Is there a portrait that was uh, commissioned and at some point? I have to check yeah. on that. I was just... I, I didn't want to, uh, you know, uh, you know... Uh, this is not casually drop in Din Mah. I was just thinking about from the other side, you know, the way Din Muhammad negotiated his own sort of exoticism to make money. You know, I was just thinking about that as well. Like there's a kind of transactional idea at this. I'm not saying <laughs> that Ramon was of the same, but it's it's the 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 gaze through. I mean, I hate to work here. The 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 way a, a figure like that might be viewed, especially of people who have never set set their sights on you know anybody like that. And these are not the people, remember, these are not the East India Company. They, are already, they have their own stereotypes already all set in certain ways. Right. These are people who have never seen Indians or the king of Inji or whatever. So I was thinking about that. But I will definitely take a look as well. Okay, I think I I, there are many, many questions, but we are already about yeah. half an hour late. So why don't we carry the last questions into the tea session yes. and so we can come back for the final uh, paper which Nazmul is, is going to, to give. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you everybody. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the questions and comments. Much appreciated. Okay, uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for. Okay. Sorry, I'll start again. Good evening, everyone. Am I audible? No?
I hope I'm audible now. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining after tea. We are running a little late, so we'll start without much ado. Uh, up next, we have uh, Nazmul Sultan. He works on the history of political conceptions, the empire and anti-colonial thought, popular sovereignty, and modern configurations of the idea of the global. He specifically focuses on popular sovereignty in modern Indian political thought, and thereby the idea of democracy in colonial India and anti-colonial democratic thought. Nazmul is George Kingsley Roth Research Fellow at Cambridge Christ's College. Uh, he's going to soon be joining the University of British Columbia Department of Political Science uh, in 2022. Sorry. I know, I'll just, yeah. <laughs> Today's paper is titled Before Self-Government, Ram Mohan Roy and the Question of Indian Liberalism. As we know, we have 30 minutes for the talk. And yeah, I'll just, yeah. after 10 minutes, I'll explain. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Shukanda. Um, can everyone hear me? Okay. So, um, yeah, I should say, doubt said that I'm um, I'm badly jet lagged, so hopefully I won't lose the thread of my uh, argument in the middle. But um, uh, so, as you know, so the title of the paper is Before Self Comment, Ramon Rai, and the Question of Indian Liberalism. Um, so, it is, it, is, it is a small part of my uh, larger book project on um, the idea of democracy in India. So, it is kind of a truism of Indian intellectual history that Ramon Rai was the first uh, liberal of uh, modern India. His commitment, commitments to ostensibly liberal principles, such as the freedom of the press, historical progress, civil and civil rights, I mean, stand as the self-evident proof for this claim. And liberalism is one of the emptier categories of modern political thought, especially since the Cold War reinvention of the category. There is usually nothing much at stake on debates around the correct definition of liberalism. But perhaps in this case, a lot, lot hinges on whether we approach Ramon as a liberal thinker or not. If you take Ram Mohan as the first Indian liberal or the father of modern Indian liberalism, um, we perhaps misframe not only his own political ideas, but also the periodization of 19th century Indian intellectual history. So this truism that Ram Mohan was India's first liberal, it, it rests on three um, kind of assumptions. First, that he believed in gradual progress and, uh, and the idea of improvement underwrote his political uh, projects. Secondly, that he conceived his own political action in light of certain historical backwardness attributed to India, which then supposedly helps explain some of his dubious agendas, such as the support for colonization of India or his defense of the location of legislative authority uh, in, in the metropolis. Thirdly, that he was part of an early 19th century global liberal movement when certain ideas of constitutional liberalism um, are taking shape. So, I mean, of course, then there is like, I think a very, uh, broad descriptive level claim that because that's because of his normative commitments to something like the freedom of the press that makes him a liberal, you know, um, not committing to all these three, you know, uh, main assumptions that I outlined. So that's actually, I think is a part, quite a weak claim. It doesn't really mean much. So I'm not going to talk so much about that broad characterization, but rather about characterizations of Ramorai that uh, rely on these uh, three kind of assumptions. It is however not always the norm to identify Ramohan as a liberal thinker. In fact, uh, I would venture to say that it was quite rare in the 19th century. As far as I can tell, the, the liberal interpretation of Ram Mohan Rai started from the interwar era. So, so Bhiman Bahir Mojumdar's classic 1934 history of Indian social and political ideas, uh, quite perceptibly avoided, uh, and, you know, I was a liberal interpretation of uh, Ram Mohan Rai. He does note once, the liberalism question only once, in reference to the uh, 1832 uh, uh, reform bill movement, and perhaps uh, kind of problematically without underscoring um, uh, the, the distinct kind of route to which um, um, Ramon arrived there. But still, this Bhiman uh, Bahir Mojumdar more or less avoids the liberal framing. Um, so first book that I think kind of like really goes close to uh, doing that is um, Mogan Lal Book's uh, 1938, The Rise and Growth of Indian Liberalism, based on his University of London dissertation. So this book was self-consciously presented as a history for the flailing liberal federation of India. Invariably, the distinction between Indian liberals and their political opponents was drawn in terms of temporal markers. 
passion versus impatient, forward, look, forward looking versus past looking, and so on. The search for the prehistory of, uh, the, of the liberals, of the moderates, would lead a uh, book to enlist Ramohan Rai as the beginning point of the march of progress in India. So this idea, though, it, it gave us a taste of the future. Um, so Ramos rebirth as the apostle of uh, liberalism was with, yet to be fully uh, set in motion. A few years later, B. and I published a history of liberalism, which also started with Ramon, whom he presented as a moderate thinker, a proponent of regulated liberty. Nye Carver acknowledged that Ramon at best was a precursor of liberalism proper. As he wrote, and I quote him, before the dawn of liberalism in Europe before, and before its rise in the mid-Victorian mid period of uh, English history. Such qualifications not, notwithstanding, there was no meaningful barrier to the conscription of Ramohan in the liberal canon in the Cold War era. It is an unnecessary text in defense of liberalism. Camp Anikka would straightforwardly identify Ramohan as the father of liberalism in India, citing his support for equality and individual rights. So the, the, the 1970s debate on uh, Bengal Renaissance um, um, about which we uh, kind of had a lot this morning. Yes, so there were, this debate, the people who participated in this was also not particularly, principally concerned with Ramon Rai's liberalism. But it showed up, uh, I guess, more indirectly than directly, the image of uh, the liberal Ramon Rai. It is worth remembering, of course, that the debate was taking place against the backdrop of this uh, Cold War uh, debate on liberalism um, as a political category. So, for example, this uh, 1975 volume that we all discussed. Um, so, in that volume, uh, Borunde observed that Ramohan Rai created the 19th century tradition of Indian liberalism by linking the lineage of parliamentary reform with social reform. Shukshan, from a, from a political economic political economic perspective, also identified a certain free trade liberalism. The idea that free trade or um, commitment to rights um, amounts to a liberal political philosophy. So this is very much a 20th century uh, idea. Still, the main focus of this essay was the asymmetrical relationship and tension between the economic and the ideational. The liberal gloss on Ramohan was often a passing note in a broader set, set of debate on a Renaissance. So the persistence of the um, liberal inter interpretation of Ramohan Rai in our time, I think, owes a lot um, uh, to this uh, scholarship from this century. Right? So historians as different as uh, Chris Bailey and Andrew Sartori fervently argued for a liberal framing of uh, Ramohan Rai's political thought. I mean, they make the argument both contextually as well as, I guess, more substantive. Um, so Bailey um, uh, locates Ramohan in an early 19th century European, um, um, I guess, of the Iberian context of constitutional liberalism. His uh, Kolkata dinner celebrating the Iberian constitution, um, constitutional revolutions, as well as the purported dedication of the 1812 uh, Cadiz constitution to Ramohan are two of the main evidence Bailey peasants for an alternative historicization of Ramohan. So I've learned from a photo in Professor Tiraj's uh, Black Hole of Empire, uh, which I think that he consulted the original copy of the constitution uh, in Kolkata. And in fact, it was not really dedicated to Ramon, just specifically bound for him by a Spanish free trading uh, company. So there's another major problem with this contextualization. The reception of Iberian uh, liberalism in 18th uh, British Imperial world was anything but a stable framing, uh, anything but a kind of um, um, but, but, but a stable framing such as constitutional liberalism. It is widely seen as a Jacobin offshoot, and as um, you know, in, in England specifically. And um, I mean, as conceptual historians of liberalism have noted, it was quite common to distinguish uh, Spanish uh, liberalists from the then commonplace understanding of liberal as an, an adjective in, in England, referring to a set of virtues related to enlightenment, enlightened generosity. Bailey attributes both ancient constitutionalism and Scottish statism to uh, uh, Ramon, including its James Millian kind of, uh, um, I mean, uh, kind of uh, straight. So, um, so these are two of the antitheticals uh, tradition of late 18th and early 19th century British political thought. So uh, anyway, I guess, um, I, I mean, as we, shall, uh, see, as we shall see soon, I mean, Ramon had nothing much to do with, uh, specifically with the, um, this James Millian tradition um, of uh, stagism. Um, and the ancient constitution, constitutionalism question, I wouldn't address it much, but I think again, it's also not a straightforward story. So less contextually motivated than Bailey, uh, so Sartori's reading of um, uh, 19th century Bengali history is heavy, also heavily invested in affirming the liberal worldview of um, Ram Mohan. How do they establish it? 
Sartre tells us that Ramon's critique of priestly cunning uh, is, is, is a reproduction of a classic trope, I quote him, of British liberalism. He's supposedly also a sincere liberal imperialist because of his purported faith in the, pro in progress, the progressivist view of history. In fact, in seeking to turn upside down uh, the usual narratives of 19th century Bengali history, Sartre finds Ramohan uh, to be the epitome of a precocious 19th century liberalism, unta untainted by the indigenous nationalism of his successors. So, so there is some kind of truth in this kind of broad, broad kind of uh, range of arguments that I just kind of summarized. I guess, uh, let me just be a bit uh, sacrilegious and argue that all three assumptions underlying the epithet father of Indian liberalism are substantively mistaken, or to the very least, kind of superimposed. But the superimposition, superimposition itself is a fascinating story, so I don't mean to dismiss this misreading mystery, mystery as uninteresting. Um, let's start with the question of improvement. As many of you uh, would know, Ramon wrote a famous letter, I uh, remember correctly, to his friend uh, James Silk Buckingham one afternoon in 1821 uh, to cancel a dinner appointment. The reason was that the Raja, <laughs> that he was a, 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 the, reason, the reason was that he was quite uh, melancholy following the reception of the news that the Neapolitan constitutional government had been overthrown. He said, Ramon said, I quote him, I am ob ob obliged to conclude that I shall not live to see liberty universally restored to the nations of Europe and Asiatic nations especially those that are European colonies. I consider the cause of the Neapolitans as my own and the enemies as ours. So there are many things one could uh, say about this, but this for me is the most kind of important one uh, that the Ramon experienced at this point, not temporal lag between the liberty of the Neapolitans and his own. So much has been made of Ramon's celebrated England tour uh, that lasted from 1831 to 1833, and rightly so. I mean, as you just heard in the previous panel, that uh, it was, uh, um, although the final few years of his, two years of his life, in many ways, actually were quite uh, important and, and in certain ways transformative. Um, so, but the two, the two moments I find are really fascinating from the tour. One of them is the opening bit of his testimony in front of the uh, Select Committee of the House of Commons. So, one of, of these testimonies, he was asked pointedly about the conditions of the Indian people, physical, material, and moral. While his response to the queries relating to the physical conditions of the people focused primarily on climate and diet, he found it rather difficult to answer, question, answer the question concerning the moral conditions of the people, yeah, the Indian people. He first noted that in European opinions about native peoples, both favorable and unfavorable, unfavorable were based on faulty generalizations, resulting in a monolithic view of the, of the native population. So in contrast, Ram Mohan decided to answer the question by dividing the broad category of the native people into different classes, like villagers, city dwellers, professional classes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so, um, so I'm gonna skip, I guess, to this part, but then to come to the, the question that I'm really interested in. So, so after basically asking him about these different groups, city dwellers and villagers, et cetera, the uh, select committee asked him, but pointedly, what capability of improvement do the Indian people possess? Ramon Starr's answer could not have been more unequivocal. He said, they have the same capability of improvement as any other civilized people. Such a confident, a confident affirmation of the capacity of the Indian people um, I, I, you know, would not be repeated the same force again in, that, in, that, in the rest of the century. So given Ramon's kind of enduring status as the originator of all things modern in colonial India, I think very few of the interpreters have posed to ask what exactly did improvement or civilization mean for him? How did he evaluate the criteria of inferiority or the, or the very notion of the native people? The stakes of this question, I think, are more than a scholar stake. To say something utterly uncontroversial, uh, like all political thinkers of his age, Ramon was profoundly concerned with the question of global difference. One could already see this in the Tupac, and indeed this uh, ran through the gamut of his matured theological or you know, later theological writings. Uh, and I certainly do not have the sufficient knowledge of Persian or Islamic scholarship to speak authoritatively on the Tufat and so on. And um, so I'm just going to touch one point briefly, which is that the text kind of organization of this uh, argument between the dyad of nature and custom is aimed to explain the plural character of religious beliefs and practices across societies. And this was part of a mainstream 18th century intellectual history. His deception-centric division of the mankind into four groups and the argument that inductive reason is often sufficient to avoid, avoid decept, deception and to demystify what he calls the wonderful inventions of the people of Europe 
and the dexterity of jugglers. So all these points touched upon all the burning questions of 18th century uh, uh, political thought, which is like, you know, how do you explain it some level that global uh, difference? So, I mean, um, we uh, heard earlier from uh, Professor G and also, I mean, uh, from uh, Brian, Brian Hatches, uh, that, 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 uh, that Tufat was deeply influenced by Persian kind of writings, that he was in ways influenced by Nasirian um, you know, ethic. And so, of course, all these things are uh, uh, certainly uh, true, but also it strikes me that his reading of uh, a reason centric reading of kind of deception, you know, it, it is quite unmistakable at some level, Voltairean. And Voltairean's essay on universal history of, you know, uh, that that book was widely circulated in the in the 18th century. Um, so I'm saying this because this this is kind of related to my the larger point I'm trying to kind of uh, touch on, which is the his think, his thoughts on the relationship between reason and tradition. Of course, we don't find much reflections on traditions in, in the Tofal. but his later writings, um, of course, would come back to that question. And of course, this was again not particularly unusual in the in the broader kind of 18th century context. I mean, if both are the one tradition of 18th century enlightenment thought with the other one, I mean, the cultural humanist of the 18th century, like, you know, running from Diderot and all that, how to reconcile, think about reason and tradition together, of course, would, would prove to be um, a kind of a main concern. So moving away from the deception-centric uh, framework, I want to suggest that the uh, idolatrous portions of the scriptures are, you know, I quote him, the allegorical adoration of the true deity. The purpose was to guide those who limited those whose limited understandings rendered them incapable of com comprehending the invisible supreme being. Someone says a careful reading of the scriptures ultimately reveals nothing contrary to reason. This so perhaps rightly known for his iconoplasm, but it's not less true that Ramon as uh, was equally invested in reconciling his reason and tradition. He also added the reason by itself is inadequate for the purpose of interpretation as it generates. I quote him, universal doubt, incompatible with the principles on which our comfort and happiness mainly depend. So this relation, of course, would lead Ramahan to attribute special importance to the traditions of ancient nations where reason and common justice, his, his words are both Latin. In the words of one of his foremost 19th century interpreters, uh, Bhutan Dramashil, Ramahan said, understood traditions to be, I quote him, embodiments of the collective senses of the races of mankind. So the important point is that Ramon did not approach the Indian past as a lack of civilization. On the contrary, the degradation of the Indian society that he you know, famously wrote about and talked about in Thomas Ford, you know, and I quote him, he says, his main problem is access in civilization. Now again, this is again not a rare argument in the 18th century. So to go back to the question about um, um, Ramon Rai on improvement and progress uh, that I was trying to kind of trace, I mean, I was trying to look for whether Ramon and James Mill ever meaningfully crossed paths. Now he does kind of mention James Mill once in a letter where um, he said that James Mill is partly, James Mill's people are partly responsible for, um, I mean, you know, agitating this anti jury bill um, um, uh, kind of like writings in the, in the British, British press. So anyway, so I mean, so, so is Sartori, I mean, you know, like classic, classic trope of British liberalism that is James Mill's writing on, writing on priestcraft. And this, of course, they clearly categorically says that priestcraft is a marker of a backward society. Uh, you know, and James Mill said, I quote him, it's, it's the law, you only can see that in the lowest state of society. To take, um, um, you know, that, um, that the same argument about priestcraft, priestcraft would also feature in Macaulay's 1833 Government of India Act speech, that it is a marker of backwardness. But Ramon, of course, said many times that the main problem with priestcraft is hid the sources of reason already latent in the Indian tradition. It had no bearing on the purported civilizational location of a people. So Ramon's exchange with the utopian socialist Robert Owen is suggestive here. So we owe the discovery of these letters to Dilip Kumar Vishesh, who kind of like uh, put them together from archives in New York and Manchester and elsewhere. So this is a very interesting exchange of letters. So in Ramon in this letter says, in spite of his openness to Owen's socialist ideas, that he could not um, reconcile himself to, to Owen's rejection of religion. After multiple dialogues, so Ramon was decided that he would no longer engage with Owen. Reason for this abstinence, uh, he says, the Owen's kind of rejection of the precepts of Christianity. In a follow-up letter to Owen's son, Robert Dale, Ramon revisited the gist of his disagreement with the elder Owen. He said, it is not necessary either in England or in America to oppose religion in promoting the social, domestic, and political welfare of their inhabitants, particularly a system of religion which includes, includes the doctrine, doctrine of universal love and charity. 
more than 2,000 years ago, wise and pious Brahmins of India entertained almost the same opinion, which were further offers, though by no means so destitute of religion. So Ramon's charge against like, Owen becomes uh, more interesting when you take into account, of course, the fact that he was, he was someone who mercilessly satirized the missionary universalization of Christianity. Um, he's, um, I mean, so you know, he's not someone, um, and, and this, I think, for him was more than a strictly theological issue. This is the invocation of the ancient Brahman suggests the common basis across religion, religious traditions operated as a shared ground from which the uneven imperial world could be brought into a commensurable dialogue. Respect for Christianity in Europe was essential to render, render legible the reason inherent in India's Indian and other religious traditions. So anyway, this is one, one way Ramon worked out his vision of enlightenment universalism, which was uh, many ways the bedrock of his more incre increased political turn in the, in the 1820s. So Ramon's clash with um, the emerging discourse of progressive um, imperialism took place in the wake of, as I said, a grants jury bill um, itself. So the bill would allow Indians to serve on the grand jury as well as at the office of the justice of the peace. So upon the arrival in England, he collaborated with Charles Garn on this. Um, so there's one point in the, in the pages of Morning Chronicle, some kind of a proxy debate uh, played out between uh, Ram Mohan and James Mill. So James Mill's friend, uh, John Black, you know, wrote a, a number of uh, uh, editorials against it. And he basically repeated more or less very million argument, the fact that um, giving this right to uh, serve on the jury um, would be basically, you know, like, I think he says something like, uh, um, the monstrosities of the, the worst monst monstrosity, partly because of the reason that uh, Indians are utterly unqualified and not progressive enough to um, um, you know, serve. So this is essentially a very progressivist argument. But in any case, I mean, um, um, the chronic, then Charles, Charles basically grants reply to that, um, well, essentially reproduced Ram Mohan's argument against, against it. And of course there Ram Mohan um, um, basically returned to the argument that I just kind of, uh, it partly developed in his uh, theological writings. But also he brought up the question of the panchayat, the fact that uh, serving on the jury has been a kind of a, it's been a long part, you know, for long has been part of the Indian tradition. Um, so, so in, in any case, this is partly, so this, this kind of like um, the, to approach basically um, uh, uh, part of the jury question and the, whether Indians are fit in many ways, he's not approaching the question from a development or a progressive lens up until that point. And that's what I want to underscore here. But the more important point for my purpose is this is concerned with the question of um, the separation of powers and the larger questions of liberty. Um, I guess um, these questions are also, um, I mean, many ways um, relate to the, to the kind of uh, the larger concern about the common basis of, um, of justice. So, so this kind of like, you know, I mean, the separation of powers is very know, it's of course a, um, a very Montesquieu theme in the 18th century. Um, Ramon, I mean, the early commentators are all quite convinced about the fact that Ramon read Montesquieu very well, but in any case, he doesn't cite him directly, at least um, um, not very often. So his persistent pursuit of, the, of uh, trial by jury so emerge out of the belief, and I quote him that from the, there's a combination of legislative and judicial power is destructive of all civil liberty. The concern with the separation of powers is also at the forefront of his other political preoccupation of the era, the freedom of the press. His writings in opposition to the 1823 restrictions on the vernacular press um, um, uh, freedom is foregrounded the universal indefensibility of despotic rule, along with, the, along with the enlightening qualities of free speech. The curtaining of, the free, free, curtaining of free speech is ultimately a manifestation of the dangers of concentrating all forms of political power in, 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 the, in the same administration. Ramon maintained that the restriction on the freedom of the press was a direct result of the, of the excessive um, executive authority's assumption of legislative power. As he often argued that the main danger of such a concentration of power was the violation of civil rights. On the same ground, Ramon protested the transfer of uh, legislative authority in India. He preferred the British Parliament exercising legislative uh, powers from a distance, partly because he did not want the, legis you know, the legislative and the executive power to, um, uh, to basically to be concentrated into the same body in India. Even in, in um, so the same concept also basically was at the heart of Ramon's scant writings on the political history, history of ancient India. So you know, his, his conjectural narrative, the conflict introduced by caste in early stage of civilization was only received when he says when legislative and executive authority, uh, these are shared between the two separate tribes. It was only then India enjoyed peace and comfort for a great many centuries. This argument collapsed um, 
as this as this arrangement collapsed and um, um, one group came came to control both executive and legislative authorities, India and entered into millennium of uh, tyranny. So this consolidated of push, uh, separation of power and uh, the you know also shaped I think many ways his controversial position on the on the colonization of India by European settlers. Ramon's support of European colonization has long troubled the project of assimilating him to a gradualist narrative of anti-colonial political thought. As uh, Professor Ruzinka Chaudhary has so uh, deftly uh, shown in her uh, article on this topic that um, Ramon's case for colonization was different from that of the free traders who had also been campa campaigning for the abolition, um, abolition of the East India Company's um, monopoly. Free traders held that the opening up of the Indian market would lead to, lead to widespread uh, Indian European colonization and help India advance. Ramon did not really agree with this argument. He observed that, that persons of lower class would be likely to give in to racial and religious discrimination, all that is well known. The only colonization that could be endorsed was that of higher and better educated classes of Europeans. Ramon hoped that a free and extensive, extensive, extensive communication between European sectors and the natives would free the latter's mind, I quote him, from superstitions and prejudices and improve their knowledge of agricultural and mechanical arts. The aim of this otherwise tested legislation of the civilizing um, mesh vision concerned the facilitation of reason already present in India's, rather than an appeal to uplift them to a higher stage of historical development. This is a subtle difference, but I think an important one. Alienating some of his allies invested in prioritizing uh, free trade, Ramon made the question of the separation power central in his debates on colonization. The European settlers would bring their rights with them, he thought, would be, a, would be a guard against the abuse of power by the company state. The increased intercourse between India and Britain to settlers, Ramon hoped, would enable parliament to legislate more proficiently um, on Indian issues. Once again, Ramon underscored the remedy it would offer to help overcome uh, the mercy of, of the representations of comparatively few individuals. On the other hand, the turbulence likely to follow from European colonizations could be preemptively remedied by enacting, you know, he says, equal laws, placing all the classes on the same footing as uh, to civil rights and the establishment of trial by jury. This further illustrates that Ramon was willing to alter the composition, composition of the native population for the sake of civil rights and separation of powers. Pursuit of liberty in an imperial context counterintuitively intuitively presented the prospect of European colonization to be the antidote of uh, despotic rule. What it also helps us to see is that the relative, relative distance between Ramon, Ramon's politics of liberty and the emerging ideal of self-government. His was a form of politics unconcerned with the source of sovereignty. Ramon made no meaningful distinction between sovereignty and government beyond the ex executive legislative distinction. Principles of good government, his term, rather than self-government animated the Raja's projects of separation of powers and civil rights. And as such, the imperial form could not stand in the way of the universal import of liberty. So what is the source of the argument that Ramon Wright compromised on such norms for the higher premise of a progressive journey to self-government? First thing to note here is that the second half of the 19th century was so profoundly intellectually different than the, the, the Ramon Rice that you know, it many ways dragged Ramon in, in this shadow. The Indian 19th century was ultimately the century of a passionate yet tortured grappling with the alluring ideal of self-government, an ideal which essentially entailed the question of democracy and shaped the, norm the normative touchstone, negative or positive, of basically anti-colonial uh, movement. So, and I'm of course referring here to self-described and self-understood liberals such as Dadabai Nauruji, uh, Ramesh Chandradatso, and Shurendranath Banerjee, and many others. So, 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 so I mean, as I just mentioned earlier in the day, I mean, in this in, in 1933 centenary celebrating Ramon, uh, not celebrating, but his death anniversary. I mean, there's a number of pieces. I mean, one of them written by Ramananda Chatterjee, um, try, try to reflect on Ramon and how he related to the existing anti-colonial movement. And the best he could say that, like, you know, there's some germs in his writing, especially his writings on the trial by jury and others that could potentially be an inspiration for um, Indian self-government. So, then we see, I mean, Biman Bahiri Mojumdar, who is really quite, um, I think, tried to be historically, contextually uh, specific. He also kind of um, made that a Ramohan in certain contexts, for example, agreed to kind of um, um, or not make demands for uh, the location of legislative authority in India, partly on the ground the Indians are not fit for self-government. So these attempts to offer an alibi for Ramohan only registered for me the central place the idea of self-government to retrospectively um, occupy in the narratives of 19th century Indian political thought. So the other reason for this framing in many ways, our lack of uh, attention to the semantic shifts uh, of familiar word concepts. 
To be clear, much in the vein of 18th century British thought, Ramon's work is replete with the term improvement. He did hold that the object of government was the improvement of the native population, his term. So as uh, you know, the term originated in the 17th century, you know, especially particularly in England and gained widespread currency as a general metaphor for betterment. In the history of British political thought, this term can be found in abundance from John Locke to Edmund Barnes, because term that everyone used, the Baron Locke. In the 19th century, though, especially in the work of people like John Spur Mill, improvement became more than a marker of open ended betterment. The collective state of improvement of a people came to be the precondition of liberty and self government. So, as I was looking into basically this reading of Ramon as a, as a progressive, as a gradual reformist, how it kind of took shape. So, you know, I mean, uh, R.C. Bajumdar's very famous uh, demolition job, you know, the lecture uh, on Ramon Rai. Um, so, you know, it also kind of, among other things, brought up how Ramon was willing to uh, basically, um, um, you know, wait for India's, um, wait to be, basically, he was happy to be subjected for a future prospect of self-government. And he cites in the piece, basically, um, this, um, and again, I mean, so the, what he cites in this piece is this journal entry by Victor Jacquemont that uh, Hiroshi Chaudhuri, suppose, you know, in, in the 1920s, translated and published in the in, in Modern Review. And of course, it would make it be part of his uh, autobiography of an unknown Indian. So this letter would also be then again the proof for Aurobindo Puddhar's uh, kind of reflection on the same topic. So, so this journal entry, I think, is original. So that, that it's not, it's basically the, this is beautifully well known, of course, because his uh, uh, Jacquemont's, I mean, his letters are more uh, known, but the journal, uh, his journal entries are not particularly well known before uh, Andrew uh, uh translated it. But in many ways, it, this, this particular evidence, it, it, it kind of was like a magic bullet for many uh, Ramon scholars in that era. Um, so so in that, in that kind of like um, uh, passage, Ramon said in private that national independence, I quote him, is not an absolute good. And the object of society is to secure the happiness of the greatest possible number. But from another private source reported in the Asiatic Journal, the Ramon privately ridiculed utilitarianism. Of course, so there's a contradiction between the two, but be that as it may, I think we still can take that kind of uh, journal entry at its face goal. So Jacquemont further reported that Ramon believed that conquest is not a pure evil, the conqueror is more civilized. Uh, just discussed, Ramon is our, in his writings held that the excess rather than lack of civilization was India's problem. Here we can consider Ramon did believe that the, the exposure to sophisticated reason can help inculcate the better practice of reasoning. So, you know, like what would really be the main point of 19th century Indian uh, in intellectual history, anyway, the idea that norms are conditional on history. But Ramon was not really arguing this. He was arguing at best exposure for the better arts of agriculture, or whatever. This would divide Latin traditions. So yet most commentators paid less attention to a document that was more easily accessible. The letter he wrote after the, the joint victory of the Reform Bill and Grant's Fury Bill that we just discussed earlier, uh, and the letter was most likely written to Prashanna Prashan Kumar Thakur. I mentioned the stakes of the jury bill already, which was dear to Ramon since for a long time. The question of uh, reform of the reform bill um, was not only for him, but for many scholars and political thinkers of this time was something that generated unexpected results. You would know that Ramon famously vowed to severe connections with England if the, bill, if the bill failed in parliament. Ramon won both his battles, but signs of losing the war could already be seen. As it turned out, the normative affirmation of self-government could not quite be separated from the developmentalization of the ideal itself. In the midst of the dual victories of the reform and jury bills, it became evident the success of the mighty people of England, he said, had paradoxically deferred the project of instituting liberty, liberty in India. Cautioning against excessive uh, excitement over, um, over the passing of the jury bill, Ramon wrote, and I quote him, the voice of the mighty people of England, England grows every day stronger in proportion to the growth of the intelligence. I must at the same time confess, confess the progress we have made in India as to knowledge or politics by no means equal to that made here by the English. We should not be too hasty and too sanguine in raising our conditions since gradual improvements are most durable. He even directly attributed the rise of popular power in England to its historical advancement. England is now, has now arrived at this degree of civilization which places the re reign of opinion on a very permanent basis. Now that's straight out of many ways the, the liberal imperialist argument that uh, we know. And this is the closest I think Ramon Rai came to the 19th century. His late rhetorical shifts points to the emerging frontier of self-government where the historical state of peoplehood rather than university of norms was what at uh, stage. 
you are all no doubt familiar with the sharp polemics against the non portability of British liberalism in early 20th century India by trailblazing thinkers such as Balganga, the Tilak, and Aurobindo Ghosh, and many others. So these liberals who um, are, you know, I mean, the one that for a long time would be known as, as Indian liberals, they're thought to be known as Indian liberalism, you know. So I'm just going to end on this note and I can talk more about this. I mean, their main normative um, ideal, many ways, was self government of course, that ideal for them also generated a split between sovereignty and government, partly because insofar as popular sovereignty, sovereignty of the people is conditional on whether they are fit to be citizens, you know, that certain historical, uh, you know, that meant that while they required the needed self-government, they could not yet authorize it. And this is in many ways the kind of the whole problem of mendicancy and, you know, how Indian liberalism or moderatism would be known to historians uh, of, um, uh, I guess, uh, Indian history and political thought. So in any case, in, in turning Ramon Ryan to liberal, in many ways we we'll lose sight of that distinctive first day history of Indian liberalism, partly of the periodization, what really made the first half of the 19th century different from the later half. Um, and many ways that recent liberal in all its varieties remains a child of the Cold War and this uh, aftermath, aftermath. Mm -hmm. So I guess a less categorizable and less familiar Ramon is perhaps what we need to make 19th century Indian intellectual history and its 20th century inheritors. The strange and perhaps generative uh, again. Thank you. Thank you very much for that very nuanced uh, paper. Analytically, there, I'm sure there are many questions. Um, personally, what I take back from this in a very interesting way is, I think, uh, is an equalizing potential of the capacity for self governance as. Uh, improvement rather than a temporal lag. It's a very interesting uh, departure that so we'll open it for questions and shall we take some questions together? Yeah. Uh, thanks so much Nazwal. Absolutely brilliant paper. Yeah. I mean um I mean, your, your paper actually reminded me a bit of like what Foucault in The Order of Things talks about the bourgeois and their liberal critiques like splashing in the same swimming pool. And what you basically show is the right and left are making the same mistake of making Ramon a liberal splashing in the same pool. My, my two part questions, one is going back to the 18th century, for people in the Scottish Enlightenment, um, self-government was not necessarily good for progress. The Highlands are the best example. If, if they have self-governance, they remain backward. Rather, let them be conquered by the Anglo-British state, let them lose their freedom, that will help in their progress. It, do you think that kind of a Scottish Enlightenment milieu would have influenced Ramon? And the second question, I mean, today we did not hear much about categories that are fundamental to Ramon. His music. Brombo, Mukti, Mokko. Do you think the categorization of Ramon as a liberal, particularly perhaps in the Cold War period, is responsible for denuding Ramon of the theological content of his arguments, which was central to Ramon? Instead, like, a bit like what we have had, the, the same problem we have had with the Cambridge history of political thought, which tends to forget religion as a constitutive category, has the same kind of issue occurred with Ramon? <laughs> Thank you, Nazmul. That was very interesting. Um, I just had a couple of uh, questions. So, um, and you mentioned some, I mean, the argument itself, I, I'm not going to sort of summarize your own argument uh, back to you. Uh, but I just wanted to ask you to reflect for a moment on something that is not directly Ramohan, but uh, related to the period itself. Because you are, after all, tracing, in some respect, uh, this, this history of constituting him as uh, the first Indian liberal and you know the, the, uh, the category of liberalism itself. Uh, so if Ramohan then is, the, uh, is, the, is, is being sort of uh, constructed as this figure who is for the first time, I think you said, the first, for the first time linking parliamentary reform to political reform. Um, Borunde. Sorry? That's, that's Borunde. Borunde. You quoted Borunde. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But you didn't disagree with Borunde. <laughs> you you I, quoted I, him to say, did you? I, I, well, uh, mostly I think until that, that post reform bill moment where right. he does adopt the language. Exactly. And before that, I don't see a lot of. Yeah. And by anyway, he just had a few months to reckon with. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, but my question is really not to do with agreement or disagreement with that at all. It's to do with uh, uh, sort of bringing uh, 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 the years that followed a little bit into, into focus. Um, I've been looking at uh, sort of, you know, the Young Bengal speeches, uh, as, as you have as, as, as well, I believe. Um, Young Bengal too is very vociferously uh, linking const what they call constitutional reform. By this time, they're actually using the term constitutional reform. Constitutional reform. 
uh, to political reform. So is Ram in the time of Rama. So let's go back to 1830 to 33, let's say. Um, I just wanted to pinpoint the notion of agency because it seems to me that there's a shift from the time of Ram Mohan to the time of Young Bengal in that um, when Ricketts is taking the East India Bill, for instance, uh, when Ricketts is traveling with his petition, the East Indian community's petition to England, in, first in 1831 and then again in 1833, he too is trying to move parliament. Ramun is also understanding that parliament needs to be moved. But what is the agency that's going to move parliament? It is only in the young Bengal speeches, it seems to me, and therefore I'm asking to be corrected. It seems to me that they are identifying public opinion as what is to move uh, parliament, not the individual agent who is to be approached because De Rosio criticizes Ricketts for, in fact, criticizes the entire petition before changing his mind because he, he's basically saying you're paying, uh, uh, you know, uh, an agent to, to, to approach parliament. Basically, Ricketts is taking not just the petition, but money to approach somebody who will put their, table their question. You, somebody needs to table the question in parliament, right? So that's the Padhutika A. The, 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 that is the method of petition. So this petitioning culture, it is now realized by the 1840s, 1843 specifically I'm talking about, but generally uh, in this period, it, is there a shift then that realizes that the agency lies not so much with the individual petition that will table something in parliament and then create parliamentary reform. So I'm really going into the nitty gritty of it. The, the parliament, you mentioned parliamentary reform is a broad category. But what exactly does that entail? And is there a shift or am I wrong? This is, I'm really actually asking for clarification or, it, or is Ram Mohan also thinking of not just a, a petition, is he thinking of moving public opinion in other ways? So it's really actually a broader I'm curiosity. I just wanted to yeah. know more because Ramon yeah. is not uh, specifically sort of my subject. The other thing, very quickly, and I don't want to take up a lot of time, is very interestingly, the little quote, uh, sort of uh, what you read out uh, uh, in, in, from, from that letter to um, uh, 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 Prashanna Kumar, um, you know, um, he's... Uh, the letter is about uh, the that's related to the to the earlier question uh, uh, in relation to public opinion. He basically thinks that the Indian Indian public opinion is not yet, or in the Indian people themselves are not yet at that stage. So, if if you read more or if you tell us a little more about that, I mean, why why he he's saying that? But the second thing that I wanted to come to before I went to that was uh, technology. I'm sorry, I'm using the word technology. Yeah. I know Ramon doesn't. But when he's talking uh, in the context of colonization, you, you, you read out something that shows that he's actually anticipating that agricultural implements will improve. Uh, basically, he's saying the technology of agriculture will improve. The condition, the material condition of the Indian peasant will therefore improve. I found that a uh, fascinating parallel to his letter to Lord Amherst, mm -hmm. where if you remember, He's asking for English education, why? But only for the useful sciences. Chemistry was one of them. I can't remember the other ones. Yeah, yeah. But you know, he mentioned, he says the useful sciences will, will, will come. So yeah, so that in that, I was interested in that commitment then uh, to, uh, you know, the useful sciences being sort of, you know, uh, mirrored in the colonization mm -hmm. thing also where he's thinking of technology and how, Technology and material will materially mm. improve the condition mm. of the yeah. Sorry, this is a this larger is right. discussion. Maybe I should pick this two up so that Rather, it doesn't. Yeah. 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 So, so, so really yeah. Now, really, um, both great questions. I mean, uh, uh, start with um, um, Melinda's question. I mean, so Scottish um, Enlightenment and so, like you know, of course, this has been a misunderstanding of Scottish Enlightenment Party dating back to the 1850s. Party, the early Cambridge School. They are reading of James Mill and seeing them as an inheritor of the Scottish Enlightenment tradition meant that Scottish Enlightenment itself has been read beginning with Adam Smith onward and basically essentially a kind of early form of progressive you know, empire, especially insofar as the empire question is concerned. The scholarship was quite rigorous on, on, on the economic part and other things, but that's so. This has only been recently been disentangled, right? Um, and Scottish Enlightenment thinkers, of course, you know, Adam Smith, you know, like you could argue like Jennifer Peace does that she, he, in many ways, because he, he was not a historicist or a developmentalist, the way he thought about empire. But forget about Adam Smith, um, 
as such, the, the his people who really wrote about, say, Adam Ferguson and uh, Miller and others, so their self comment was not very important to their story of how societies kind of developed and how they change. And most importantly, these are also stories of, um, I mean, basically a logic of progression. It's a logical pattern, like also inherent to all society. So what they are not doing is that comparative study of different societies and trying to locate it, right? At best, just telling the system how he, the human form, human is a cultural kind of for a novel savage and everything. So it's a very important distinction from the, from the 19th century. And Ramo as such, I mean, definitely knew, I mean, that argument, I mean, the particular use of, um, I mean, uh, that he makes often um, of, uh, so that, that does show that he's familiar, you know, Scottish, like, Scottish stage theory was not particularly also unknown or rare in the theory, it's pretty commonplace. Um, but of course, I mean, going back to just to ask a little bit of question that, you know, like um, one of Ramon Raya's, you know, um, I guess, quote unquote disciples, Dr. Naranjan Mukherjee actually invokes storage management theory quite directly in his very famous 1843 speech, which shows how that but anyway, he does not use actually stage theory to show up the empire. What Mukherjee does is that, look, I mean, if you follow this, how your societies evolve, that the principle of civilization or, or the principle of government which is part of all civilized government, it is, it, it is born in the beginning. And India has it as much as any society. So what that means is that like, this is not leading up to that, that, that conditional understanding of norms. So this, in many ways, would be more continuous to this than to uh, a more, you know, like historicist stages and not like, you know, so stagism necessarily doesn't mean developmentalism or progressivism uh, in, a, in, a, in, the, in, a, in a historical uh, development sense. Um, Theology and, um, and, and history, well, I mean, you know, it's a big question. Um, <laughs> and I guess one could say that, of course, I mean, the emergence of uh, liberal Ram Mohan, um, though, you know, I mean, um, um, it, I mean, Bailey, of course, focuses a lot on his political writings. So Sartre is complicated, so there's a lot of things, I mean, you know, because he's really looking at a logic that he could find anywhere, whether it's theological <laughs> or otherwise. Um, but yeah, I guess one could broadly see that like this is, insofar as Ramon is a political thinker is concerned, because we have been many ways so invested in locating him. And hell, I think should make one point very quickly. I mean, this latest kind of uh, rebirth of Ramon as a liberal thinker in this century, like it is a product, or it is a in many ways a development of the work of Uday Mehta, Jennifer Pierce, that work which tried to many ways show that liberalism was thoroughly global, and it relied in many ways, you know, what's with MS as well, strategies, strategies of exclusion, but most importantly, a discourse of progress, right? Um, and but it, no matter what you think, it made liberalism fundamentally global, right? Which is something you would not see in Polo writings on liberalism, which is in many ways a completely kind of transformative moment for studies of liberalism. And this scholarship, in many ways, came against the backdrop it actually ran with the global understanding of liberalism. But of course, in many ways to show their cosmopolitanism, the fact that liberalism circulated and travel and did not really engage in many ways with the question of how did they deal with the hierarchies integral to it. And if you, you know, explore the question, to me at least, until the very late Ram Mohan, the Ram Mohan that you know, the stuff, most of the stuff, you know, we don't really see that liberal imperialism meaningfully. So um, anyway, so um, to your questions, I mean, really, all really great questions. And I may touch upon the question of public opinion broadly, but it is a very interesting question. This relates to many ways. The question of self government, right? The self government, I used it in many ways. You know, it's an Indian term. It's a term, of course, in the British kind of imperial world in the 19th century, it was widely, widely used. On the colonies, settler colonies, they're also kind of many ways using the term. The term had many lives and uses. But specifically, it's a term that really uh, sat between sovereignty and government, right? I mean, it, it as somebody entered the question of self or the people. Um, and so, Question of the people is a question of many, among other things, a question of authorization. When we make claims, who do we invoke? Where does the right come from? Like you want something, but where does it come from, right? And I mean, so like um, Ramon Rai as such, I mean, of course I said, I mean, for, for, for most of his writings, I mean, he's not someone who uh, ever really invokes the authority of the people as a, as an, as a kind of juridical entity. Uh, interestingly, the, the, um, I mean, uh, Dr. Ranjan you know, the one of his, that's a, you know, it's a short speech that he gave that I think um, Bengal Gadget, Gadget reproduced, which is that his speech, which got him into trouble, where he said that you know, India public opinion would soon rise, and you know, and the, and the, some of the British presses are like, is it threatening us with revolution, right? And which is of course would be kind of, you know, it completely doesn't fit with whatever he said in the other piece, where he says only the fools fight about the form of government. What really matters is good government to an extent, very harmonious. Um, so. And he, of course, vociferously denied that he was invoking 
the growth of public opinion as a as a as a in the popular sovereignty sense, but mostly as kind of you know, enlightenment public opinion would introduce check and balance and do basically, you know, whatever, you know, working through other means and not, so avoiding in some level direct invocation. But I would go even further and say that like, you know, the, the, the same speech that you, you know, know very well and writing about, um, you know, the debate he has with the principal of Hindu college, Captain Richardson about um, what is the, you know, Richardson agreed many ways, there are lots of problems with British administration in India. But what's the main problem here, right? So it's like a big part of the problem is the state of the Indian people. You know, a government is not all powerful. They only can do, you know, the basis of the material given to them. Um, this is the argument that all these kind of uh, presses that took on the case are commented on this kind of particular fact. And there's we see split in many ways between the government and the people. I mean, Dr. Ranjan was pushing the fact that, well, we need to think about government in terms of its universal norms and not in terms of who is free, who is not. So, I would say, like, even until him, I mean, self government is still not meaningfully present. And public opinion is not mobilized in the sense that we mobilized by Nauruji and others. Right? Um, and my sense, you know, I mean, of course, there is not one clear point when it emerges, but, you know, it's only in the 1850s and 60s, you know, around the kind of the mutiny, but also like, you know, that period that we see like self government began appearing as an organized ideal with this associated thing about. Sovereignty, government, and particularly also the idea of progress, all linked together, not as separate ideas. Um, technology question again is, is also, uh, I should be brief probably because it's been too long. Um, it, it goes with the question of moral and material progress, right? This, the, this, so, I mean, what Nauruji would do at this late 20th century movement that moral and material progress, progress would be co constituting. That you know, unless you have certain level of material improvement, you cannot have also moral improvement because you know, I mean, the one mutually reinforces each other. I don't think Ramohan at that moment they really had this dialect, quote unquote, dialectical understanding of moral and moral and material development. That this kind of like the the movement of technologies, you know, I think it might as well be like it's a good thing. Ramohan could potentially accept it without thinking that anyway it implies. I mean, developmentalism in the sense that we understand it. But again, there's a lot more to say, but I will stop here uh, because it's taking too long, but I should continue this conversation. Um, I'm going to try to be very brief. Thank you for a very pro uh, interesting presentation. Just a, two quite quick points. Um, uh, just going back to what Rosinka said, now this is many, many years ago. Uh, um, I'm trying to look at Jerozio's response to the wickets. Uh, representation you know the deprivation and the categorical stripping of of the privileges i am not going to use the word rights uh, but of, of mixed blood uh, you know, so-called east indian east india question that was actually there during ramon's last uh, last years and that might be something look worth looking at because this is not a question then of the the indian peasant but rather uh, you know, for people, uh, you know, who are not necessarily seen as uh, clearly Asiatic or European, or those early racial categories. Um, the other thing I was thinking that apart from, well, the Scottish moral en enlightenment thinkers, uh, it's not in a unified body of, of, of work. Uh, Keynes, um, um, uh, Lord Keynes, and then of course, Stuart, who, uh, I don't know how many people know this. I've discovered, at least in the, India, in the archives, Stuart had a long correspondence with currency reformers in India. Huh. And I've been writing about this, um, that you know, he actually has a lot of commentary on the Indian economy in the, in the 1780s and 1790s. Mm -hmm. um, and what you find there, I mean, I'm not going to talk about that, but that apart from this, the stages theories that you know, are common to Miller and Ferguson, you know, there's also this constant invocation of the geographical morality and geographical determinism of Montesquieu variety. And I was wondering whether, you know, all these things uh, play into an osmotic notion of, I mean, osmo, you know, the idea of civilization. Where is this coming from? You know, what is Ram Mohan's uh, sort of grammar, uh, as it were, or, or the bibliography of civilization in that particular word at that time? Mm -hmm. It's worth thinking, you know, mm -hmm. because it's not shobhuta in the yeah. translational sense yeah. that we use today. Mm -hmm. So, um, so just two points about yeah, other yeah. subject populations who yeah. also constitute a part of the Indian body polity yeah, that yeah, problematize yeah, yeah. the relationship between yeah. the ruler and the ruled, yeah. and then uh, other unexpected, act, maybe even accidental, sort of leakage mm -hmm. <laughs> of of, uh, of European ideas in the in the Indian yeah. uh, sort of context. Yeah. Great, Shrey. Okay. So. Uh, 
you need not make an elaborate answer, but I thought this may be the right place to raise the question. Um, which is about this distinction you make uh, between the Ramon Rai kind of liberalism and the late 19th century liberalism. And you're completely right, I think, to make self-government the key distinction that you know, Ramon did not have this notion of a, a self-government in the way it would be articulated later on in the late 19th century. Uh, but I think there is a sense in which there is, a, there is something common between Ramon and the later liberals, even the early 20th century liberals. And that is in the notion of the representative as leader, as a leader of society. Uh, this, this sense of, of, of leadership being transformative, this whole idea of improvement in a sense is about the goal of a kind of advance guard, right? Which brings in new technology, which brings in new ideas, new education, yes. and in a sense that improves the rest of society. Now, this was very fundamental to, to Whig liberalism. Uh, but what I'm suggesting is by the 20th century, or even the late 19th, when you actually have a notion of mass democracy coming in, certainly in India with after 1920s, when you have you know, the Gandhian kind of movement breaking out and you see the liberals breaking away from the Congress, you know, people like Tapru, Jayaka, Jinnah, all of those kinds of people. There, this is the crucial question for them. That where, in a sense, let me put it simply, where the representative was supposed to lead the rest of society or the people. Now, increasingly, the argument is that the representative must be similar to the people, that the representative must, in fact, replay, reflect the people, yeah. see, which will become the increasingly the form of mass democracy as yeah. we know it. Yeah. Now, it seems to me that that liberalism today still wants to retain that older idea of the representative who must lead society rather than submit to you know, what, what is popular opinion, public opinion. And that, it seems to me, is still unresolved. Uh, and you can trace a history from yeah. Ramon all the way to those who uh, don't like what's going on in, yeah. in democracies yeah. uh, in, in our kind of societies. Yeah. Do you take this? Yes, uh, no, I mean, um, great. Uh, so, um, uh, in response to Professor Sen's uh, question, something, yeah, I, mean, I mean, the mixed part question, I, I definitely should look into this more and remind me of what Dipesh said earlier about Ramon could imagine basically this like mixed blood. And, and again, I mean, partly because Ramon is not operating with an idea of the people that is the more juridical kind of, yeah. you know means that, you know, of course, potentially, I, you know, I have not seen anything that meaningfully imply that, but, you know, I mean, it is, it is one could, point is not to fantasize about their form imagination because partly it's enabled by that his, you know, non-commitment, many ways a pre-democratic relationship to the question of, um, um, you know, both the question of the population and also the government. So certainly, I mean, there is, this is an interesting avenue as to how far he could go. I mean, of course we saw with the, with the colonization, I mean, he was willing to go quite, quite far. Um, with the ge yeah, geographical majority and uh, and and that debate, I mean, yeah, it's really, I mean, uh, Thomas would be here, the person to talk about Dougal Scott, right? Because he has been writing and he has uh, done a lot of research on that kind of movement and that exchange that uh, um, so, but um, um, like, so, so the, the writing on civil, the way Ramon uses the early, basically Ramon until the late, late moment, the England moment toward the end of it, the way he uses civilization, I mean, you know. A lot of this, of course, I would say, does share quite a bit, a lot with uh, the Montesquieu and, and views. But it's not just Montesquieu, in particular, the civilization, we thought it was craft, we thought about basically, you know, com complex, basically customs. And of course, that would lead to that at some level. If we have commitments about reason and this complex customs and practices, that means that, of course, I mean, at some level, the, compl the more complex the custom becomes, it can hide the reason from you, right? And that's a tradition that Ramon, of course, I mean, it's what's brilliant about him is they did that for a global context, for a non-European context, and, and fairly in many ways remade that idea. But you know, the language, the way he uses it, I think it is it is not a marginal tradition. 
uh, in 18th century, uh, even European political thought. So there's a lot more to be said on uh, some of the other sources here beyond the ones that we just mentioned. Um, yes, and, and uh, uh, as to uh, Professor Chatterjee's point, I mean, you know, I think I'm, 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 I'm very much, uh, I mean, in agreement with here about the fact that the, the idea of representative, so, you know, I was, I tried to go through Ramon's work, see to what extent uses the language of representatives. He does use it. He never perceived representative government to be alien to him as a term, but representative is a term that we see in him a lot, right? And uh, in the later in the 19th century, the natural leaders of people, of course, the term that the early Congress would run with and talk about all the time. Now, the continuity is certainly there. Of course, one could see some difference in terms of how that argument is justified. I mean, it's an argument that the Congress, you know, early Congress beloved a lot over, over and over again, why the educated section of the Indian masses, and they would of course come up with stories of the, from the European history, how the, you know, the, 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 the advanced section of the society, the best agents to facilitate progress and development and basically all sorts of late 19th century uh, ideas. For Ramon, of course, representatives, both meant a capacity for judgment, reasoning, and less basically the, the idea that, um, um, you know, less progressive in many ways and more reason centric, but certainly continuous. And absolutely, I mean, of course, I mean, um, I did not think about that, but I wanted to think about the breaking up of and the departure of all the liberals, not just the Shrindra Banerjee and National, National Liberation Federation, but also Jinnah and many others. It's exactly this, this particular, um, particular idea about uh, the fact that, um, I mean, um, as Gandhi led Congress, Many ways, quite I would say often, you know, like um, not always directly or clearly, but still many ways trying to move past and think about um, both the question of how to represent the people. And of course, a complicated question, even in 1920s India, where the question of whether the people are there is <laughs> ontologically still the question being debated over and over again. But the shift has started, right? And um, and that, of course, is the main thing that the, 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 the 1930s text that I discussed, the 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 Vietnam this uh, Maganla's book, these texts are all unified by this particular commitment, the idea that, I mean, um, 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 like re progress and reform best done by, um, you know, those who are able to moderate and, you know, and, and uh, exercise liberty um, in a way that is both would accelerate development in a, in a strange way. Uh, I mean, of course, I mean, uh, and at the same time, also the element of moderation and reason, the older argument, was kind of, you know, intelligence appeared it was still there. So yeah, so thank you for, for that. Yeah, you should check if Dipesh has a hand up. I think I saw one. Yeah. Send. No, no, let, let Rahul go before me. <laughs> Yeah, um, sort of uh, thanks for that. I mean, I think, as you say, it's important to uh, think of uh, that the category liberalism sometimes doesn't help, help us see what uh, Ramon Roy is doing. I mean, I think, uh, I think that's important because even when you, for instance, when you use the word self-government, uh, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but in the 19th century, it's about self-governing colonies, uh, which are still recognized the crown. So I think I think we have to make a distinction. I mean, the whole "quote unquote" liberal. I mean, the it, 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 my mind doesn't really make sense. I mean, institutionally, there is the self-governing colony and the crown, and then there are ideas from the French Revolution. So I mean, in some ways, even even what you uh, the representation idea is uh, is really Rousseau and Sierre. I mean, Rousseau's idea of this calling back the representative, and Sierre's idea of the representative. Uh, the one who represents is in the assembly, right? So, I mean, this entire, uh, this idea of self-government uh, is completely imbricated within, you know, imperial jurisdictions. Uh, it's, it's just a kind of later mythology that liberalism is about rights. I mean, uh, when uh, the Indian constitution was being proposed, the British said that we don't, you know, there's nothing like, why do you want to have something like fundamental rights? Uh, because the British don't have a category of fundamental rights. So, I mean, in that sense, I think uh, liberalism has just been kind of packaged post, uh, you know, after the world wars. And, and it's kind of in many ways really not allowed us to see uh, what was really institutionally happening in Britain and the various jurisdictions. Uh, and sort of combined uh, vaguely these ideas of the French Revolution and other kinds of ideas 
uh, with what was happening in yeah. other parts of the world. Can I take that? Uh, I think we have another question here. Yeah. Do you wish to... Uh, Nazmul, uh, no, I, I mean, I'm a little tired and uh, it's gone Am I? past bedtime, but look, uh, yeah. uh, it's a bit, I was thinking, partly going back to Milindo's question um, to you, which is that, and connects back to Partho's question. See, one of the words that I use, that I see Christians use about Rambo, uh, very self conscious, is reformer. 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 Yeah. Which to me seems like a new word. I mean, even in the 19th century, right? I mean, even in Gujarat, when they're saying yeah, they're using Sudhar for reform, they are actually translating reform mm. into Gujarati. And we yeah. say Samaj Shamshkar, etc. And part of the reform is this campaign against idolatry. So my question is, when Ramon is talking about women's, you know, widow's right to property or uh, and sati uh, against sati and all of those arguments. So uh, is there a connection between uh, the anti-idolatry thrust of his thinking? Sorry, I mean, I don't guess anti-idolatry. Thrust of his thinking and um, and his specific conceptions of what we are translating as rights. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, because in, in some ways, you know, when I think back now, when I think of the 19th century as a whole, it seems to me that 19th century in many aspects of life is constantly proposing the problem of consciousness as the problem. I mean, it's not accidental that Hegel philosophizes history in the 19th century as a problem of consciousness. Um, and, and when history is another problem of consciousness, and I even think of, you know, Rovindranath's those lines, they shob mlan muk mukhe dite habe bhasha. Right? They, it, clearly, it clearly brings forward the question of the avant-garde that Partho was raising about. So the, the question is, if, is the representative, whether in a liberal or non-liberal framework of putative people or nation is also a reformer, right? Then A, the, then however they think of representation, the question of being a leader will be there. But I'm also asking, can one separate these two aspects of Ramon's thinking? I mean, he's thought of as a reformer when the Christians describe him as a reformer, it's specifically the anti-idolatry drive that they, they go to. And the same person is also then arguing for useful edu education sciences, for uh, against sati, for particular press rights. And I'm asking, see, as such, when I sit here and think, I, I don't think one has to be an anti idolatrous person to ask for press freedom. But clearly, for this man, both of those thought subjects were important. And can one bring them together in understanding Ramahul? Maybe you should respond yeah. to this. Yeah. I did not hear every word. I, didn't, I heard most of it, but you don't hear some of it. So I might ask you to kind of say a little bit more, but I'm, I'm going to, uh, I think I, I got the gist of it, but hearing right here, I'm standing, is not as good as from the audience uh, side of things. But uh, I think I got the gist of it. But I'll start with uh, um, uh, Rahul's question. Um, so, I mean, the, the liberalism the Indians mostly would I mean, you know, speak, to speak contextually, would be engaging a thinking way. Of course, many ways, the British tradition of thinking about liberalism. But the British, British themselves in the 18th, 19th century did not think of the rights question immediately when they thought of liberalism. Like James Fitt, James, uh, you know, Stephen has a piece, I think 1862, where he tries to define liberalism. It's one of the, you know, part of the debate where he says that liberalism, you know, is very simply is this gradual kind of um, increase of popular control of our government, right? It is in many ways one could say, I mean, close to when you know when to, when to connote democracy rather than liberalism, you would use that term. 
Uh, the question of liberalism getting, getting connected to rights and all that is mostly a 20th century story. But anyway, to go back to the question of CS and um, I mean, um, um, uh, Rousseau and, um, and basically the French tradition of thinking about, um, and of course, you have the question of self governing colonies. Um, now, of course, self governing colonies, as far as I can understand and see, of course, is a term widely used uh, in the 19th century for, um, you know, for, for settler colonies. And um, so it was, it was a term that, um, I mean, also you know, spawned um, debates in the sense that it often also overlapped with other terms, dominions and everything else. And basically, I don't think colonies are necessary, the idea of self government for colonies emerged after the British idea of self government, as, as far as I could tell, took shape. And, um, and of course, it relied heavily on the continuity of the, of the kind of, you know, the population, you know, like they're connected as population, but different, you know, at least uh, provisionally different as peoples. Um, so in any case, question of CS and so that tradition of thinking about the people and, and, and basically constituent power and the question of authorization, you know, it is quite, quite absent um, in this um, 19th century British and Indian tradition of thinking about um, liberalism, of course, I mean, in so far as liberalism, the main category is harder to get there. If you think of popular sovereignty or democracy directly, um, this question would be at the, at the forefront. Of course, once you ask the question about constituent power, whether the people authorize to write the constitution, or whether they basically directly write the laws, like in the Rousseauian account, now that opens up, I mean, it's, it's a question that Europe itself in the 90th century, I'm not saying that it was not present, it was definitely been present in Britain. Um, though I think the temporal ways of thinking about government and the people that took shape partly on the reform bill moment, and you know, of course, it is you know, a famous kind of voice by Macaulay, but this argument became so widespread that until it came to the kind of uh, late 19th century, um, um, that the terms, you know, the arguments fold probably waned a little bit. So, so I think this is what I had in mind immediately, not to kind of um, 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 uh, undermine or, uh, uh, you know, um, brush aside the French history of um, um, you know, uh, popular sovereignty and constituent power, which actually I think becomes quite important for India, especially in the Swaraj moment. But that's actually a different story. Uh, thank you for that. Um, so, Dimitri, I've got your question about representatives and reformer. And um, if I understood it correctly, partly about kind of um, um, whether one could think the two together. Um, or do you have anything more to it? Because <laughs> As I answered the question, I think I kind of lost some of your uh, broader point. Could you briefly reproduce the question? No, I'm, I was saying, if you think of Ramon Roy, the context in yeah. which um, the, the global Christian description of Ramon Roy, the context in which they use the word reformer mm -hmm. is really, uh, is about his fight against idolatry, mm -hmm. right? Because the Christians yeah. think that idolatry is satanic rule, uh, Ramon is fighting against it, and that's a result of Christian influence on him. So whether or not, even if he didn't become Christian himself, he is proof that Christianity reforms the world. And so they, that's the envelope within which he, he's being called yeah. a reformer. Okay. Now, yeah. and the same man is then asking for useful education sciences, <laughs> press freedoms. Now, normally, you could ask for useful sciences, press freedoms, without being anti-idolatrous in your attitude, mm -hmm. right? You could be you could be an idol worshiper and still want, want those things. Yeah, yeah. As yeah, as yeah, others yeah. So the question yeah. is, in thinking Ramu Hunroy, I mean, the question of whether he's the first liberal, second liberal. Yeah, yeah. You know, to me, it's Gautam Bhatt's question. He would have been a comparator anyway, kind of. <laughs> thing. <laughs> but but clearly, in understanding this man, they, these two sides have to be brought together. In it's yeah. it, it, it seems, and 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 often the question of liberalism separates uh, this aspect of Ramon Roy from what is you know what what clearly speaks to a kind of our genealogical sense of the history of yeah. rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so now you're yeah, great. But besides the point of not seeing Ramon as the first liberal is to really open up, I think the rather, um, I mean, you know, open-ended and still unresolved questions of a historical moment. And of course, I mean, in the first panel, some of the debates you had about, you know, the early modern, the colonial modern, this, you know, there's some steps toward that uh, kind of reconsideration. So now I'm with you on this. Now the question about representatives and, 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 and reformer, of course, one could be anti, um, you know, idolatrous and still have, say, um, be committed, said, to individual rights, certain thing. 
for example, of course, as you as is part of that that, that part, part that I briefly kind of touched upon the theological debate. Um, you know, like he of course had believed very profoundly the plurality of reasons that people could arrive at reasonable arguments through different routes, different traditions. But was he pluralistic about reason itself? I'm not sure, right? I think no. Ramon many ways thought no. that se separation of powers, these things are many with universal kind of norm, right? So I think this is an important thing to just partly how he reconciles the, but, the representative but, and the... Sorry, sorry so I, was gonna, I was going to yeah. say that clearly, I mean, I agree with you. I mean, yeah. to arrive at reasons through plural paths is possible, but reason itself can't be plural. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah. I agree with you, but, but, but the question is, to be a rationalist, to, a, to be a devotee of reason, doesn't necessarily make you a liberal. Mm -hmm. Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, absolutely, I completely agree with this as well. I mean, reason. I mean, I, I mean, you know, if we think reason amounts to, no, I don't know. If, but liberalism, liberal do you mean here commitment to rights and those things, or you? Um, so yeah, it, it does not necessarily. No, I'm I'm, I'm saying that understanding Ramon Roy, it seems to yeah, me that yeah. one needs to bring. The two sides together. Yeah. Uh, in, in other words, there is a discussion about moral improvement. So, okay, mm -hmm. let me put it put it more bluntly. My question could be formulated thus, and I'm not saying in putting it thus, I'm suggesting this is also the answer. But the question is whether there's a larger envelope in Ramon's understanding of moral improvement within which the question of welfare is situated. Mm. And, and that, that understanding of moral improvement has to do with reason, but has to do with anti-idolatry, you know, uh, and has to do with some kind of engagement with uh, his engagement with Christianity, it seems. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I mean, I, so firstly, I think the fact that representatives and reformer, these two ideas could coexist with him, partly because of the reason that, I mean, what the idea of reason he had, you know, it, it certainly entailed not just anti-idolatrous position, but also, I mean, as is, you know, I mean, also the certain political norms. I mean, for, you know, it's not meaningfully for him, um, you know, like disentangled. Now, of course, for someone, it's certainly possible for them to be completely disentangled. The question is why it is not, I guess, that one, one way to uh, think about it. Now, you know, speaking of moral improvement, I mean, Ramon actually is not someone I think ever fully would fully fit that category of moral improvement, partly for the reason that moral improvement as a, as a, as a, as a moral as an adjective, you know, becomes meaningful when you have, you know, when you are not, you know, actually the morality itself as a norm is up to its own evolution. And moral improvement by that extension is a meaning, you know, stronger claim of moral improvement. The fact that with kind of um, 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 like, you know, more developed, more advanced practices, you know, you practice better norms. Um, you know, the norms themselves are future looking. But Ramon, I think, had a more, more kind of like not as a future looking ideas of moral, moral, morality and norms, which meant that he did believe in, of course, refining, betterment, this stuff. But this is the use of, I think, refinement and betterment, kind of still unconnected to the future oriented, future looking moral improvement that would, of course, take over, you know, be more influential, I think, um, soon after his, uh, you know, a uh, couple of decades after him. Um, um, but this question about representative reform, if it's a question beyond Ramon, I think, anyway, it's a really important question, a philosophically important question about, it's a question that shows up over and over again in our many writings about liberalism, to what extent liberalism is committed to kind of say, not just, you know, we could have basically say a bare minimum uh, understanding of the negative liberty, right? The thing is that all accounts of the even, even bare minimum accounts of um, 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 liberalism ultimately, um, well, they do rely on, you know, like ontologies that show up, you know. So, um, so it's a question that uh, has, you know, I mean, uh, methodologically speaking, I think was quite central to how liberalism uh, itself, the career of the idea, you know, as a, as a political idea in the in the in the twentieth century uh, onward. But, but yeah, I mean, um, let's stop here uh, about on this point in particular. <laughs> but we should continue this conversation uh, further. Yeah. Just the last just one quick point. I think, I think, you know, there is some confusion here about whether or not we think of liberalism as essentially a political concept or whether it includes all of those other things like reform. It is perfectly possible for an entirely absolutist despotic regime to be reformed. Right? Think of Atatürk's Turkey, think of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Right? You can bring about enormous uh, social change yeah. with a thoroughly non-liberal regime. 
So liberalism at this point of time, certainly in the early 19th century, it's all about opposing absolutism, opposing despotic rule, right? And bringing about what is called improvement, right? This Christian evangelist idea does get tied up, which is what Jesus was referring to, mm -hmm. but, right? Uh, and that is, it just happens to be, it seems to be completely contingent that, that this evangelical move is, as in Britain at this time, is politically aligned with those uh, political uh, liberals, which yeah, yeah. It goes all the way into the yeah, yeah. Just, just to this point, I just want to add this very, very small point that uh, Ramon Rai, when he writes about Ranjit Singh, you know, he says that you know, he say, it's, a, it's more or less an absolute, an absolute monarch without any kind of check and balance, but he is liberal. I mean, it's a term used for Ranjit Singh. I mean, he himself would use that enlightened, enlightened, basically by that he meant enlightened, generous, you know, I mean, not un. Of course, I mean, in a way, meaningful use in that context um, that one could be, say, absolutist even, and still. Um, so, of course, that meaning of liberalism, um, you know, of course, continued to survive and still survives. Um, what, of course, um, I mean, uh, one part of the argument beyond this was the partly about, like, you know, the political idea in the 19th century, you know, liberalism association with self government and what it reveals and what it doesn't. But that part of the argument, I mean, of course, for Ramon, it would be moderation, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and again, this day, liberalism without democracy, you know, it's a meaningful school of thought. And this is something that, you know, has family resemblance, if not direct continuity with that. Uh, right, it's just, it will not end, I think, because even Thomas <laughs> has a question, it just, it's a very positive thing, though. Please go ahead, no, because it's just fine. the intensity of the discussion here. <laughs> Go ahead, um, sure, my answer was a sort of question and, and comment that sort of included. So I wanted to ask, um, sort of continuing the the, um, the thought that Dipesh uh, had brought out about the idea that what is about the relationship between idolatry and cognitive capacity or the capacity for reason. And uh, I thought, uh, and, and, the, and the question of the reformer. And, uh, and I thought, um, it sort of brought to mind uh, uh, the idea that in Thomas Reed's uh, common sense philosophy, um, the um, via the advancement of learning of Bacon, the removal of cognitive error is actually called the removal of the idols of the mind. Mm -hmm. And the assumption there is that so so and and of course Reed himself was both a Presbyterian missionary and uh, sort of not a missionary, but a Presbyterian minister, and a moral philosophy. This is uh, from. And that's fantastic uh, history of, of moral thought. And I thought there is a kind of relationship, I think, and I wanted you to ask you to elaborate on it between the fact that in Reed, I mean, I don't know if Ram Mohan had read Reed. This is this is about, but certainly the missionaries had. That's that it was it, and of course the, I mean, the as the Baptists get slowly replaced by the Presbyterians in in the eighteen twenties and thirties. Um, um, the idea, it seems to me. Just from common sense philosophies, that you can remove that the removal of the idols of the mind, smashing of the, is an immediate process. It 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 is not a process that contains a question of lag or delay. It is an ethical obligation that basically it's a cognitive problem that you can solve immediately. And I wanted to ask, do you think that there is a possible relationship with that reading of Ram Mohan when he is asked about the capabilities for improvement that the Indians have, and he, he answers. And, and you quoted that lovely passage when she said, no, look, they have the same capability for improvement that is universally available to all others. And so in that, in that sense, you know, this question of the immediacy of the moral capability and of the reasoning capability, and that idols here are both, I mean, for, in Ramohan's case, are, are both those of the mind and also those very, very real ones that he wants to smash. I mean, or, or remove, sorry, I shouldn't say smash. It's not the right, right, right thing to say. But, but he, he wants to get, and so I wanted to ask you, do you see this kind of connection? And if you could yeah. talk more about it, because I think it's a very fruitful direction to, to Absolutely. take. Absolutely. Is there any other question? But Thomas, just from this, it's a great point. I mean, see, this, this is, um, the, I think, what is really at stake in many ways about with Grammo's understanding of Nazbo lost you, can't hear you. Yeah, um, yeah it should work yeah. now. So I was just, I was just saying, uh, Thomas, that you know, this is a meaningful distinction and a very useful one 
because for Ram Mohan, it talks about improvement, it is about the immediately available kind of uh, moral resources. So what, where matters is better capacity for reasoning. It's what is at stake with all of his writings on the jury and you know, a judge and all this stuff. But like, you know, reason is something that, reasoning is something that you can learn. And you can learn primarily by craft. Now, look at the term like moral improvement. They take the most famous example, like John Stuart Mill, who writes a lot, of course, not for the Indian context, but also the British context. How can you morally improve the working class, for example, for suffering, right? And here, the big problem for a liberal, I mean, classic liberal, like, uh, I mean, uh, Mill, is that it is not entirely a matter of cognitive training. It is a matter of, like, changing social and material conditions, for example, of this, uh, you know, working class, right? So why you have a different temporal kind of process and framework, for uh, moral improvement to work out, right? And this is, of course, uh, in the sense, in that sense, Ramon Rai isn't, I think, you know, a thinker of the moral improvement. And this is the one, of course, the most immediate. Yeah, 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 this is the one, basically, what we think of when we think of a term like moral improvement, right? Not exactly the Ramon tradition, which is, you know, um, um, is, is, is the moral precursor and, you know, a quite, quite different one. So the term, let's say the term improvement has been a great, you know, misled us a lot in Ramon scholarship. Um, anyway, so. Stop I it. think we should end on that note. We are just 15 minutes away. So despite a very, very intensive discussion, excellent session. Yeah. And with that, we also go from the end of the day. See you all tomorrow. And thank you very much. Thank you.